Test one. Two, three, one, two, three. I think I'm hearing something through. I just don't know if it's going to the audio. One, two, three. There, okay, that seems like it's it's hitting the speed. Can I get a can you this is can I get a thumbs up? Thank you. Okay. Good, good. Yeah, we'll start starting four. Five, it's basically we try and start pretty close to on time. Um, so I think about two minutes they'll call people in. The, no one, uh, you know, the opener sort of mix in terms of people who actually bother to come. Uh, red, red HDMI. Tick, tick. Tick, tick.
Morning. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good to see folks filing in. Good to get started. Uh, good to be here out in LA, Anaheim. Uh, if you've been here before, welcome back. I know a lot of folks are, are returnees. Uh, if this is your first Forward Cloud Tech, it is great to meet you. Uh, I'm Aaron. I am one of the organizers of this conference. Uh, and I like to start off every year with just a quick reminder of what Forward Cloud Tech is about, why we're here. So this is our fourth year doing this. Um, fifth, if you include the sort of informal happy hour that occurred outside the first reinforced where the idea for the show was hatched. And so I think it's helpful to talk a little bit about what has and hasn't changed and what that means for the sessions uh, in this room and next door, for the projects we work on together, and for the hallway con chats that uh, surround this event. So what has not changed? What has not changed is that a need for an independent cloud security practitioner community I think is still very real. So if you think about the cloud security forum Slack that a lot of us spend time in, it continues to grow. Hundreds of people chatting weekly. That's 25% bigger than it was last year. Uh, ditto around submissions. We had a record number of new submissions for this conference this year. Uh, 371 available tickets went away in hours. Uh, and we know that we've been able to do this against the backdrop of a year where uh, travel budgets are tight, L&D budgets are tight. So first, I want to say how grateful I am that we are able to do this again. Uh, have this space that's not governed by marketing departments, to have unfiltered practitioner to practitioner conversations about what is and isn't working. It is valuable, it is energizing, it is something I look forward to every year. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, what has changed, uh, I think, a lot in the last year, everything we expect to touch when we talk about cloud security. So if you go back to the first year of Forward CloudSec, those videos are on YouTube, and it was almost exclusively infrastructure volumes and operations. But every year since then, things have gotten more complex. So this year, themes, cost, reliability at the forefront, security orgs with our skill at next level monitoring, uh, we find ourselves supporting the infra orgs and other teams even more than we have in the past in their push to save costs and simplify. I think a lot of orgs that were kind of all in on one cloud, whichever cloud that might be, uh, are now starting to do a lot more of use each cloud for what it's good at. So your AWS first org may have brought in Azure for AAD or because they're the only ones who can secure the open AI APIs today. Um, GCP has healthcare and custom data stuff that I know are really important for some verticals as well. Uh, and I think we might have once dismissed repatriation as impractical, but uh, it's not just DHH who's talking about moving workloads off the clouds anymore. We've reached a point in our maturity curve where we really have more standardized and predictable workloads, and that's where moving simple workloads to the data center starts to become more appealing. So that makes our job more complex. Uh, and that's just the infrastructure side of things. So whether cloud security should refer primarily to the cloud infrastructure, IaaS, is increasingly unclear. I will say this, GitHub is almost certainly in your infrastructure threat model. It probably wasn't in 2019, now it is. Kerberos might be too. Uh, we've got talks on both of those today, and couldn't couldn't really have a conference without thinking about the breadth of, of threats there. Of course, by now, everyone's kind of over public S3 buckets. Uh, your data perimeter means a bunch of things, uh, something you want to think comprehensively about, new services, new types of exposures. Definitely going to be at that talk. Uh, don't expect the latest wave of AI-enabled infrastructure, AI-enabled tools to make life easier for us, uh, but not quite ready to predict how it's going to change things. So over the next few, uh, next few days or so, what I'm going to get out uh, of this conference ideas about how to evolve my tools, both the ones I build and the ones I buy to support this expanded definition of cloud security. Those are, those are, those are core talks for me, because there are a lot of tools. Um, I don't like picking on vendors, but a natural render response to blurring lines about what cloud security means is to try to draw new lines in ways that are advantageous to them. So case in point, uh, recent RSA recap post by Anton Chivakin of, of GCP, I've discussed it on Slack, said effectively, Cloud, uh, cloud security tools are over, specifically, I think, referring to CSPM. There's only three vendors that matter at RSA. And he didn't say which those were. Um, uh, so I don't know which matters and which don't. Uh, but I will say, uh, to the vendors that matter, thank you so much for your forward cloud sec sponsorship. We really appreciate it. <laughs> um, uh, and like, even if he's right about CSPM, uh, I don't think he's right about cloud security as a whole. I think there's a lot of work to be done here that really does matter. Um, and it's definitely the case that this flurry of category creation, these fragmented and overlapping solutions, uh, each with their own sort of capitalized Gartner acronym and quadrant, uh, it's really hard to integrate and nearly impossible to think about. So we can say, the solution is standards. Why don't people do interoperation? 
well, look, that conversation clearly can't be left to vendors alone either. So in the cloud security monitoring space, uh, Elastic, Splunk, AWS, Security Lake, each have their own logging schema. So uh, if we want to make this work, I think independence and transparency are going to be key to creating consistency. And so it's this group of 300 or so practitioners uh, that can do a lot to help. Uh, so that's what we're here for. So you'll find me in as many talks as I can manage where we talk about this problem. So coordinating multiple systems, whether it's open source, vendor work, good old fashioned monitoring, uh, to keep an eye on this new, more complex world. So in response to the changing cloud security environment, a couple changes that I think we should think about as, as a forward cloud tech organization. Uh, so I wanna share three areas of focus that, that the organizers have talked about where we need your help, uh, where we need everyone's help. So the first, I think this is a good time for us to double down on independence. So about half of the forward cloud techs have been at AWS Reinforced and half have not. Uh, the next year, which is gonna be the fifth year of forward cloud tech, I think we're gonna go back to hosting the conference independently. So we'll aim for a similar time of year, broadly accessible city, kind of leaning towards Denver or Washington, but we'll kind of depend a little bit, uh, fill out your feedback forms. But we do think it's time we stand on our own. Second thing we wanna try that I'm excited about. First, uh, we are big fans of orgs like OWASP, CNCF, uh, Cloud Security Alliance, SANS, but none of them is doing the job of filling the role of community stored for cloud security projects that aren't you know, Kubernetes infrastructure related. So we have a nonprofit, uh, we have a Slack. Um, uh, we already sponsor the conference, we already sponsor the Slack, and so we're gonna launch this technical oversight committee this year, we've already started it uh, with a couple folks, uh, who are gonna provide sponsorship for projects, whether projects are shared data sets, open source tools, editorial and standards work, uh, that we can all use together to make more effective cloud security practitioners. So we're gonna launch that with the known AWS account IDs project. I know there are other opportunities behind that. Uh, and then the third thing that I want to see change uh, in this community and evolve, uh, because the diversity and importance of the problems we're working on is not slowing down, we need a broad and inclusive community working on solutions. And so we put expanding the proud security practitioner community right in our charter on day one, we're better than we were when we started, but look around, we could do better still. Um, and so once again this year, uh, at the direction of our speakers, thank you, and with the support of an anonymous donor, we'll be making donations to four charities that we think have done a lot uh, to broaden security talent. So money's an important start, but we're here to act as practitioners. Uh, so one of the talks I'm really looking forward to is Jasmine, who's on our review committee, and Renee. Uh, they have a birds of a feather session this afternoon on creating inclusive conversations in risk discussion. Uh, and I think that's gonna be a great chat late this afternoon. So by the time we open next year's CFP, um, I wanna do more direct partnership with organizations like these, uh, Women in Security and Privacy, Black Girls in Cyber, Dev Color, Rural Technology Fund. I wanna make more people feel welcome at Forward Cloud Tech 2024 and beyond. So Scott Piper, who's our founder, hi Scott, uh, is running a State of the Union chat tomorrow at 1.20 on these topics and all things Forward Cloud Tech, so I hope you'll stick around for that. Should be a great couple days. So uh, I wanna say, th say thanks to the crew that helps put this on every year. Uh, that's the eight of us volunteer organizers. Uh, we work year round on this thing, especially Chris Ferris, who's our event chair, not in the room. Um, Shanisa Cambrick and Patrick Sanders, who ran the CFP this year, uh, program the co-chair of the program committee. Uh, 218 people who took time to write an abstract. Uh, that's a ton of great cloud security work we're gonna be talking about today and tomorrow. It's also a ton of great cloud security work that we're not able to fit into our conference schedule. We're excited to see that show up elsewhere. Uh, 18 members of our review panel, a uh, lot of work to do this year, collectively 1,700 reviews written. Uh, 50 speakers uh, who are working first on abstracts and then trying to fit a year's worth of work into a very tight 20 minute timeline plus five minutes for Q&A. Uh, so I know how hard that is. Uh, I wanna thank our two professional event partners, that's Rising Media for event support, Mustache Power for AV. Uh, this conference is so much better with the support of experienced professionals, like volunteers can do the work, but it's, it's great to have people who know what they're doing, so it's not me. Uh, and of course the 15 sponsors, our biggest conference yet brings with it complexity uh, that we couldn't manage without their help. So we are proud of all of our forward cloud tech sponsors, the repeat ones who come back year after year, those who've gotten acquired and gone on to great things, uh, and we're glad to welcome some new ones this year too. So take the time to say hello uh, there next door. Our gold sponsors, Open Raven, NTTVC, with Secure and Jupiter One. Silver sponsors, Orca Security, Permiso, Permisa Cloud, excuse me, Prisma Cloud, Prowler Pro, Wiz, Bronze sponsors, Resourcely, Clear Vector, Netflix, NetSpy, Trust on Cloud, Skyhawk Security. Can't do the conference without them. 
We'll be talking a little bit more about them throughout the show, so take the time to say hello. Um, okay, so we're here for HallwayCon as much as anything else. Uh, take advantage. This is a big space. Uh, the rooms are big. The hotel has a lot of great space. We have lunch. We have snacks. This is LA. We've invited a couple food trucks to show up at happy hour today, lunch tomorrow. Uh, we have drink tickets left, so if you didn't pick up drink tickets at Reg, stop by, pick up two. Uh, they're at Reg. We have uh, scheduled cameras off, birds of a feather sessions. These are highly participatory, not just someone on stage talking, uh, where we turn the cameras off. Uh, and tomorrow afternoon, Rich Mogul and Will Bankson are running a half-day incident response challenge. Uh, ton of space, just exchange notes, demos, should be awesome. Remote folks, uh, join us on Slack, join us on YouTube. We reserve time for speaker questions that can come from anywhere. The MCs, each track has an MC who will be monitoring those, uh, those forums, asking questions on behalf of people out there. Uh, don't let wild claims go unquestioned. Uh, we're here to, we're here to, to talk about it. So uh, whether here or virtual, code of conduct applies. So very important, if you have concerns, if you have issues, you can flag down an organizer. Uh, uh, several of us are wearing pink uh, forward cloud six shirts. Some of us are not. You can stop by the teak room, which is across the hall, or you can send a confidential note to Joel, con conduct at forward cloud sec directly. He's on top of it and will respond immediately. Ultimately, this is not our show, it is your show. So, let's get to it. Um, here's how we make the show our own. Slack link, feedback link, these are on the screen. Or go to the bit.ly link. You might be in Slack already. Uh, we'll certainly send out the feedback link after the show to everyone, uh, everyone here. Uh, and so my ask is that we stare hard at the blurred lines, uh, see if we can draw our own newer, more understandable ones. So the first talks are gonna start eight minutes. We're gonna have uh, uh, beyond the AWS security roadmap in this room. And I don't have my paper, so I don't remember what's on in Salon C, but uh, great content starting here live on YouTube, uh, and I will see everyone there. Thanks for coming.
test, test. Cool. Seems good. So I do not know the password sitch. Reg Desk will know. I'm, I'm on the, I'm staying here, so. I'll, I already gave someone my room number. I was like, I can't have, can't have 500 people on this room. All right, uh, should we kick this thing off? Let's do it. Uh, so uh, let's kick it off. These, this, is, this is what we're here for. We're here for topics. We're here for deep discussions about uh, cloud security topics. So I am excited to kick off with uh, Rami McCarthy, Beyond the AWS Security Roadmap. Uh, as always, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, especially with Secure. So having with Secure as a partner helps you understand and address the cyber risks associated with business transformation, embedding outcome-based cybersecurity measures tailored to identifying unknown unknowns and to designing mitigation. So thank you with Secure for sponsoring. Uh, as we're new, we always make time for Q&A at these talks. So you silence your cell phones, uh, but afterwards, please stand up. I will bring you the mic so that the people on uh, YouTube can hear us uh, uh, later. Uh, but we'd love to hear uh, what you have to ask from you. So with that, uh, please welcome our speaker. Thanks. Waiting for this to pick me up. Awesome. Uh, glad to be kicking things off. And uh, thanks to the organizers for having me, and thanks everyone who's in this room. Quick show of hands, how many people have read Scott's AWS Security Maturity Roadmap? Great, no peer pressure, but the rest of you are about to be a little confused because I'm not going to mention anything further about it. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm Rami, I work on cloud and infrastructure security at Figma, which is a design company. Uh, we are hiring. That link takes you to our cute little security job sites. If you're interested, I've found my last two jobs through Ford CloudSec. Highly recommend it. Um, I also contribute to TLDR Sec, so if you want to read more things I've done, you can find it there. Uh, this talk is based on the fact that when I joined Figma, uh, the pitch for the job was, we've shipped Scott's roadmap. Help us figure out what's next. And that caused just a tiny bit of panic for me. Uh, this talk's going to aggregate sort of all my learnings since then about the options for your program beyond Scott's roadmap, what the projects are teams tackle, and how they tackle them, with a bit of a discussion of you know whether you should build, buy, or adopt. And I'm going to be opinionated here, um, and I'm going to mention a lot of vendors. I'm not endorsing any of them, nor am I saying they're horrible. Please don't hold it against me. Uh, this is going to be very fast paced. The slides are live. I'll put the link up again at the end. Uh, there are a lot of links to click, so feel free to follow up on that. And quick aside, not all cloud security programs are the same. I'm talking about a sort of specific shape of cloud security program that's engineering and automation uh, oriented that focuses on generally zero trust architectures, maybe a software product. Um, and I'm a maximalist on cloud security. Uh, Aaron mentioned like the history of cloud as infrastructure and some things uh, end up sucked into our cloud security programs uh, through either force of will or force of gravity. Um, and then we follow principles like guardrails, not gatekeepers and paved roads to really make it easy for engineers to work in the cloud safely. Uh, and mentioning that brings in this like scary specter of Netflix and I wanna call it out up front uh, Netflix has been an incredible contributor to cloud security space. I'm going to point to a lot of their blog posts and tools, but I really want to challenge the assumption that what Netflix blogs about is going to be the right decision for your security program. Uh, Netflix's solutions are built for their opportunities and constraints, not yours. They predate open source offerings. They predate managed services. They have a great engineering team. They've scaled beyond the utility of many things they can pull off the shelf. And they have specific data gravity and account architecture. Um, it's not just Netflix. I'm gonna mention a lot of solutions, blog posts, ideas, and I understand they may not apply to you. It's okay, take what's useful, leave the rest. Um, hopefully you learn something you can take back to your company and help us all sort of build sustainable cloud security programs. 
I mentioned build versus buy versus adopt. I think it's a really important framework, especially in cloud security. Aaron alluded to all the vendors uh, in the space. Many of them are great, um, but you could spend all day proof of concepting, buying, procuring, deploying vendors, or you could spend all day building a solution. You could do a year-long project for something that's cheap off the shelf. Um, when I'm thinking about build versus buy versus adopt, I like to use this framework. Uh, it talks about, like, are we solving a problem that's differentiated, unique to our company, at a scale maybe that's unique to our company? What are the costs and efforts of integrating versus the costs and efforts of building internally and making sure we take operational uh, maintenance costs into account? Um, so I encourage you all to pick a framework when you have these discussions internally about how you should solve your cloud security problems. I like this one, you can pick a different one. Uh, but really be nuanced about uh, where it's valuable to build, where it's valuable to buy, and where maybe there's a cheap, easy win um, pulled from the great open source practitioner community. Awesome. Uh, we're making great time. We're going to do the speed run through capabilities and controls. My goal here is to give as complete a view of a landscape as possible, which is going to mean skimming over each example. There are lots of links to go back on, and I'm always happy to talk in the hallway after, uh, and hopefully this can spur some discussions. So. First thing we talk about is secrets management. I find when I walk into a room of cloud security practitioners, when I'm interviewing for jobs, when I start a new role, secrets management is something every team has to solve, and they have to solve it pretty early, because as soon as you want production workloads, you want your secrets managed safely, mismanaged secrets cause breaches. You need a common set of features. You need to allow developers to create secrets. You need to be able to rotate those, grant access to them, destroy them, audit them, inject them into local development environments. If you look on the adopt side here, <laughs> I give four examples of companies that have built tools that basically use DynamoDB, KMS, Secrets Manager to orchestrate this in AWS. Those tools are great. You can also buy options. HashCorp Vault is a really you know sort of thick solution to this problem. There are startups tackling it. Uh, and here's where I get opinionated. I actually think this is a case where you should build. You have to really understand the intricacies of your secrets management platform. It becomes really tightly integrated to everything else you do. And if you adopt one of these solutions off the shelf, you're gonna find yourself trapped at some point based on their limitations, capabilities, and the ways it doesn't fit your environment. Um, they're also often too configurable for what you need in your organization. Uh, if you are going to adopt one and one's a perfect fit, these are great tools, like nothing against them, um, but I found folks get uh, overwhelmed with the complexity there. Uh, and be wary of prematurely going for like a full secrets management platform. You can get pretty far on sort of native features with some light automation around it. Asset inventory is the first of a few sort of compounding controls we talk about. Um, most of you have probably done something here already, but if you haven't, there are some open source tools these days, Steampipe, Cloud Query, these also have commercial versions. Asset inventory is just answering the question of what do I have, which is a prerequisite to answering how you secure it. And here I say these off-the-shelf solutions will get you really far. If you are the first cloud security engineer, or maybe even the first security engineer, buying and deploying a full CSPM is premature, and you're gonna spend all your time wrangling that single tool, that single problem. Instead, pull something off the shelf, start to layer in controls on top of your inventory, and be really pragmatic about how you dispatch those. And please, please, please don't write anything that creates an asset inventory based on cloud APIs. It has been done so many times. I see it created a lot. It's an interesting problem, but one that's undifferentiated. When you're going beyond asset inventory, we're in the CSPM space. Yes, this is a Gartner term. Actually, their market guide for cloud native application protection platforms, CNAP, is pretty good. Um, but basically, you do want to continuously assess the security posture uh, of your cloud. And there are open source options, some of whom are sponsors. There are um, also options to buy here. I listed a few of the ones that I think have a lot of mind share. Uh, and, you know, I think no spoilers, but you probably should just buy a CSPM when you're ready. Uh, building these, I think, five years ago was really common, and a lot of organizations have open sourced their examples of building a CSPM in-house. Um, so long as you can tightly scope your contract with a CSPM vendor to give you just the things you need and not their horizontal platform, these tools work pretty well, give you what you need, uh, but don't let them decide your security program. Just because a CSPM has 150 findings doesn't mean they're all valid in your environment against your risks. 
uh, be pragmatic about how you work with other teams. Uh, and if you do want to build, that's cool. Do it on top of an open source inventory tool, not the cloud APIs. Um, also worth calling out, there are native services here. I'm not a huge fan of them, but I know they work for other people. Automated remediation is sort of the natural continuation of CSPMs. This is built into pretty much any tool you'd buy. Uh, I'm not a huge fan as a spoiler. I know companies like Twilio have frameworks that they've sort of scaled and made it easy to work with. Um, personal take, I just would not do this if you can get away with it. Uh, you get much higher leverage over infrastructure as code. You get much higher leverage over choke points for changes, if at all possible. That being said, I know my environment is not yours. If you're in an environment with a lot of legacy infrastructure or you know, you've come in uh, to an environment that predates Terraform cloud formation, uh, maybe auto remediation has uh, some juice worth the squeeze. Um, it's hard to apply it with sufficient context. So if you are going to roll this out, think about the ways it can involve developers, right? Can you give them a warning before <laughs> nuking their services? Can you, um, you know, seek additional context input? Empower developers to own security. Auto remediation creates this model where the security team is uh, sort of paternalistic towards other teams um, if deployed poorly, uh, and I'm really not a fan. So what I do like is secure infrastructure as code modules, whether you're in Terraform or CloudFormation or Pulumi, um, if you have worked in cloud security program using infrastructure as code, you have probably written the secure private bucket module for S3 and told all your developers to use it. I have written it three times. I would like to never write it again. <laughs> there are uh, options to pull off the shelf. Asecure.cloud has a bunch of examples that are pretty viable. Uh, Terraform registry also itself, you can look at the code, make sure it fits your needs. Um, look. You should probably build it. It's fine to pull something off the shelf. I don't think the purchasable solutions are super broad yet, uh, and I haven't yet seen one that um, I have paid for. But uh, the trick with secure IAC modules is pair them with SAST, because you really want to be able to detect when folks are using the raw resources and not your modules. And the second thing is, don't just do a module for a single resource. Pair together security infrastructure as a consumable module to make your developer's life easy, make security decisions easy, pave roads. A common example is if you can put together a way to allow developers to secure internal applications behind like an ALB and your SSO IDP, right? That's a great thing to package up and expose as a module to make it really easy for them to do the right thing. Um, but don't just go and spend six months building modules hoping people will use them, like wait for a need to manifest uh, and be thoughtful about the amount of investment here. And that SaaS thing I mentioned, right? There are dedicated tools and you can also use flexible platforms like SEMGREP. Um, a lot of CSPMs these days are also reaching into code as well. Uh, and uh, this blog post from Christoph is actually really good. It compares a bunch of different IC scanning tools as of about a year ago. And it's hard to go wrong here. Um, generally, your infrastructure as code is going to be less complicated than like your actual application logic that you're running SAST against. So most of these tools can do an OK job. Be very careful with what rules you roll out. If you tell every developer to encrypt everything all the time, you're going to slow down the business. Uh, and that's not what we're here for. Um, and if at all possible, surface this sort of detection at PR time to the person who owns the code. Empower your developers to make thoughtful decisions about security. And if you need to guardrail them, do it in parallel with the security team's awareness so that they can check in and help people uh, you know, learn how to do things uh, the, you know, the happy path. Next up, this Scott actually does mention, I don't want to claim he didn't, um, but detection engine, uh, deception engineering, honeypots, honey tokens. Uh, Thinkst Canary um, has been around a while and is a pretty cool tool, and they offer a free canarytokens.org service that'll help you get set up with canary tokens for your cloud environment. You can also just deploy an AWS API key that's defanged and tie a detection into your SIM. Um, these are pretty easy to do. Uh, you probably want to deploy them in high value targets, whether that's S3 buckets or CI CD systems or drop them on EC2 instances. What I'd caution against is deploying canary tokens everywhere and just waiting to panic when it happens. Like, spend the day to think about, okay, someone has accessed my canary token. What do we do about it? 
Um, I also would say like Will uh, has a great blog post on a really sort of sophisticated architecture for programmatically deploying and managing canary tokens. You probably don't need that until you've done a lot about core controls in your cloud. This is gonna be three quick slides on the theme of access. So we have granular access. How do I make least privilege IAM roles for the right users? Um, how do I ensure there's no privilege escalation? Open source tools vendors both exist and parlays into access management. Um, how do I ensure that the right users get access to those roles? How do I make this discoverable? How do I improve the ergonomics of accessing my complicated mature cloud environment? Um, again, this is something like Netflix has launched console me, uh, common fate has granted here as well. And this then moves into temporary access. I don't just want developers to be able to access a role. I want them to only need it um, when they need it. Uh, and I want that to be for a very short period of time. I want approvals. I want to be able to audit that for compliance. Um, there are vendors here. I haven't seen a lot of off the shelf solutions. And really, I think this is a big problem that I'm underselling in cloud, right? Like I am is saying we spend a lot of time talking about these conferences for a reason. I would say just-in-time access is about the point at which you probably should consider buying something currently. It's not solved for well in the open source ecosystem. And it's kind of scary to build and undifferentiated. Um, I think you can get pretty far otherwise on open source, on automation in-house, um, on building. And make sure you're partnering with other internal stakeholders. Avoid the security team being the only people who can change IAM. I've been there. I think many of us have been there. Uh, it is an easy pattern to fall into, and it uh, can really increase a lot of toil and make it hard to move fast. Beyond just single account, you have multi-account, right? So uh, the account boundary is a really helpful security boundary. Um, and that's blast radius, that's for IAM sort of inherently. Uh, you can use things like org formation depending on the patterns you're using. A lot of people just tie together like AWS Nuke with some other automation. I haven't seen anyone trying to sell me anything. AWS has control tower, which works for some people some of the time. And so unfortunately, this is one I think you have to build and I hope we won't have to in a few years. Um, you know incrementally improve your automation. Be thoughtful if you're going from two accounts to four, you probably don't need to build like a magical account vending machine. If you know you're gonna want 100 new accounts in the next six months, maybe it's time to invest up front. Uh, make it easy for internal partners to get safe boundaries for their code, right? If you fail to do this, at some point you'll find there's a lot of gravity towards folks compiling everything into a single account. Uh, and that can really increase your risk and it's very expensive to migrate cross account. On the offensive side, right, there's control validation, attack simulation, open source tools like Stras, Red Team. Uh, the vendor category is often like automated pen testing, which as someone who used to do security consulting just gives me the ick. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of this category of product, no offense. Um, but I do think there's value in making sure your controls are functioning as intended. And I think that one thing that we don't do enough is leverage tools other teams are using. If you have internal partners with a QA platform, you can really just bake your security validation into there. Um, and frankly, when you deploy a control, validating it at that time is probably enough for most security programs for a pretty long time. This sort of automated continuous validation is great, but it's something I'd only consider late in your program's maturity journey. Uh, and also just make sure you're spending the right amount of time breaking versus building. These tools, these findings are only useful if they help you make the company more secure. And that comes in when you actually fix the things you're finding, make them more resilient. Egress monitoring and filtering is something I don't think we talk about enough and so I really wanted to call it out. Stripe launched Smokescreen years ago at this point, which is sort of an open source solution. Lyft has a blog post. I'm seeing a little more of companies talking publicly. This is a really powerful control post compromise. And frankly, in cloud environments, I think there are so many ways that an attacker could get in that thinking deeply about post compromise becomes important. I haven't seen a lot of vendor answers in this space yet. Um, I would say it's pretty risky to roll this out, especially if you put your egress filtering uh, as a single point of failure. Um, suddenly, your security team need to be as good as your SREs, which we hope they are, but they are in no ways. Uh, 
and um, if you're not thoughtful about how you'll expand the allowed connections, this is really a hamster wheel of pain. So coming up towards the end here, infrastructure access is another topic I won't do justice to. Um, this is something I'm going to be spending my entire year on at work pretty much. Uh, but you probably start as a small startup with no security team on SSH. Hopefully you can move people to something like SSM. Hopefully you take SSH off the internet. And then what? Well, the answer right now is there are a lot of platforms you can buy that solve for Kubernetes and your databases and you know, getting IAM access, um, getting onto servers, whether they be ECS or EKS or whatever. Uh, you also can do some things where you do network-based access with something like tail scale and then uh, auth separately. I think here it's really hard. I kind of want to say buy, like, right? This is a really undifferentiated problem that has a lot of edge cases and complexity, but often buying is too big an answer to a small problem you have. Like, maybe you just need to solve this for servers at first. But start talking about what good looks like early. You won't get anywhere stopping your coworkers from doing their jobs. Um, and like egress, there's day perimeters. There's a whole talk later, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skim over this. I would say 1 PM, I think, uh, one of these two rooms. You can hear more about data perimeters, where right now we're all building, and I think we're all sort of early to this game. Finally, I want to call out there were things I'd love to talk more about. Vulnerability management is an element of cloud security programs, detection engineering and security data lakes, continuous compliance. DFIR preparedness, runtime security, service-to-service -service authentication. The real takeaway is that beyond Scott's roadmap, which I do think is relatively universally applicable, prioritization's inherently custom to your risk and business. You can't do this all, pick some risks, run them to the ground, um, but don't uh, you know, close the back door and leave the front door open. Uh, and remember that anything you build, you'll have to support. Slides are live uh, at that link if you want to click any of these links or go back. Thank you all. Thanks for kicking things off, Rami. Any questions? Uh, I'll start with one. Um, you highlighted a couple cases where teams should collaborate with others. I am in particular uh, and your QA team. How do you decide what the cloud security team should do versus what, what other teams should be supporting you in? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm a little biased because I'm a cloud security engineer, and I would like to do as little as possible. I feel like I'm fundamentally concerned about how the company can be secure, and then how I can do that with as little work on our overstretched security teams as possible. So what I do is I look for opportunities where teams have needs uh, that they need met. And we talk about the ways that security expertise comes into play and the ways that the business best can staff those. So really, if there is a problem we are solving for another team, I highly encourage you to talk about what that team can contribute to the solution. And more importantly, where are the right places to own this long term. In a small company, security ends up owning everything that they build, so you'll end up doing some like all of traffic is owned by security. And you want to avoid that by talking about like what security can do to help, but who's actually accountable for owning those systems long term. Um, a quick question. So you have a lot of tools and open source products that you've mentioned in here, um, a dozen or so you could apply. What type of, do, do you have any recommendations on a, like a unified dashboard so as a developer, I don't have to go look at 20 different tools to find out what my security posture is? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sort of biased out of this, so I advise an ASPM startup. I think that's kind of the product category. Security Hub sort of does this in AWS, but basically, at some point, you will want a single pane of glass, probably. You can build this into your ticketing system. Um, yeah, I'd say ASPM is the product category if you need an answer there, and I think that uh, it is really valuable to scale your program, make sure you're homogenizing, deduplicating, providing context, dispatching, tracking, and maintaining compliance on your findings. A uh, question from Slack. So beyond the AWS sample, did you happen to see any general break glass systems worth consideration uh, um, outside of AWS? Yeah, there is one that uh, I recently saw a talk about for GCP um, that is from their Cloud Labs. I don't remember the name offhand, but I think if you search just in time access GCP on GitHub, you'll pull it up. Otherwise, I think on the open source side, not much. And my guess is that this is because these are really integration heavy. 
Uh, so like maybe you'll find something that's specific to your IDP cloud platform and end systems you're trying to access. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I haven't seen a ton out there. And I also don't see everything. So, you know, if I missed it, apologies, send it to me. I just did. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> just wanted to add a little bit of perspective. I love the idea you put up there of um, automating, like automated security remediations can be dangerous and can be risky. Um, However, and I agree with perspective, start with as many preventive controls as you can on educating developers and providing them good templates. Um, my current company is one where we have sort of distributed access to AWS to teams that are not security people. They're not even developers in many cases. We've got like sales guys doing tinkering with AWS and brand management. And so just wanted to add the perspective that I have started to rely really heavily on automated remediation for those people who aren't developers enough to touch IAC, and they're around monkeying in the console. And so I limit their roles as much as possible, but I also rely on preventive controls to go like slap their hands when they do something wrong. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you, and I, I hope I called it out in the slide that like, if you can get away with it not using automated remediation. That being said, you require executive buy-in because the first time you close an important security group on someone, they'll be knocking at your door. Um, and also, if at all possible, like idealist, you would surface a pane of glass with these problems to the team that owns them, and you have company-wide consensus that if teams are going to manage their own infrastructure, they own the risk. Uh, hey, um, very nice talk. Good to see everything in one place. Uh, I was wondering if you have uh, any suggestions around quantifying the maturity, right? So something like, okay, this is a CSIF, or maybe this is how cloud security maturity progresses from year one to year two to year three and beyond. Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like you need to pick a maturity model and stick with it. In past companies recently, I've been using OWASP CDM um, and modeling cloud security over that. And that gives executives a sort of qualitative heat map where they can tell trends, um, but also lets you be pretty nuanced about the sort of controls and projects you fit into it. From a quantitative side, generally I look at control coverage, control adoption, right? It's uh, how many controls are we rolling them out? Where are we rolling them out? How effective are they? Um, and then you have to tie that into like the costs of security um, when done poorly, which is how are incidents, how are misconfigurations? Are these trending down? How fast are developers moving? How much service are we providing? So no, no solid pithy answer there, but that's some of the ways I think about it. Uh, thank you. Great questions. I know there are more out there, uh, and one from Kat in Slack that I'm sure we'll follow up on. Um, the uh, um, uh, and uh, the question about metrics is interesting because it'll be a great lead, I think, into our next talk. Uh, success criteria for your CSPM uh, by David White. We'll be starting that in about.
All right, everyone, time for our next talk. Welcome back. Uh, happy to do questions in the halls and everything, but I uh, would love to uh, pay close attention to this next one, which I think is a great follow-up to Rami's talk as well. All right, y'all, let's get started. Can we, can, we, can we take conversations out of the room, please? Conversations to the hallway. Even in the back of the room, we can still hear you. All right, well, I think it's all right. Cool, well, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna kick things, uh, we're gonna do the next talk, uh, which is Success Criteria for your CSPM with David White. Uh, as always, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, in particular, Open Raven. Open Raven is the data security posture management company for security teams with modern cloud infrastructures needing to locate and secure sensitive, toxic, and exposed data across clouds at petabyte scale. Enter our Stream Deck raffle, www.openraven.com slash Valve Steam Deck. Winners will be notified after the event. Uh, Q&A, as always, uh, raise your hand. I will come find you or ask on Slack, YouTube, Mastodon, Twitter. Uh, we'll be monitoring all of those. Welcome, David. Good. Oh, there we go. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Success criteria for your CSPM. We have a lot of stuff, so I will try to just get right into it. Starting off with who am I? So my name is David White. I work as a senior cloud security engineer over at Nextdoor. You can find me on GitHub and Twitter at 13 Scooby. And previously to Nextdoor, I worked at Nordstrom and Disney as cloud security engineer as well. Um, so know the space, enjoy it, love it. Uh, always happy to talk and uh, converse. So if you guys want to meet up, happy to do it. So go over a quick agenda. So we have. Um, so we're going to start with the agenda. So what does CSPM mean? We're going to understand some of the use case for your environment. Then we're going to talk about configuration management, vulnerability management, and then talk about tips and takeaways. So first let's get into what, it, what does CSPM mean. So CSPM, as you can see on the chart, it's a collection of many different tools. Um, there's different aspects of it. The ones that we're going to focus on most during this talk are asset inventory, misconfigurations, and vulnerabilities. So what CSPM is not? So there's several other tools out there. If you go and do a Google search and you type in CSPM and you go find several of the vendors, they're gonna have a products page and they're gonna have other tools. Uh, CWPP, which is more around workload. There's CNAP, which is the all-encompassing collective. There's SEAM, and then there's more of the application security side, SAS, DAS, and SCA. Uh, a lot of the tools that have CSPM have that integrated into the CSPM tool. Uh, however, we're not going to be covering any of that. We're just going to be focusing on the uh, highlights of the CSPM. So very important, what is your use case? So you really want to understand when you go and pick a CSPM tool, how does it fit into your environment? What does your company need? What does your team look like? What are you trying to achieve? And what features are most important? So each environment is different, and so you really need to take into consideration what does your company do? So for instance, what's most critical to your company? Are you focused more on DSPM? Are you focused on doing something like a news feed? It really just depends. You want to figure out what kind of infrastructure you're focused on and capitalize on that. Uh, what are the engineering capabilities of your team? Do you tend to be more of the click ops through the web GUI or are you more IAC and developer focused and engineering focused? That'll have an effect on which tool you end up going with. So it's important to know that and have that in your mind when you're looking and evaluating tools. Um, for your team, you also want to know about your size. How many people do you have working in your security team? How do you hand off the security work to other developers? Does the security team go in and do the fixes themselves? All of these things take time, energy, effort, and so you want to make sure that you understand what is your budget, what is your size, so that you can make the appropriate um, choice once you come to the evaluation. And then as for the tool, what feature are you looking for? What's important to you? Um, are there features that one tool has that another doesn't? And then how are you planning on using it? Do you expect the developer teams and the application teams to go into the CSPM tool? Or are you planning to take the security team and then patch that through to something like JIRA and hand that off as a JIRA ticket to go remediate any misconfigurations you find? And so it really just matters how you're planning to run your security program. Very important to choose the right tool for the right job. If you pick the wrong tool, you end up in a very painful experience, things don't work out, you bought a tool, you spent a lot of money, things don't come through, 
and no one wins. So it's important to go through and really make sure that you identify what is going to fit in your environment to avoid all that pain. So some of the things that we used, we brought it, broke it down into five key factors for tool evaluation. That's review, install, monitor, verify, and confirm. Now I could leave you with that, but it wouldn't provide you a lot of stuff, so let's dive into each one. So for review, you wanna review and understand what the onboarding process of the tool is. So we found that working with vendors, uh, sometimes they would supply CloudFormation templates, and then we would go through and evaluate what was in the CloudFormation template and find that it was either overly permissive IAM rules or it was asking for multiple lambdas to be created when really only one lambda was needed. And so just because it came from the vendor, you still wanna go through and evaluate uh, what you're installing. Um, review is what permissions are being asked for. Uh, back to the IAM policy example, you wanna know, understand are you just giving a read-only policy? Are there any actionable write? Are you doing auto remediation? And so we went through and we uh, line itemed each item that we went and installed and tested in our environment and checked against that. Um, install, we highly encourage you to do a real evaluation in your production environment. Uh, production I know is always scary, but it does give you the most real world use case. Uh, oftentimes when we were working with different vendors, they would show you their a demo account and everything works, all the buttons click, everything looks great, but then you realize that when you scale that to 100 accounts, you can uh, run into issues that the, the demo account didn't have, and so you just wanna be aware of that. The closer you get into your environment, the better you're gonna get. We found things such as inventory, um, search features. Uh, different vendors have different ways of search. Some support fuzzy searching, some support using vendor agnostic names. Um, maybe that's important to you, it was to us. There's the scan frequency. Are you scanning once an hour, once a day, once a week? How often do you update the information? Um, what's the accuracy of the information that's returned? Are you reporting on vulnerabilities that are no longer in your environment but haven't gotten refreshed out of the table? You wanna know about the quality of the detections that are there. Um, how good are the detections that it's showing you? Just because it shows you 10,000 things wrong in your environment doesn't mean that there's actually 10,000 things of value that you need to go fix. Um, do they support highly ephemeral environments? Are you a big Kubernetes user and you need to um, have rapid up down of your pods and by the time that the tool aggregates all the data and then displays it, is it already out of date because your pods already shut down? Things that you should be aware of. And then the last two, perimeter scanning and resource connections. Um, knowing what perimeter and external surface you have is important so that way you can know um, how people would get in. And then you wanna verify that there's sufficient coverage and confirm that the tool is capable of doing everything that you're expecting it to do. So how do we take that and compare it against multiple vendors? Well, we threw it into the matrix. Not that matrix, this matrix. So we put together, there's a lot here. Um, I'm gonna dig through it in the next few slides, but this is our configuration and vulnerability management. You can find it on the Ford Cloud Sec Slack space looking for CSPM. Uh, it's publicly shared, you can use it to evaluate your own vendors. We found this most important for our environment, but your environment might be different. So digging into configuration management. Some of the things we looked for were public S3 buckets, unencrypted SNS topics, trust relationships to unknown accounts. So let's dig in and look at the user story. So for each section, we wanted to create a user story so we understood the mindset of what we were trying to get out of it. Then we could map the uh, capabilities and purpose to that. And so in this case, the configuration management reads, as a security engineer, I can identify and prioritize misconfigurations across our cloud environment that could result in stolen or lost data, unauthorized access, or business disruption. I can prioritize findings by exposure and impact for our actual environment, provide clear, concrete, actionable results. So that all the bold stuff is stuff that we really found important. And then we took that user story and we mapped it to capabilities and purposes. So let's dive into each one of these. So AWS resource support is the top. Um, we found out through our environment changing and the tools we were using, one of the things we wanted to focus on was the most coverage in our AWS environment. So we shot for a 90% plus. Um, we ended up dumping our billing and config and uh, resource manager and showed all the resources and AWS types that we had. And then we compared that against what the tool was actually scanning for. Um, different vendors will have different capabilities and the amount of coverage that they have and the amount of resources that they go after. So it's important to make sure that the resources that you have in use are also compatible and supported by the tool that you end up going with. 
Uh, for Kubernetes support, again, maybe for your environment you don't need that. For us at Nextdoor, we're a very big Kubernetes supporter, and so we wanted to make sure that we had uh, Kubernetes support through, uh, through and through. So then clear impact. Um, it's important to understand the business risk and understand versus best practice. So just because you have a CIS control that shows that you have a, uh, a failed CIS control doesn't necessarily mean that that's a business risk for your environment. And so you really wanna understand the clear impact of what the vulnerability or what the misconfiguration is and be able to act on it accordingly. Next is root cause fix. Uh, you wanna dedupe the findings, uh, showing you 10,000 things that could all get fixed with one uh, fix doesn't really do anything for anybody. It just creates extra noise, extra stress and you really wanna make sure that you can uh, make the best use of everyone's time. CloudFormation Solutions, this one was important because we uh, do everything through IAC at Nextdoor, and so giving somebody a ClickOp solution of going into settings and choosing something to go in and remediate doesn't fit our environment, and so then we need to translate that ClickOp style remediation plan into something that makes sense for the developers so that they can actually go into GitHub, put in their pull request, and uh, get that fixed. Next was real-time security posture and data accuracy. Um, how long does something stay in the dashboard? So in our highly ephemeral environment, by the time it was reported, our pod may have shut down and that application is now gone, but it's still reporting in the dashboard. You wanna be aware of that so that you don't end up chasing after something that's not there anymore. And then GUI reliability. Uh, how, can you go into the GUI? Can you access it? Does it crash? Does it offer you anything? A lot of the vendors are great in this area. You just wanna make sure that for your environment and the amount of accounts that you add and the amount of resources you have doesn't crash the application because you have too much. Next, we're gonna move on to vulnerability management. So we all know that we all write perfect code the first time, so we're just gonna go ahead and skip this section. Hope everybody's okay with that. And then you find out that you have a billion critical vulnerabilities in your environment. So when you have that many come in, how do you prioritize what's important and how do you know which ones are real and really impact on your environment? So we did the same thing, we wrote a user story. As a security engineer, I can identify the vulnerabilities in cloud resources, including hosts, containers, applications, and serverless compute. You can run queries against software versions, SBOMs, or by CVE. You have a low false positive by removing the non-live assets, and software isn't used by the application, and you can prioritize the results by the exposure and sensitivity. So then we map that to capabilities and purposes for vulnerability. Um, assess the entire environment and assess all infra. And the difference there was whether you have agent or agentless scanning. Do you know that you have scan coverage on all your resources? Do you have agents on everything? How easy is it to tell that you have an agent on something or it's missing from part of your environment? If you rely only on agent-based data and you have compute without agents on it, you basically have a blind eye and you wanna make sure that you have either a compensating control or some other method of finding what those vulnerabilities are. Then we go into low false positive. Now false positive by my definition or use of it, this is more around um, the criticality scoring and we're gonna get into that with risk-based prioritization. So just because like say you have a base image with Java on it and it has log4j on the system, but if you're running only Python apps on the system, it doesn't really have an effect. It's just sitting on the OS but not actually in memory and in use. So saying that's a critical 9.8 highly exploitable thing, maybe you wanna you know, lower that down so you can really focus, especially in a small team, on what's important and what's causing risk to your business. The next was zero day support. So when something like Log4j comes out, how long does it take for the vendor to realize uh, and be able to scan your environment and have the tools to support it? If you're waiting weeks and the exploit's already public and you have to go write your own tools, the tool isn't working for you, you're working for the tool. So you wanna make sure that you understand um, how quick that company or tool is able to show you in your environment based off something that comes up. Root cause fix is similar to what we talked about before. You wanna dedupe the findings into a manageable number so that you're not chasing a bunch of things that don't actually matter, but you understand what the root cause is, and then you can go change one change and affect lots of things and close them out. The next is actionable results. This one I hold near and dear to my heart as a previous developer and you want a clear call to action. So just going to a developer and saying, hey, I, you have vulnerabilities in your application doesn't help anybody. What you wanna do is be able to clearly articulate this is where the vulnerability is, uh, here's a recommended fix, but we need you to go into your application and make the change so that this vulnerability that affects you this way is taken care of, rather than just saying, here's a vulnerability in a Jira ticket, go figure it out. So you really wanna make sure that the tool provides that action. 
Next is real-time vulnerability posture. How long does it take to show that the vulnerability has been fixed? If you go through and spend your day fixing all these vulnerabilities and then you go and refresh the dashboard and show your company and the uh, company metrics still show that you have 300 vulnerabilities open, then it doesn't really help anybody and the data isn't accurate and you wanna make sure that the vulnerabilities that you're chasing and spending your time on and reporting on are actually vulnerabilities in your environment. Next, we're gonna get into tips and takeaways. So, a CSPM tool is only as effective if you use it and it fits your environment. So as we know, and as the um, support of this co uh, conference, there's lots of CSPM tools out there. We wanna make sure that when you make the choice, you're picking the right one that fits your environment and does the things that you expect for you. Every environment is different. Nextdoor's environment is different from your environment, and so you just wanna make sure that the tool you pick fits that. Um, each vendor will claim that they can do everything and solve all of your problems. It's up to you to determine how accurate that is. Previous vendors, and you spend more of your time correcting all those things, then nobody really wins, and we just spend all that time and money and effort. So, a few things I wanna call out here that uh, we found along the way is how easy is it to customize rules and add your own rules. Some vendors have their own rule language, they have their own lock-in, they don't allow you to export, they don't allow you to see what rules they have. And so it's important if you're going to go in and customize them to fit your environment and truly embrace the full power of the tool, you wanna make sure that you can edit and add your own rules. Um, how many rules does the vendor support out of the box? There's, a, there's some great tools out there, but by default, maybe they only have CIS controls. Does CIS control really address the true core risk of what your business is? Maybe there's some holes. Um, likely there's some holes, CIS is more of a good start, but not a complete picture. And so you wanna make sure that the rules that they provide out of the box to show you things that they know about are available and in the tool. And then scanning 100% of the environment, I've covered that one. And I wanna give a couple shout outs. So the Nextdoor security team, the Ford CloudSec Slack, and all the vendors who created the tools and provided feedback. Um, I had a really great experience working with several of the large vendors, several that were sponsors in this event. They all provided great feedback. We would go through, we would evaluate and give, uh, put them through our matrix and then share those results with the vendors and give them a chance to come back and correct any misunderstanding or anything we may have missed. And it was really nice to get that conversation going and offer our um, feedback and then get their feedback of something that we may have missed. And so that was awesome and I really appreciate it. And then. And for CloudSec, several of you commented when we shared our CSPM, and I just really appreciate the feedback you get from that. So I wanted to say thank you to everybody, and we're ready for questions. Thank you. Um, the matrix itself, a uh, lot of questions on YouTube, Slack, basically every, every place. Uh, where is the latest updated version? Are you going to continue to update it? Yeah, um, I will get it publicly uh, accessible, put it on a link and share that out. Right now, if you go into the Ford CloudSec Slack and uh, search for CSPM, it'll show up, but I will make sure that I get that link out and shared. Uh, um, the uh, user stories that you wrote, are those part of the, the, the matrix? Or are they yep, something that'll be on the use awesome. case page and then it'll go map directly to the capabilities yeah, and nice. purpose. Do you, do you find that most of the, um, most of the user stories are written with a security engineer in mind as the user story, or do you find that there are other audiences that, that a C, for a CSPM tool? Yeah, so we started with a security engineer in mind and then made sure that from, it, it is a security in mind that we wrote it with, and then tried to figure out where the risk in the company was. So I was curious if uh, how important was periodic scans versus on-demand scans or, or more like real-time or close to real-time detections and response was in this particular case. Uh, that was question number one. The qu second question I had was around uh, this evaluation criteria. Like for us as a practitioner community, does it make sense for us to just have a standard snapshot of all the vendors out there against the evaluation criteria and keep it constantly updated so that every practitioner does not have to go through the same evaluation criteria. Of course, the environments are different. Maybe there are certain portions that are very generic that is worth capturing it, and then you can only spend more time on the, on the specific pieces for your environment, right? Yeah, both great questions. Um, for the first one, for periodic scanning in our highly ephemeral environment, we were finding that only scanning once every 24 hours wasn't getting us an accurate representation, what was actually in our environment, especially if you have more traffic during the eight to five business hours and you only scan at midnight, you're not getting a full representation of all the compute you have running. And then your second question, 
Um, I would love if everyone used this template as a starter, but you really want to take this template and put it into your environment and make sure that you capitalize on what you're looking for. Maybe you're, uh, like we focus only on AWS, but if you have GCP or Azure, a lot of it's generic enough that you can use it, but I really would encourage you to take this as a starter and then add in um, things that were specific to your environment to make it better. Thank you for that talk. Uh, when you talk about uh, c customizing rules, what's your ideal setup? Is it something like Cloud Custodian? Is it something embedded in the tool, um, but with uh, some sort of standard language? Can you speak more about that? Yeah, great question. So um, at previous roles, uh, we used open source tools like Cloud Custodian. You go in and develop your YAML. And um, for Nextdoor, what we're doing is we're taking the tools that are there and the rules that are in place, and we're adapting them to fit our environment. So there's a rule, for instance, that says everything is publicly accessible and it fires and says, you know, we found 500 things, but we have compensating controls such as Okta or an identity proxy or some other form. And so what we do is we take that and we modify it to our environment and say, ignore the things that have compensating controls or lower the criticality of those. And then um, within the tool and the tool's language, because um, it's a GraphQL interface. And then we say anything that has a 200 OK that doesn't meet these criteria, that's what we really want to focus on because that's where we see the risk. Did that answer your question? Perfect. So <clears throat> using a tool like this, uh, we really want to pay it forward and uh, the amount of work security team does want it to go down over time. So in your experience, especially if you take config management, have you seen after the inception of the tool, you learned a pattern and then started to reduce the number of findings that this provides. Vulnerabilities, vulnerability things show up, we keep uh, uh, tackling it. But from a config management perspective, have you guys seen uh, a dip in the number of uh, misconfigurations uh, per se in your environment? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're very blessed that everything in our in production environment is pushed through infrastructure as code. And so when we find these issues, we go back and we change it to the source and we have the developer team who's building that uh, part of the application implement it. And then we put controls around it um, to not allow that to happen again. So like public S3 buckets, we can define what the uh, S3 bucket bucket policy should be, and then we put that in place, so then the developer says new bucket attaches the policy and goes out, and then that reduces that part of the configuration management. Um, so as we find more issues, we really try and work with the other engineering team so that we can make sure that um, that issue isn't just, you know, you fix it today and then it shows up tomorrow or next week. Any other questions? All right, thanks so much, David. All right, thank you. Uh, All right, uh, next up is a short break. Uh, back uh, 25 minutes, the unholy marriage of AWS IAM roles and instance profiles. See you there.
Welcome back. Uh, let's get started on our second session of the day. A uh, couple quick notes before we start. Uh, two things. First of all, uh, conversations are uh, welcome. They're the main point of this conference. If we could not have them in this room, I think the speakers would appreciate it. Uh, second, if you're interested in participating in the game day, uh, there's a thread on Slack where you can comment or just uh, give a thumbs up. Uh, I know that Will and Rich uh, would like to provision the right amount of, uh, of uh, targets for tomorrow's target practice. So uh, take a look for that on Slack. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, particularly Orca Security. Uh, Orca Security is the leading agentless cloud security platform that delivers complete unified cloud security across every layer of your multi-cloud estate, enabling organizations to prioritize risk and achieve compliance. Uh, I will be looking for questions after the talk. Um, but now, please welcome Andre Rall for the unholy marriage of AWS IAM roles and instance profiles. Welcome, Andre. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, everyone. So, as the title uh, states, I'm going to be talking about uh, IAM roles, instance profiles, and some nuances that I, uh, I discovered. So, quick view of the agenda uh, as we think about IAM roles, really about the credentials what we're going to observe is some of the behavior, right? So removing a role from an instance, what happens, excuse me, from an instance profile, uh, adding the original role back to the instance profile, add a new role to the original instance profile, and then removing the role from the instance profile and deleting, excuse me, removing the role from the instance profile and deleting the actual instance profile. So this is not going to go into what an instance profile is, what an IAM role is, how they work together. That's an assumption that's already being made given the uh, uh, folks within the, uh, within the crowd. Uh, we're also going to show you how to uh, get rid of those credentials by disassociating a deleted instance profile. And then lastly, we're going to look at a little the, uh, the permissions. So um, this talk's going to be more of a, a demo, a pre-recorded demo. So uh, uh, it's not just going to be slides, hopefully a little exciting. I had to split my screen with CLI and uh, actual console. So the folks in the back, hopefully you get to see something. Uh, I don't think you will, but nonetheless, it'll be recorded. So you can go back, pull it up on YouTube, and uh, go and watch it. A uh, little bit about me. So I currently work for a company called Uptix, uh, Director of Cloud Security, Offensive Cloud Security Research. So I don't really maintain environments or anything like that, but I tinker, play, break, uh, try and find the gaps and holes and nuances and niches that can be exploited by uh, threat actors. Uh, prior to Uptix, I was at AWS for five and a half years, uh, Rackspace, Rapid7, and uh, there is my LinkedIn QR code. If you want to connect, just reach out and uh, happy to connect. Great, so just to set the baseline, uh, you know, we have a, a, a role, administrator policy attached to it. Uh, you're gonna hear me use colors for roles, blue, gray, pink, orange, um, just to make it a little easier. So what we can see here on the right-hand side, the instance has blue role with blue instance profile uh, created. Uh, instance is using that blue role. As we can see, we're showing the uh, profile associations. As you know, you create an if you create a role within the console, it automatically creates the instance profile name for you. If you do it via CLI, you have to independently create the role and instance profile Within, uh, within CLI. So as you can see there, uh, let me pause here. Uh, what I do want to show you here is this blue role attached to this instance is being served uh, credentials ending in K5QD. As we go through this, uh, you'll notice that K5QD does not change. So uh, let's move on to the next one. So observation one. Removing blue role from blue instance profile. I've removed the role from the blue instance profile, and as you can imagine, the credentials are still being used by the instance, right? Nothing groundbreaking. We know that uh, EC2 will cache these uh, credentials, um, but as we go further along, it should hopefully be a little more interesting. So here we can see we're describing the instance profile associations. 
Uh, instance profile blue is still attached, but clearly you can see there is no role attached to that instance profile. However, when I go and uh, look at the credentials, you can see K5QD is still present. This, by the way, persists for six hours. So you can have a role outside of an instance profile, and those credentials will persist for six hours uh, beyond that. Uh, Blue Roll had administrator policy attached to it. Uh, the reason I did administrator policy, just to make it easy, and you know, one thing you're gonna notice that I've got very limited blur on my resources. Well, the account's been torched, burnt, so if you see access keys, don't even think about trying to use them because they're gone. Oh. Give me one second, apologies. I don't think there's internet. Oh. Did the internet go down? I think there's internet. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now, observation two. We wanna put the original blue roll back into the instance profile. What happens? You would think new credentials would get refreshed, but they don't. So as we go through this, uh, you can see instance profile blue is still attached to the EC2 instance. Uh, when we hop into the instance, you'll see the association is still there and uh, as we go through with this, you'll see that uh, as we go into the, uh, the role that's attached to the instance profile, you can see the blue role is now attached to the actual instance profile. Again, Q5, K5, QD, still present, right? So if you think about the, uh, the behavior here, right, EC2 is uh, caching the credentials, but you would think at some point that those credentials would get refreshed. But in my testing, those credentials were valid for six hours, just like the previous uh, observation. What if we take the blue role out and add a completely different role to the blue instance profile, right? So one thing I wanna show you, yeah, let me just go back. <clears throat> Green role, has administrator, and it has an inline policy with an explicit deny. Explicit deny for creating a user and creating an access key. Blue role had administrator policy with no explicit deny. So what I want to test now is does the green role credentials uh, uh, get used once I attach that green role to the blue instance profile? So just walking you through, as you can see, blue roll is still attached here. Uh, I'm now gonna remove blue roll from blue instance profile. And then I'm going to go ahead and attach green roll to uh, the blue instance profile. And as you figured out by now in the top right, the time period listed there is how long the credentials persisted. Uh, with that, off that particular, excuse me, uh, surfaced off that particular change. So describing the instance profile associations, you can see the blue profile is associated with this EC2 instance. Uh, when I get the information for this profile, you can now see that green role is now uh, attached to the blue instance profile. 
And again, when I go and do curling the metadata, uh, K5QD credentials are still present. Again, in my testing, this persisted for 54 minutes. So what does that mean? Uh, as you swap out roles into an instance profile, don't expect immediate changes. Yes, AWS says eventual consistency takes place, but 54 minutes is a pretty lengthy time for eventual consistency to actually, uh, uh, actually catch up. And then just for you know, curiosity, I try to find the uh, green uh, uh, role um, uh, uh, instance association, but I couldn't find it. And then just to validate the blue role credentials are still working, I went in, created a user, and you can see blue role allows me to create a user, green role had an explicit deny. So I was still using green role, excuse me, blue role's credentials uh, off 54 minutes uh, into uh, adding green role to blue instance profile. So this is where it gets interesting. What if I just want to get rid of blue roll? Everything blue roll. Blue roll, blue instance profile, everything, right? I just don't want blue roll, blue instance profile associated with my EC2 instances. And what's fascinating is once you detach green roll, so in this example now you're going to see green roll after 54 minutes, it's going to generate a new set of credentials. Uh, I'm then going to detach green roll, and then I'm going to delete the blue instance profile from EC2. So LNSY, as you can see, credentials are being served by uh, 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 IMDS. <coughs> and in order to delete the blue role, first you have to delete the policy attached to it. So I've deleted the policy, now I'm gonna delete the blue role. And again, just by CLI, the instance profile is still gonna remain. So you can't delete the profile uh, uh, together, just like you do in the console. So now I'm going to remove the green role from the blue instance profile. As you can see, there's no role attached to this, and the instance profile is still attached to the EC2 instance. Next, I'm going to go in and actually delete the profile, instance profile, that's attached to the instance. Once I refresh it, you can see there is no profile attached to this EC2 instance. So this instance has no profile, technically, even though it's listed here in the console, and no role attached. But as we go through with this, you'll see that I can, I do get the same credentials, LNSY, and now with green role, remember it has an explicit deny in it, when I go in and try and create a user, uh, further on in this video, you're going to see that it, uh, it won't allow me. But here we have the instance profile blue, AWS still says it's attached, uh, and uh, when I try and get it, it says, hey, I can't find this blue instance profile. So it's contradicting it, saying it's attached, but hey, we can't find it. And again, yeah, to test out the uh, uh, policy for green role, I'm going to create a user. It's going to give me an explicit deny because to show that the green role policy is being used uh, uh, for this, uh, these credentials. And then just to do get caller identity, as you can see, the green role is being, uh, being used. Warning, deleting a role or instance profile that is associated with the running instance will break any application that are running on that instance. Well, clearly not. What AWS is assuming is if you delete the role plus instance profile together, yes, that is impactful. But if you remove a role, then delete the profile, nothing breaks. You get credentials for six hours. So. As you think through your security strategy, as you think of through working with roles and, and profiles, um, it's very important to, to remember this because uh, you know, what AWS says may not always be applicable in the real world. So finally, how did I break the connection? How did I get AWS, this EC2 instance, to not use those credentials? Well, I had to go and delete, or excuse me, disassociate the deleted blue role profile. 
In the previous video, I deleted that blue roll profile, but according to AWS, it was still there. So as you can see, LNSY, uh, I can list users uh, using the green roll credentials. Uh, I can go in, I can list roles. But in the console, there is no role attached. There is no EC2 blue, uh, excuse me, instance profile. So it's a little confusing. What you have to do is find the association ID for that particular role or that, that uh, instance profile. Once you have that association ID, you can go ahead and detach or disassociate that instance profile from that particular EC2 instance. Once it says disassociating, at that point, you know, you try to make some calls, create a user, uh, and or list the users, and you can see there it says, hey, unable to locate any credentials. So finally, after uh, disassociating the blue roll, uh, that connection was broken. But the scary thing is, for six hours, those credentials persisted. So if you think about your teams, or you as a practitioner, uh, you may see that a role is, is, is disassociated or, or not in an instance profile or the instance doesn't have any instance profiles associated with it but clearly there are some nuances that show uh, there is still uh, behavior that the instance can call those uh, user's credentials. As we get into permissions, AWS talks about in order to pass a role to an instance you need these uh, permissions, actions. IAM pass role, as we know, it's not an API, it's permission. Uh, associate IAM instance profile and then replace instance profile uh, association. But what it doesn't talk about is the instance, excuse me, the role and the instance profile. Disconnecting those, so breaking those apart. You know, I think we've led to believe that role and instance profile are joined by the hip and those two have to work side by side. But clearly, as we see, that's not the case. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an explicit deny policy for these three actions. Oops. And we're going to test it. So I have a new role, gray role. Uh, as you can see, I have an inline policy and uh, explicit deny for those three uh, uh, particular actions. I'm going to remove gray role from gray instance profile, and then I'm going to attempt to add purple role into gray instance profile. As you can see, the instance is now you know, calling gray role. Uh, now I'm removing gray role from gray instance profile, and I'm going to attempt to add in uh, purple role to gray instance profile. Explicit deny for pass role. So what if I edit this and only exclude pass role? So explicitly deny um, uh, associate I instance profile and then replace I am instance profile. Because I have admin policy attached, it's going to be implicitly allowed to pass the role. So as I update the policy and I go in and uh, uh, now try and associate the purple role with the gray instance profile, it's going to allow me. So going back to AWS's documentation, just be aware, it talks about role or instance profile association. But if you leave the instance profile alone and swap in out the role, you can, you can manipulate it. You can get credentials, you can persist for a little bit longer. So, quick summary, observation one. We removed blue roll from instance profile blue. Credentials were crashed for six hours, nothing changed. Uh, we added the original blue roll back to the instance profile, nothing changed. Same credentials persisted for uh, six hours. Observation three, we added a completely different role into a blue instance profile, the original instance profile. 54 minutes later in my testing, uh, green roles uh, credentials refreshed. 
Observation four, remove role green and delete the instance profile. At that point, EC2 instance has no role attached, no instance profile, technically. For six hours, those credentials persisted. I was able to use those credentials for the following six hours. Observation five, how did I finally break it? I had to go and dis disassociate the deleted instance profile blue. And by the way, this is the least impactful way that I found. Another way you can disassociate the uh, credentials, you can stop the instance, start the instance, delete the role, or uh, uh, you know, put a hard inline policy, which at that point we all know is, is very impactful. And then observation six, you know, of the three stated uh, actions stated by uh, AWS in the documentation, only past role is required, which as we know, is very difficult to monitor for past role. So as we think through this, some questions for everyone to think about. You know, how many instance profiles do you have in your account, unused? Do you know which role your attached instance profiles are actually using? Does your team know how to identify the instance profile plus role plus the instance ID? And is there a valid reason you don't have a one-to-one -one role name with your instance profile name? Some of you may have a valid reason. For the most part, I think it's challenging. Uh, and then are you monitoring for remove role from instance profile, add role to instance profile, which are the commands that I use? Or are you only monitoring for the uh, actions that uh, AWS states on their, uh, on their documentation? So here are my thoughts. Threat actors love to sow confusion and havoc into an environment. They're gonna swap roles in and out because when you go through the logs, you're gonna get a bunch of actions. You can say, WTF, what just happened here? And you could try to correlate timestamps, and it's not going to align. Remove role, no instance profile allows the threat actor to persist for six hours. There's a window of 54 minutes when roles are swapped that they can use the previous role's credentials. Less skilled engineers are going to get confused when they look at instance profile, role name, and trying to understand uh, you know, why is there a differentiation between the role name and the uh, instance profile name. There's no indication in the console that the previous role credentials are still persisting. Any role can be added to an existing instance profile. So know your instance profiles, know your role names, which one is being used where. Your instance profile and role may not align with what's expected. You may think role is, is indicative of some type of production workload or behavior, but is it actually being used for that? And then eventual consistency is a weak guarantee. As we saw, uh, eventual consistency is very loosely defined, uh, but it happens. You know, AWS states it in their documentation, but uh, you know, just be patient. And then for those watching, uh, put a bunch of resources for anyone who wants to learn about this, test it, play around with it. Uh, this will be up, so happy to share this and uh, use it. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? I will start with one. Uh, how did you discover this? Was it automated testing, some manual testing? Like what, 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 <laughs> led, what led this to come to your attention? You know, just like most practitioners, right, you, you, you kind of stumble on something and then you, you get curious. Um, for me it was we, we reverse engineer attacks and then we build it into our product for customers to benefit. And as we were trying to detect for the uh, uh, cloud trial events, something wasn't lining up. And then uh, we were looking at the instance and making calls and looking at credentials. And just like we saw here, the confusion set in. And as a confusion set in, we just, I went down this rabbit hole and tried to really understand what is going on. Have you seen sort of any evidence of this kind of confusion in attacks or things related to it? Uh, I've not seen it firsthand, um, but we all know, right? Don't underestimate threat actors. Uh, you know, they may be watching this right now and probably going to try it, um, but... Thank you. Yeah, so, but at least we all know, so now we know what to look for. Uh, any other question? Oh, actually, yeah, good question. Uh, I did report this to AWS, and the response was expected behavior. 
But we all know you report something and time goes on and all of a sudden it doesn't work like you wanted it to work or you know, they magically just fixed it. Have you checked any adjacent services that have similar like profile behavior for this uh, same issue? Uh, when you say adjacent services, like uh, Lambda or... Yeah. Uh, no, no. My, my testing was as, went as far as uh, EC2. Uh, but, yeah. On short answer, no. 2024 talks incoming. Yeah. Do you recommend any mitigations against this? Or is expected behavior? <laughs> I don't know about mitigations. I would just say, you know, going back to you know, monitoring for these, uh, um, these API calls, right? Uh, you know, I think best practice is obviously use roles with EC2 instances, um, but I don't know how you would actually mitigate this from occurring because it's AWS, right? You can't change the IMDBS service. Cool. All right, well, thank you very much. Next up, evading logging in the cloud, disrupting and bypassing the various contracts. So we'll see you back here in six minutes. All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're about to start our next 40-minute talk. Two quick notes before we start. First, uh, conversations hallway or vendor room or anywhere else in the hotel, please. I know our speakers would appreciate quiet, similar uh, phones off, you know, the usual. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, especially Prisma Cloud. Prisma Cloud is the industry's most comprehensive cloud-native application protection platform. CNAP, with the broadest security and compliance coverage for applications, data, and the entire cloud-native technology stack throughout the development lifecycle and across hybrid and multi-cloud environments. Uh, as always, I will be waiting for Q&A uh, after the talk. Please raise your hand. We'll bring you the mic. That way, YouTube can hear you. Please welcome Nick Vershen. Thanks. Testing. Okay, everybody hear me in the back too? Yep, okay, perfect. All right, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Hope everyone's had a good start to for CloudSec. There are a ton of great talks today on a wide variety of topics. And in this one, I'd like to focus in from an adversary's perspective. How can an attacker evade detection in an AWS environment by either disrupting or bypassing AWS CloudTrail? To uh, cover this content, uh, we have a whole lot to talk about. We'll just do a quick level set on what CloudTrail is and why hackers hate it. Then we'll talk quite a bit about disrupting CloudTrail, 
what options does an adversary have after gaining a foothold to try to disable or otherwise make things difficult for the blue team. Um, we'll point at some real world situations where this has occurred and then also talk about some ways where we can deploy CloudTrail that fairly effectively mitigates this risk. Um, after that, we're gonna do a deep dive into bypassing CloudTrail. I've found over time a number of vulnerabilities that have allowed me to bypass CloudTrail in some way. Everything from simple permission enumeration up to and including just interacting with the service while evading by, uh, CloudTrail. Um, to do this, we'll do a crash course into the internals of the AWS API, how it works, We'll take a look at those vulnerabilities, and then we'll also explore the potential for automating the discovery of future bypasses. Now, it's worth noting, all the vulnerabilities and issues I'll be discussing today have since been fixed by AWS. So this is less of a, if you're a red team or a pen tester, here are these things you can use, and more of a, how can we apply these techniques going forward? And we'll show that in at least one situation, we could do just that. Uh, there's a ton of great content in this talk, including some research that hasn't been made public yet, so I hope you enjoy. Um, as for who I am, hi, uh, my name is Nick Rochette. I do AWS security research, both as a hobby and as a profession. Um, as a result of the research I do, sometimes I find vulnerabilities in the services themselves, and we'll be talking about a couple of those today. Um, minor side note, uh, to support this talk, I have a bunch of uh, references, uh, documentation, notes, general information in the slide notes section. So if I mention something you're interested in or you'd like to learn more about, definitely check out uh, the slides at that URL. I've also sat in the back for a couple si sessions and I totally recognize that fonts can be difficult to read. Um, so strongly encourage you to check out the slides there to uh, see some of the things I'll be talking about. So really quick, I recognize that Forward CloudSec is a multi-cloud conference, and perhaps we have some folks who are more familiar with Azure or GCP. So really quick, what's CloudTrail, and why is it a problem for bad guys? So CloudTrail is a fundamental cloud security service from AWS. It's responsible for logging calls to the AWS API, and it helps security teams answer the question of who did what when in an AWS environment. It has uses for allowing you to uh, query those logs, to do threat detection if somebody's being suspicious, um, as well as the potential for auto remediation to just automatically repair uh, any type of, of issue. Um, so as you can imagine, security teams love it. It's fantastic, it has all these great uses, and for adversaries, CloudTrail is a major problem. There is a huge draw for an adversary to use IEM credentials, because with those credentials, they can do things potentially like privilege escalation, lateral movement, accessing resources, uh, maintaining persistence, and so much more. And so as an adversary, you are incentivized to steal them and use them, but you run the risk that just about anything you'll do with them gets logged to CloudTrail, and then later on, uh, get sent to some seam, some data lake, some uh, analytics tool, and suddenly you're, you're caught. And uh, speaking as a former pen tester, there's nothing worse than finally getting C2 on an EC2 instance, stealing those credentials, getting a little too excited, running them from your own machine, and then 30 minutes later, the SOC's messaging you saying, hey, it's super weird that these creds from a machine in Virginia are starting to phone home from Illinois. What's up with that? Uh, and then you're caught out. So. As adversaries, if we want to do something about CloudTrail, what options are available to us? In the event that we can gain a foothold in an AWS environment and either escalate privileges or uh, simply steal credentials with sufficient privileges, we can attempt to disrupt CloudTrail, trying to disable its setup in the account, uh, deleting the logs after the fact, and things like that. As a secondary option, we can try to bypass CloudTrail. Um, I've found a number of vulnerabilities that have allowed me to bypass CloudTrail in some way. And if an adversary does this, finds a vulnerability in an AWS service and is able to query the API, all without logging to CloudTrail, from the victim's perspective, the adversary is invisible. They have no way of knowing that this activity has taken place. And to be clear, this is not a misconfiguration. This is not something we can architect against. These are flaws very firmly on the AWS side of the shared responsibility model. So with these two options available, these will be the primary focus of our talk today. So, really quick, 
there's a couple different ways you can deploy CloudTrail in an environment. Uh, we'll start in its most basic form with account level trails. We'll work our way up with some uh, attacks against those and then discuss some alternative means to deploy CloudTrail that fairly effectively mitigates a lot of these risks. So in its simplest form, uh, a CloudTrail trail is a configuration you can create in your account that describes where logs can be sent to, i.e. what S3 bucket, uh, along with some additional configurations like uh, integrity validation, encryption, uh, the types of logs you want to store, and, and things like that. Um, from CloudTrail, those get logged into an S3 bucket where you can retain them for the period of time of your choosing, and then your SIM, your data lake, your analytics tool, whatever you're using, can consume logs from that bucket. So for an adversary who has gained a foothold in an AWS environment, they have two general attack paths that they can try to pursue. They can go after the trail, or they can go after the bucket. For a real world example where this has taken place, um, a Sysdig has an excellent article about a threat actor they identified called, that they've called Scarleteal, who took a fairly simple approach to a complex problem, uh, and once they had sufficient privileges, just called CloudTrail, stop logging, which has the effect that logs don't get logged, and theoretically this would hinder a defender trying to react to it. Um, some additional options would be things like delete trail, just delete it, uh, you could try to update the trail, so try to point it at a different S3 bucket. Since it's not the normal logging bucket, logs don't go to the right place and thus they get missed by the analytics tools. Um, or you could try to do CloudTrail put event selectors. Um, this is a configuration that describes the specific logs you do want it to log. So for instance, if you set it to be something esoteric or niche, something like AWS recognition, this has the effect that it omits the more security relevant services like IAM, KMS, Secrets Manager, and things like that. Uh, from the S3 bucket side of things, a lot of the same general ideas apply. You can try and delete the bucket, you can try to uh, set a different put bucket policy, or so you try to set a different policy on the bucket to prevent CloudTrail from writing to it. Um, you can just delete the logs, um, or you could try and do a put lifecycle configuration. And again, this is another real world example of something that's happened. Um, unfortunately, Ubiquity, uh, makers of fine uh, consumer electronics, switches, routers, IP cameras and such, I'm sure some folks probably have some Ubiquity gear, um, they unfortunately suffered a breach caused by one of their own insiders who then tried to uh, ransom them essentially. Um, one of the activities that individual did after presumably the investigators started catching on is he changed the retention policy on the S3 bucket storing the CloudTrail logs down to a single day, presumably with the intention of uh, trying to hinder investigators. Now, it's at this point that I did want to mention, um, in the event that this happens to you and somebody deletes your trail or deletes the logs themselves, or perhaps even non-maliciously, just accidentally, you still have access to all the management events that, that occurred, so long as you get to it in 90 days. Um, I think since a lot of us likely interact with CloudTrail through like a third-party SIM or something like that, uh, it might be reasonable to assume that, hey, if the infrastructure supporting the logs gets busted, we just lost those logs. But in reality, by default, CloudTrail is running out of the box with no configuration every time you create an AWS account. Even if you've never set up a trail before, it's still running, and you can still pull those events. I promise it's not actually a red, red screen for a slide. Um, one second. And we're back. Um, you can still pull those events uh, from the uh, CloudTrail API, or if you prefer a GUI, you can use the event history. Bear in mind that's going to be on a account by account basis. Um, uh, how can we prevent this? Probably the best way to go about it would be to use an organization trail. Organization trails are a feature of AWS organizations, and relevant to this context, they have some uh, a pretty important feature. Um, organization trails cannot be edited or deleted by principals in the member account. So even if an adversary gets administrator access or star star permissions, they won't be able to delete or edit the trail. Um, as some additional options, if you're using Control Tower, it's worth noting that up until landing zone version 3.0, which was released less than a year ago, uh, Control Tower was using account level trails, which theoretically would open you up to some of the risks that I described, but thankfully, in addition, they included some SCPs to try and prevent that, and that takes us into uh, SCPs. In the event that you can't use an organization trail for insert reason, uh, SCPs are probably a great way to lock down uh, who can mess with your trails or delete them. 
And with that out of the way, we get into uh, the interesting stuff, actively bypassing CloudTrail. Um, in general, there are three sort of archetypes for CloudTrail bypasses that I've identified. Protocol mutation, undocumented APIs, and non-production endpoints. Uh, in order to abuse basically any of these though, we have to know a little bit about how the AWS API works. Uh, I'm sure many folks have used, uh, or uh, many folks experience with the AWS API is through things like the CLI or the, maybe the SDKs. And these are great because it helps abstract away a lot of that complexity so that we don't have to deal with it. But if we're gonna start attacking the API, we have to know a little bit about how it works. So uh, a quick level set or a quick introduction to the AWS API. It's important to note that AWS is very big on what they refer to as model first design. When they build a new service before they write a single line of code, they first create a model that describes everything about that service what the operations are, uh, what the uh, parameters for those operations are, and so on. And that model-first design carries over well into production. And we can actually extract out those models from the SDK, and this is an example of such uh, here, specifically for the KMS service. Uh, and this model is important because this is, how, this is how we know how to format our requests and what API operations are available to us. And so picking out just a couple important things from this model, we have the endpoint prefix, which is responsible for telling us the actual endpoint, or at least part of the endpoint that we'll need to communicate with the service. We have the operations, which is a little bit cut off at the bottom there. Uh, the API, or the operations of a model are the actual API actions you can perform. So relevant to KMS, those are like list keys, create keys, list aliases, and so on. Um, now, arguably the most important part about this entire model is the protocol. The protocol is the part of the model that describes how we need to format our request so that it can be serialized on the client and then deserialized on the server. And as we can see here, KMS uses uh, protocol uh, JSON, specifically JSON version 1.1. Uh, now there are six protocols for the AWS API. Relevant to our discussion today will be JSON version 1.0 and 1.1. Uh, and again, the protocol describes how the request is formatted. So continuing our KMS example, since we know it's JSON version 1.1, we know it's always gonna be a post request. It's always gonna to go to the, the base path, not like slash API or something like that. We know it'll send content as JSON. Uh, specific to JSON, there's an additional header, the X Amazon target header, which is uh, two terms separated by a period, uh, the target prefix and the actual operation. In case you're wondering, uh, what Trent is or who Trent is. Sometimes AWS includes internal, what appear to be internal code names or service names in their models. And as for Trent, uh, credit to Aiden Steele for digging this up. Uh, Trent is a reference to the Alice and Bob naming convention in which Trent is the trusted third party in cryptography. Uh, the final part of the, the protocol or the format that we need to know is the content type because specific to JSON 1.0 and 1.1, the version of JSON is sent as a header. And so this takes us into our first potential CloudTrail bypass. If there are these really well-defined structures and formats for how API requests should, should look, what happens if we start mutating our requests or sending formats in an odd way? Interesting thing about that JSON one, if you sent at the time a 1.0 header, to a 1.1 API, you would get back different HTTP response codes depending on if you did or did not have sufficient permissions to invoke that action. Uh, as an example, if you did, you would get back a 404, and if you did not, you would get back a 403. And critical to all of this, regardless of what permissions that principal had, none of it got logged to CloudTrail. And so what this meant was through this technique, if you stole IAM credentials, you can brute force or identify what permissions you had for the JSON 1.1 protocol, all while evading CloudTrail. And at the time, this affected over 645 actions across over 40 services. And so for a real world perspective on what you would do with this, it's important to note that adversaries often don't have uh, a clue as to what permissions of uh, what permissions the credentials they've compromised have access to. They're completely in the dark. 
unless they can source that information from a third party, something like infrastructure as code stored in Git, or perhaps maybe uh, internal documentation or wikis, um, or if the credentials have IEM permissions, they could try to do it that way. But outside of these situations, attackers are normally very much so in the dark as to what they can access with credentials. So a common technique is to simply just try and see what works. They'll try different API actions. If they succeed, good, and they, they know they work. If they don't, well, they know they don't work. And you can even use a handy tool called Enumerate IEM to sort of brute force this at scale for you. Now, the good news for defenders is that this behavior is fairly easy to detect. It presents as a sudden uh, uptick in access denied errors or in a, a principal performing actions that they have never performed before. And so it's often a golden opportunity to detect adversaries who are relatively early on in the intrusion lifecycle and hopefully shut them out. But if we apply the technique that I just described, an adversary would be able to enumerate permissions completely silently, avoiding CloudTrail and evading detection. Defenders would lose out on an amazing opportunity to catch an adversary, and for adversaries, they can enumerate hundreds of permissions over tens of services. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, I have a ton of additional information and some proof of concept scripts to run. Um, for this time, for its time, uh, this was an amazing tool for red teamers and penetration testers to very quickly identify what they could do with some credentials and then try and continue their attacks. Uh, this takes us into the second topic, which is undocumented APIs. Um, I think undocumented APIs have been sort of a hot topic amongst the cloud security research community lately uh, because we can potentially use them to perform actions that we weren't aware that we could, or as we'll see, we can sometimes bypass CloudTrail. Now, I recognize it could be a little awkward to describe undocumented APIs because we, we call them undocumented, but I'm sure somewhere inside of AWS, there's a wiki or documentation or something that, that describes what these API actions are and what these services are. It's just, as mere mortals outside of AWS, we can't access that. Um, so for our purposes today, I'll define an undocumented API as one that uh, is an API that exists within AWS that doesn't appear in the public documentation or doesn't appear in the SDKs. And to be clear, just because an API or, or, or a service is undocumented doesn't mean it's vulnerable. There are thousands of API operations which are undocumented and are completely benign and uninteresting. But sometimes they can be vulnerable. Um, as an example, earlier this year, I found two minor cross-tenant vulnerabilities in the App Runner service. Uh, these operations were marked as internal only, except could, I could execute them from my normal AWS account. Um, and these essentially worked by, uh, you provided a AWS account ID, any AWS account ID, even ones you don't own, uh, and it would return you information uh, about the App Runner service in that account. So the actual problem with undocumented APIs is how do we find them, right? Um, as compared to the documented APIs, there's, there's the SDKs, there's the documentation, there's all these things we can learn about to, to know how to interact with the service. Uh, for the undocumented APIs, we're kind of in the dark. How do we find these things short of uh, getting some insiders at AWS to leak the info? Please don't do that. Um, so the way that I have found has been to actually abuse the console. It might sound a little weird to say, um, but the AWS console is as much a client of the AWS API as the CLI is. In order for your browser to know how to format requests to send to the API, it has to know the models and the, all the information to actually sign those requests. And as a result, the model files, including what I showed earlier in the, in the KMS example, uh, exist in the JavaScript that gets sent to your browser. And so what you can do is you can crawl the AWS console, go through all the front-end JavaScript that gets sent, and then extract out those model files. And for whatever reason, those models include internal-only APIs and some undocumented APIs that we can potentially use. Um, if you're interested in this topic, uh, I have a GitHub repo where I have uh, all the models that I have collected. Um, and in a couple weeks, I'd like to release a blog post with some additional information as well as the automation I'm actually using to uh, crawl and extract out these, these models. 
Um, but if you did what I just described, you would eventually find an undocumented service called IEM Admin. Now, IEM Admin is interesting because it interacts directly with the IEM service, and it's actually a service you've likely used before, you just didn't know it. Um, if you open up the AWS console, hit F12 to open up your, your browser's network tab, and then navigate to the IEM page, you will see uh, calls to the IEM Admin service. Now, IEM Admin is kind of weird because specifically, the operation names sound vaguely familiar to IEM actions, but not quite. So as an example, there is uh, IEM Admin list access keys for multiple users. It sounds a lot like uh, IEM list access keys. Uh, and again, we can go through the JavaScript and we can extract out all of the operations that are available to us with IEM Admin. And what's interesting is if we invoke these actions with a user or role with no permissions, we get a strange error. Specifically, as an example, if we invoke IEM Admin list access keys for multiple users, the error message we get back is user no perm is not authorized to perform IEM list access keys. And so it's through this way in an undocumented API that we can use IEM admin sort of like a, like a proxy to invoke the real IEM actions and get those results. Now, if we did that uh, over and over again for all the operations we found, we would then find basically create a map between the IEM admin methods and the equivalent IEM method. And it's based on this that it becomes sort of clear the, the, the purpose of IEM admin. Um, especially with uh, things like uh, list groups for users uh, plural versus list groups for user singular. Um, it appears the purpose of IEM admin was to be sort of like a batch operation for the uh, normal IEM API. And in the context of the console, it makes a lot of sense. It's a lot more efficient and performant to have a single call for list access keys for multiple users and pass in 50 usernames as parameters rather than 50 individual IEM list access keys calls. So now the question is, uh, what does this show up in CloudTrail? IEM admin or IEM? As it turned out, it showed up as neither because it didn't log at all. And so it was through this method that we could use this undocumented API to perform IEM actions all without logging to CloudTrail. Um, and this, this matters because this is another great opportunity for the defenders to detect uh, enumerative behavior, list access keys, list groups, attackers trying to find out what's around them and what might be available to them. Uh, and there are a lot of commercial SIM products that wouldn't detect this type of thing out of the box. As in a random example, um, Guard Duty has a finding for IEM user anomalous behavior that would have caught onto this, but through this method, it didn't show up in CloudTrail, so it couldn't see it. Um, and again, this has since been fixed, but with the sheer number of undocumented APIs that are out there, it does make you wonder what other APIs behave in this way, sort of acting as a proxy for normal uh, API services. Uh, and this takes us to our final archetype for CloudTrail Bypass, and that is through non-production endpoints. Um, I, I feel very strongly that non-production endpoints are the most likely to return future bypasses with relatively little effort. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, just really quick, uh, in general, when you interact with an AWS API, the endpoint, the, the URL as it were, that you're interacting with will be different on a service by service basis and a region by region basis. And so typically the format of that, re that endpoint will be service name dot region dot Amazon AWS dot com. Uh, and if, as continuing our KMS example, uh, to talk to KMS and the US East one region, that would be the endpoint you use. Now, this is an example of a production endpoint. This is what the SDKs use, this is what the, the console uses, this is what they expect you to use. It may surprise you to note that there are a ton of non-production endpoints. And these endpoints appear to exist for a wide variety of reasons. Everything from uh, alpha, beta, gamma environments, there is staging, pre-prod, performance, integration, uh, there is preview builds, uh, they're alphabetical, A, B, C, D, F, G. Um, uh, and these are just a few examples here. This is certainly not the exhaustive list. Now, the thing to know about non-production endpoints is that uh, 
A, they don't exist for every service. They seem to kind of come and go over time. In general, I've been tracking or sort of uh, cataloging them since April, and that number has sort of steadily increased at a, approximately one to two per day. Um, but they do sort of recycle, they sort of churn rather than just being added on top. Um, the interesting thing about non-production endpoints is that they have potential for defense evasion purposes outside of CloudTrail bypasses. And we'll talk a little bit about what those purposes are in just a moment. Uh, to level set and sort of like start off easy, KMS-A is an example of a non-production endpoint that has access to production data and does log to CloudTrail. And if you wanted to, you could use this, uh, this the CLI action, AWS KMS list keys, perform the endpoint, or provide the endpoint URL uh, parameter, and then be sure to include the HTTPS colon slash slash, and you should be able to use that endpoint completely normally. Any resources you create with that endpoint should appear in the customer partition, it'll show up in the console, uh, and vice versa. Now, I'm being really specific, uh, specifically because uh, while this is an example of having access to production data and logging to CloudTrail, sometimes the inverse is true. There are some non-production endpoints that exist that do not have access to production data and do not log to CloudTrail. Uh, I recognize for those in the back this font is tiny, so I'll narrate. Um, here we're doing an SNS list topics in the US2 region, and we get a response, we get a topic because there, there is one. We then immediately do that exact same thing again, but this time with the endpoint URL sns-gamma. And you see, we don't find anything. Presumably because this environment is isolated from production resources, in the same way that presumably your pre-prod environment is isolated from your production environment. Now, the uh, major bummer here is that sns-gamma does not log to CloudTrail. So if it did have access to production data, that'd be great. We'd be able to pull those resources and use them completely silently. But just because it doesn't have access to production data doesn't mean it's completely useless to us. If you'll notice, we still got a response. It's empty, but it's there. It's not like we got an access denied. So somewhere, IEM took a look at the permissions of the principal invoking the action and said, hey, you're, you're authorized to do that, and it let it go through. And critically, it didn't get logged to CloudTrail. There's only one uh, event because we, in, we invoked it completely normally up here, but it didn't see the second one. And so it's through this method that we can potentially enumerate permissions completely silently, much the same as we could with the protocol mutation uh, technique that I described earlier. Um, and so again, this raises the question, if you're an adversary and you're trying to enumerate what permissions you have access to, why would you ever use the production endpoint, the, the basic simple endpoint that runs the risk of generating a bunch of logs and maybe getting you caught when if there is a non-production endpoint for the service you're interested in that doesn't log to CloudTrail, you can use this to evade detection. Um, if you're interested in this technique, that endpoint should still work as of this morning and in a couple weeks I intend to release a blog post with uh, some more details and information as well as a data set of uh, non-production endpoints that uh, fit this criteria. Um, uh, another potential uh, use uh, for non-production endpoints for CloudTrail bypass is what I've been loosely calling event source obfuscation. So uh, again, tiny font, I'll narrate. Um, here we're performing IVS list channels in the AP Northeast 1 region. We get a channel back because there, there is a channel in that, in that region. We then do the exact same thing again, but this time, again, we do the endpoint URL IVS-gamma. And you see, we get a channel because it's there. So presumably, this endpoint has access to production data. So, good news, things are looking great. Does it log to CloudTrail? Well, it does, but it does it in a really weird way. If you'll notice, the initial, we, we get two, two, call, or two uh, events, list channels, which is right. The first one, the event source is ivs.amazonavis.com, which is also correct. But when we use the non-production endpoint, the event source becomes gamma-starfruit. Um, I don't know what starfruit is. I presume it's an internal name or, or like a code name for the service, uh, but it's not in the model either, so I, I really don't know. Um, but this has the effect that we're able to invoke an action and get production data, but there's a different event source. So to my mind, there are two potential uses for this as an adversary. 
One, it's important to note that there are a number of sims that use the event source as a part of their rule creation. And if you find a non-production endpoint that has production data access and you start doing this, you will end up bypassing those sims and those rules specifically because it's not IVS uh, diamazonnews.com, it's gamma-starfruit. Um, the second potential use for this is in um, uh, sort of forensic scenarios. Um, say, for example, uh, you are reacting to an intrusion and you want to pull all the logs for an affected service during a particular time frame. So you might just go, okay, give me all the logs for ivs.amazonius.com. Well, that's not going to catch up on this, and so it's not going to get identified. And you may be able to evade detection because they're not looking in the right place for those activities. And I should be super clear, um, this technique is super, 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 super rare. Uh, I've only seen it in like a handful of non-production endpoints, but this is an example of it, of it working. Uh, and our final uh, use for uh, non-production endpoints in defense evasion purposes, uh, as you might have guessed, there are some endpoints that do have access to production data and do not log to CloudTrail, and that's exactly what we saw in Service Catalog. Uh, they had a Service Catalog dash gamma, you could send requests to it, and it would allow you to interact with the service while evading CloudTrail. Now, to sort of uh, uh, continue on describing how weird non-production endpoints are, what was interesting was when we tried to perform a write action against the service, uh, so like uh, uh, creating something new or modifying it, we would get an error. Specifically, access denied. The caller doesn't have permission to call this API, which, as you can imagine, was a huge bummer for me. But interestingly, uh, it, didn't, it didn't actually do anything because every time you would try it, you would get this error, it would still go through completely fine. So as an example, I tried to create a portfolio called this was made while bypassing CloudTrail. I get the error message and then it still went through totally fine. Still was able to create the resource. If, you were, if you're editing something, that change would persist uh, and it worked totally great. So it's through this method that we could use this non-production endpoint for the service catalog service and allow us to uh, get resources, modify resources completely silently, all without logging to CloudTrail. Now, early on in this uh, section, I mentioned that I thought that non-production endpoints would help deliver uh, future bypasses with relatively little effort. And the reason I said that is because uh, it, it, it did. Um, see, after the success of the service catalog stuff, I started getting very interested in non-production endpoints. How could we use those for additional defense evasion purposes? The challenge was, was very much like undocumented APIs, how do we find them, <laughs> right? There's no, there's no centralized location, at least outside of AWS, where you can, you can uh, get them. So I built some automation that on a daily basis, what it does is it uh, goes out to the Bodo Core library, pulls out all the models, and then starts brute forcing those endpoints. And the, um, the inputs for that brute force are things like certificate transparency logs, um, subject alternative names and TLS certs, uh, passive DNS, random guessing, um, and eventually as it brute forces endpoints, if it succeeds in finding one, it resolves to an IP address. We then try and perform a bunch of list, get, or describe operations against that endpoint, and if it succeeds, it then forwards it on to Slack for further human review. And it was through this process of uh, sort of automating uh, the detection and sort of brute forcing it o over time and, and at scale that we eventually found a new CloudTrail bypass for the event bridge service. Uh, very similar story to service catalog. Uh, the normal endpoint was events.region. Well, this one was events-b and for whatever reason, read and write actions did not log to CloudTrail. And additionally, sort of further cementing how weird non-production endpoints are, this one had no error message for read write actions, or sorry, specifically for write actions, went through totally fine, totally normally, nothing weird about it. Uh, I, we haven't blogged about this one, so I did want to mention uh, this too has also been fixed, and a major thank you to the AWS Security Outreach team for their help in getting this resolved, uh, as well as many of the previous issues as well. Um, uh, I do have this automation still running on a regular basis, um, so uh, if I identify any more CloudTrail bypasses, I intend to hand them over to AWS so that they can be fixed. Uh, 
Uh, and that has been a summary of all the different ways that I have found to bypass CloudTrail. Um, if you are a security researcher or somebody who is interested in AWS security research, I strongly encourage you to check out some of these techniques and try and apply them to future bypasses. Um, or perhaps you'll find a completely new way to bypass CloudTrail. And with that, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you again. Talk was super fun. We had a couple questions on Slack. The first uh, for I am admin. Uh, does it represent what you're doing as the user or as the I am admin service itself when it shows up in CloudTrail? Good question. It's the user itself. Uh, this was not a situation where we were we were abusing an external service or having that show up in CloudTrail. And then there are a couple questions you may not have the answer to around. Uh, trying to understand kind of what's going on so going on inside AWS that leads to this. And so one of the questions was, it seems like different services have inconsistent uh, expectations for when they go to CloudTrail and how they use CloudTrail. Do you have any sense of like why that is? What's the internal configuration or internal sort of process that leads to these different outcomes? Uh, good question. I, I don't personally know. Um, I've, I've never worked at AWS. With some friends that I've talked to, I, I, it's my understanding that there's sort of a um, prior, priority, prioritization in terms of like ship features versus add-on certain things, but honestly, I couldn't say. Fair enough. Uh, cool. Other questions? I suspect the answer to this is going to be a little bit of yes and a little bit of no, but by nature of the... Um, can you go back to the CloudTrail slide really quick? The one that you've like had one log in CloudTrail and one log not. I assume by nature of one of those coming from something other than a known event source that we could potentially mitigate at least some of these attacks by sticking, say, an SCP on my org and then whitelisting services with the AWS called VIA condition. Oh, were you, was it this, uh, yeah, this particular? Yeah, exactly that. Um, that's an interesting uh, idea. I've not actually tested it. Um, but that'd be worth worth trying out. Um, as far as I'm aware, th that I, I know it's tiny, um, but that endpoint should still be active as of this morning. So definitely be worth a try to see if that would prevent it. Nice. If I find out, I'll shoot you an email. Sure. Please do. Thank you. So in general, it seems that the stance is that anything that accesses production data without being logged is something that AWS is going to make an effort to close very fast. And like the SNS gamma example, everything that does only allows that permission enumeration but doesn't access production data is not necessarily a priority to close very fast. It's a good question. That is also my understanding. Uh, in talking with AWS, in particular the, the protocol mutation stuff, at the time that I, that I reached out to them, they were very much, you know, that's intended behavior. Um, Ten months later, though, they did fix it. So it's one of those things of, you know, we kind of uh, sometimes maybe have to pressure AWS or, or point out the uses of it. But uh, for now, at least, as far as I'm aware, there's no intention to, to fix that behavior. Uh, Another uh, uh, Slack question. Do you have any indications that AWS watches some of these uh, non-production endpoints for anomalous usage? Have you ever sort of gotten outreach or, or observations as a result of, of your testing? No, not, no, I've never been contacted by AWS for any of the really sketchy stuff I've done. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, any other questions? Um, so you mentioned that you've been looking for uh, like undocumented APIs. Um, are you also looking for like unreleased services when you're doing that scraping? Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned that. Um, those do actually pop up, um, and I've been able to see operations for things that are like still in beta or still out. Um, the the one sort of challenge is I've seen them and I've like tried to use them, but they don't appear to work on the production endpoints. So then you try to find the non-production ones or wherever they are. Um, but yes, you, you can totally see stuff before it's officially released. All right, well, thank you, Nick. That was super fun. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, next up is lunch break. Uh, in the next few minutes, they should be setting up uh,
uh, boxes outside in the hallway, uh, drinks in the sponsor room, uh, plenty of space around the hotel and outside uh, to eat. We'll see you back here at 1 p.m. Thanks so much.
that's not what I want.
Test. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, it's the afternoon session for Ford CloudSec. You made it halfway, congratulations. Um, I'm Houston Hopkins, by the way, one of the organizers. Uh, I'm announcing in this room, so uh, you have to deal with me. <laughs> uh, the next talk you're gonna see is the ins and outs of building an AWS data perimeter by John Burgess. Uh, before we get started, I am uh, going to talk about one of our sponsors, Wiz. Uh, Wiz secures everything organizations build and run in the cloud. Wiz enables hundreds of organizations worldwide, including 20% of the Fortune 500, to rapidly identify and remove critical risk in cloud environments. Its customers include Salesforce, BMW, Slack, Priceline, Rubrik, Salesloft, Plaid, DocuSign, amongst others. So, thank you to Wiz. Um, without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to John. Thanks. Hello, I'm John Burgess. I'm a cloud security software developer at Stripe. Stripe's mission is to increase the GDP of the internet. We do payment processing and a bunch of other things for millions of businesses. Today I'm going to be talking about the ins and outs of building an AWS data perimeter. This topic is way too big for a 20 minute talk, but I will do my best by providing a comprehensive introduction. And now we'll look at our agenda. First, we're going to go through the theory. What exactly is an AWS data perimeter? What does it do, and why do we need it? And then the building blocks. The perimeter is composed of six different controls. I'm going to talk about three today, and leave the rest for you to read about on your own. Next is the implementation. How can you set up these controls without breaking things, or at least in a way that breaks as few things as possible? And then finally, I'll wrap it up and send you on your way with some of the resources I found helpful. Let's start with the theory. The perimeter is a set of guardrails to control access to the boundary of your AWS organization. We'll be updating all sorts of IAM policies so that access through the perimeter is denied by default, and so that granting access requires a high level of approval. 
The goal is to establish a zone of distrust outside of your organization. It's not that you should necessarily trust what's within your organization, but that you should be very skeptical of principles and resources outside of it. The intuition behind the value of the perimeter is that when things go wrong in the cloud, it's very often because some data was passed through this organizational boundary. I mentioned that there are six fundamental AWS perimeter controls. They correspond to six types of cross-organizational access. This diagram shows two of the most basic types of access. Your principles accessing somebody else's resources and somebody else's principles accessing your resources. Now obviously it's necessary to have some trust relationships. You need to be able to trust your vendors and your customers, but these trust relationships should be denied by default, centrally managed, and require a high level of approval to enable. This shows another way that things can go wrong, cr credentials crossing organizational boundaries. Somebody else's credentials making requests from within your network, or even worse, your credentials being used outside of your organization. There's two other types of access, but we're going to skip them for today. This is my mental model for how da dangerous different types of access, uh, different types of requests are. The safest are requests within the same account. In the middle are requests that are cross account but stay in my AWS organization. And the most dangerous are requests that, cross, that are cross account and leave my AWS organization. I'd like to make it so that almost any developer can enable requests within the same account. Fewer can enable cross account requests. And very few, maybe only the security team, have the ability to create cross organization requests. But the problem is that I am policy evaluation has only two buckets of requests. Requests within an account and requests across accounts. Requests within an account succeed if there's an allow in the principal or in the resource for most types of resources. Requests across accounts succeed if there's an allow in the principal and in the resource. But it doesn't matter if the other account is within your AWS organization or not. In either case, the trust relationship is created the same way. We should trust accounts outside of our organization less than accounts within it, but AWS does not make this the default. This is the goal of the AWS data perimeter, to draw a line between cross-account requests within our organization and cross-account requests outside of our organization. This requires us to add a set of controls that will block cross-organization requests by default. Next, we'll go through the building blocks of the AWS data perimeter. I'm going to go through three of the six basic perimeter controls, one service control policy, one VPC endpoint policy, and one resource policy. First, we'll look at preventing credential exfiltration. Your IAM role credentials have left the building, they've been exfiltrated outside of your organization, and they're being used to make requests outside of your network. We have the opportunity to create a control to tie these credentials down to your network in order to block this. But how does this happen? What is the most common ways that IAM role credentials are stolen? We're running a web application with an SSRF vulnerability on an EC2 host that's using IMDSv1. In a case like this, we should patch our application, and we should migrate to IMDSv2 but that's much easier said than done. But the third thing and what I'm going to talk about today is that we can actually block our IAM credentials from being used outside of our network using an AWS data perimeter control. This is the most basic form of the SCP that blocks the roles from being used outside of the network. We're going to deny all actions on all resources if all four conditions are true. The first condition is going to help me target only my EC2 instance roles. The minimal level of granularity for SCPs is the entire account, and it's unlikely that you want all roles in your account to be tied to your network. So we use the principal ARN condition to specify the roles that we want to lock down. If your EC2 roles don't have names that can be matched with a glob pattern like this, you can instead target roles based on their tags. Condition number two, string not equals. This returns true if the request is made, so made outside of our VPC. The source VPC condition key is only available if the request is made through a VPC endpoint. If it's not routed through a VPC endpoint, we'll rely on our next condition, not IP address. This condition returns true if the request was not made from one of our trusted IPs. The source IP condition key is only available if the request was not made through a VPC endpoint. It represents the IP of the last hop out of your environment. And the fourth condition uh, returns true if the action is not made by an AWS service. Adding this condition allows AWS services to still use the targeted roles. Now that we have seen the base version of the SCP, let's look at some of the problems we're going to run into and their solutions. 
The first problem is cross-region VPC endpoint traffic. If you peer your VPCs and let your hosts make cross-region requests through endpoints and other VPCs, you're going to have to allow list all those VPCs. So instead of locking our credentials down to one specific VPC, we're locking them down to a set of VPCs. The second problem is that your hosts may be generating and passing out pre-signed URLs, and these will be locked. When the client executes the action embedded in the URL, it performs the action as the principal that signed the URL. So this request is made using your service principal, but outside of your network, and so it will be blocked by the SCP. You have a choice about what to do here. Uh, the first option leverages the S3 auth type condition key to check if the action is an S3 request that is authenticated via a pre-signed URL. If it is, the condition returns false, and so the action is not blocked. The second option is to cut the offending roles out of the control entirely. If any role, because of pre-signed URLs, or for whatever reason, is unintentionally running afoul of the SCP, we can always allist it, allow list it in this manner. And the third problem is permission-only actions. These are often blocked by the SCP. Permission-only actions are actions that don't directly correspond to an API operation, one that cloud security talks about a lot is pass role. Pass role, fortunately, is not affected by the SCP, but many other permission-only actions are. I've added the actions that we found uh, that break during testing to the appendix for your reference. The one that I put here as an example is used for connecting to an RDS database using IAM authentication. To exclude these actions, instead of targeting all actions, we'll allow list um, these using the not action keyword. Okay, so this was all of the exceptions. And when we combine them with the base policy, we get this uh, beautiful monstrosity of an SCP. In human language, this says, deny almost all actions on all resources if it's a role that we want to lock down, and it's not a role that we want to exclude from the control, and if the request is not made from the expected network, either through a VPC endpoint of one of our trusted VPCs, or via one of our trusted IPs. And finally, if it wasn't AWS using the role on our behalf. And now if we return to the diagram, our credentials are being used outside of the expected network. So the SCP we just built denies access if they're being used to make requests. And even better, when our credentials are used within our network, access is still allowed. We haven't broken all of our services. Okay, so we finished control number one. That was the most complicated one. Next preventing bring your own credential attacks. This is the opposite problem of credential exfiltration. Instead of an attacker pulling your credentials out of your network, they're using their own credentials within your network in order to exfiltrate data. In this picture, we don't own the principal or the resource, so we can't add policies there, and an SCP will not help us. But the request is being routed through a VPC endpoint, and so we can create a VPC endpoint policy to block the action. The default policy has no restrictions at all, VPC endpoint policies are similar to permission boundaries in that they don't ever grant permissions. This policy of allow star 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 just represents the upper bound for, uh, for what requests can perform. The solution here is pretty simple. We add a condition that requires the principal to belong to our organization. If it doesn't, the request is denied. This only affects requests routed through this specific endpoint. You'll have to apply this to every endpoint. And that's just one type of egress to lock down. Now, a couple of things to look out for. The first thing is that it's uncommon, but some vendor integrations require that their external principles work within your network and use your endpoint. If this is the case, then you'll have to make an exception for those principles or for those endpoints. The second thing is that not every type of VPC endpoint supports custom endpoint policies. For example, the CloudTrail endpoint does not support custom policies. For these endpoints, their policies cannot be changed for from full access. And the third thing, and it's kind of a weird one, but specifically for the EC2 endpoint, if you add a custom policy, this may cause some failed API requests to not be logged to CloudTrail. And now we'll look at the third control. Preventing external data access. That is, only identities I trust can access my resources. Here we have a resource that we want to be private. We expect, to be, uh, we expect it to be shared only within the AWS organization. But somebody has added a trust relationship to an external principal. We want to make it as difficult as possible for the resource to be shared outside of your organization. In this case, we create a resource policy in order to achieve this. And it's going to look something like this. On the left is the original S3 bucket policy. 
that trusts the specified account. And on the right, we've modified the policy by adding a new statement that explicitly denies requests from principals outside of our organization. And now the account will be blocked if it doesn't belong to our organization. If it does belong to our organization, then there's no impact on its requests. This example uses an S3 bucket policy, but you can add a similar statement to any resource policy. Um, and then the first thing, it's kind of obvious, but before applying this control, you need to understand which of your buckets are shared externally and avoid adding the statement to them. And the second thing is that sometimes you want to have AWS accessing your resources. In this, case, in this case, you want to make an exception for AWS principles using this condition key. Now we'll talk about the implementation, how to decide what controls to choose and how to deploy them safely. A great first question to ask for any project is, should I actually do this? To answer this, I'll tell you that you should not consider doing this until you've set up your basic SCPs first ones that prevent accounts from leaving the organization and that stop CloudTrail from being disabled. These are listed in Scott Piper's AWS Security Maturity Roadmap. Once you've done those things, which AWS perimeter control should you implement first? It depends on your threat model. It's the one that would address risk in your environment. In terms of effort, I find SCPs easier than VPC endpoints uh, and resource policies. They're managed centrally, while the others, you have to attach them to all applicable resources. This is easier to do if you have all of your infrastructure defined as code and have commonly reused modules. And the next thing is deployment. Before starting to deploy a control, you should backtest it on actions in CloudTrail to see what it would have blocked. Depending on your configuration, CloudTrail may be missing some data. It's common, for example, to not log data events. You should make alarms on access denied errors in your organization. This, this is, it's helpful to know if you've broken something or if somebody is running into your controls. And for resource policies, first stop the bleeding. Make sure new resources are created with your perimeter control statements. And then backfill existing resources. For the SCPs, rollouts can be terrifying because they have the ability to break everything everywhere all at once. So deploy them very slowly and very carefully. It is likely that you will find exceptions specific to your environment that you need to address. But the nice thing is that the IAM policy language is pretty flexible. So you can craft targeted SCPs and roll them out slowly as long as you have the imagination and patience. I'll show two approaches you can use for incremental SCP deployments. The first is tag-based. You give the relevant roles tags to indicate different deployment stages, and then stage by stage, you add them to the condition. And then when you're ready for the SCP to, tar to target all the relevant roles, you just remove the condition. Then the next method is based off the role names. I call these alphabet deployments. This method is useful when you have a bag of roles and you don't really care about the deployment order, and when you're too lazy to create new tags for your roles. Here we're only targeting the EC2 host roles that start with the letter A, and now the ones that start with the letters A through C, and so on and so forth. Once you've covered the entire alphabet and your SCP is fully deployed, you can remove the condition. And now it will match all the EC2 host roles regardless of their prefix. This method is crude and kind of ridiculous, but it works. That's everything that I had for you. We went over what the AWS perimeter is, three of its controls, and how to set those controls up safely. All I have left to say is that AWS data perimeter is good, cross-organizational access is bad, unless it's explicitly approved by the security team. No, but really, Stripe has found that these controls are unreasonably effective for the amount of effort they take to set up. So we thought that we'd share what we learned along the journey of deploying them. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Anyone have questions from the audience? Uh, I think I missed it, but uh, why were you excluding the uh, permission-only actions from the original first policy again? If you don't do that, um, then they will all be blocked. And so if you have roles that are used that um, require those actions, then they need to be allowed listed. Okay, but won't that be the same as any other, like, action? Yeah, it's just that it's very common for permission-only actions to be blocked by this, but other actions are not. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned that Stripe found these to be um, 
really valuable for the amount of effort involved. Uh, can you share anything about how you measured the effectiveness of these and, and sort of differences you saw before and after putting them in place? Yeah, well, so it, it, it depends on, um, we thought of specific scenarios that we were afraid of happening and different ways that we could block that from happening. Um, and then we chose the one that sort of required the least amount of effort in order to uh, block the potential risk. So uh, cross-organizational, perim perimeters for cross-organizational cross access makes sense. Uh, what about multi-tenant accounts where you perimeters where you might want to set up parameters where the threats are different, right? So you might want to separate data that is in, in different islands and control access by setting up parameters. Have you thought about that use case at all? Are you saying, are you talking about like perimeters within a single account? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I... Or, or even in your own account where multiple accounts are, there is like maybe a shared S3 bucket, right, yeah. which has a different threat profile. So there's a group of accounts where you might want to create a perimeter because the threat status is very different compared to the low trust environments where this S3 bucket does not have access at all. Yeah, this is a really great natural extension for these controls. So the, the ones that I've shown are applied to the organization, but you can apply similar controls to a set of an accounts, to an OU. Um, or to a specific account that you want to uh, reduce access to. Hi, uh, thanks for the information. Uh, for the majority of us that do use SCPs, uh, we've all uh, come to the limit of the size that they can be. So have you come up with a, a framework to decide what makes it in and what doesn't? So we've been able to shove everything that we want into our SCPs. Something that we found is helpful is even if you have a single account, you can put it in its own OU, and then you can apply five extra SCPs to it. And then I forget the maximum limit of how many OUs you can have in, in terms of like the depth of the tree, but using something like that, you could probably apply like 25 to 30 SCPs to a single account. So you just have to like mess with your organizational structure in order to enable it. Any other questions? Looks like we're empty on Slack too. So, All right. John will be around if you guys have more questions. Thank you. See you in a few minutes. Good job. All right, we'll be back in seven minutes.
I tried to be in 20, 31 minutes. He's controlling this in the background. Okay. So I thought I had to control it, so I was pushing all the buttons in the last <laughs> time, and he's got it. All right, we're back. A little bit loud. All right, cool. All right, so this talk is how do you set boundaries, i.e. AWS permission boundaries in large cloud environments by Kushagra Sharma, right here. Before we get started, I must announce uh, one of our sponsors. Uh, that is NetSpy. NetSpy is a global leader of offensive security. We offer a complete range of services, including pen testing, attack surface management, and breach attack simulation. Our cutting edge tech and expert team help organizations identify, prioritize, and fix security vulnerabilities, scan the QR code in the, in the uh, sponsor area to be entered to win a JBL Clip 4 speaker. Thank you all. Okay, good. Thank you, Kushagra. Thank you. So the topic for today is how do you set boundaries, that is AWS permission boundaries. And before I, before I start, a quick introduction about myself. Uh, I'm Kushagra Sharma. I'm a senior platform security engineer at Booking.com. So the agenda for today would be the challenges with IAM management, uh, for especially for organizations with a greater cloud footprint. Uh, then we'll talk about permission boundaries in a nutshell. Trust me, I wouldn't read the AWS documentation here. <laughs> then we'll move into how at Booking.com we tackle the permission boundary with a flavored approach that might be very different from the generic uh, use case. And then we'll talk about the implementation that's building dynamic boundaries with Terraform. And I'm sure you might have a question towards the end that does it scale, so I have some homework done to answer that question beforehand. And at, towards the end, we'll also talk a bit about developer experience and how permission boundaries go hand in hand together. So uh, let's get started. Uh, what are the challenges in, with IAM management, especially in large cloud environments? One, myriad compliance requirement. Every other day you get new requirements which are very difficult to implement, trust me. Second is evaluating effective permissions for developers gets really tricky. Like they are really not sure what's allowed, what's not allowed because you have SCPs, permission boundary, different controls, so they really are lost at some point. Then third is difficult to keep up with new AWS services. So every other week you have new services, new feature releases, new IAM namespaces, so how do you keep up with the velocity by which AWS is releasing services, right? And then what happens towards the end is that security teams, they end up doing the operational work for project teams, which is not so nice. And towards all of this, towards the end, you hear that, okay, security is the one creating friction, which we don't want to hear, but trust me, it happens. So what's permission boundary in a net nutshell? So on the left, you see there's a single boundary that's defined by the security team, which is saying, allow I'm asterisk, but deny I'm create user because we really don't want IAM users in our environment. We want IAM roles. Then the developer, he comes up with an IAM policy that says IAM create asterisk. So he's under the impression he might be able to create a role, a user as well. But the effective permission is that it allows IAM create asterisk, but it still denies IAM create user. So whatever you define in the boundary, no matter whatever identity-based policy is being attached to the role, the effective boundaries are always governed by the permission boundary, uh, which is quite handy for security teams. Uh, now you might be wondering, in every sentence I speak, uh, I'm talking about permission boundary. So if I don't remember your name, uh, you know the reason. Okay, so is it possible to build a one-size-fits-all permission boundary, which can tackle account-level exceptions, allowing only vetted service for service deployments, uh, considering not every environment is the same, so how can one boundary suffice the need for security teams? Then you have regulatory requirements to add to it. And towards the end, you also have growing number of AWS accounts. So is it possible or not? But yeah, we'll come to that later during the talk. So at Booking.com, what we came up with is a flavored approach to permission boundary. So what we came up with, there's one dynamic boundary with global same defaults defined by the security teams. Then we are allowing exceptions to the boundary on a per account exception level exception basis, and then we are also uh, enabling developers to contribute to this boundary. Now, of course, given they have the certain approvals and you need the approvals to deploy it as well. 
And for environments falling under a specific regulatory scope, we have a new flavor to the boundary. So think about you have a PCI environment where the requirements are really very diff different from your generic production environment. So, so far it sounds super easy, right? You define the maximum permission that any i minded entity in your environment can get. You enforce that centrally using SCP perhaps. You centrally manage and deploy this boundary to all, all your production accounts or all your AWS accounts. And then you think you have demystified the IAM universe. At least that's what we thought. So let's find out. Now it's the build time. So what we started with is to define a global boilerplate in the boundary itself. And as like very basic example, one of them was to define a global denial list for actions, like actions that are a no-go in your environments. So for example, you don't want certain networking actions like creating internet gateways, someone attaching them to your EC2s or whatnot. You don't want them to create IAM users. So based on your environment and your use cases, you define a certain global list of no-go actions. That's one. Second is region restrictions. So often with regulatory requirements, you have, okay, you need to only deploy in EU, for example, or you only need to deploy outside EU. So how do you tackle that? So we added another condition just to allow certain region restrictions. And then towards the end, we added a service allow list, which is basically telling only the services that are vetted by the security teams are allowed as part of the boundary because you cannot allow any services as soon as they are released. So this was the very basic boilerplate, but it doesn't cater to all the needs. So how would you handle account level exceptions now? Because you have the global boilerplate, but how do you handle it on a per account basis or a per OU basis, for example? So what we did is, using Terraform, uh, it came in very handy. We, de we defined a hash map, and what you see on the screen is a very generic example. So we said, okay, if you want additional regions, we have it in the hash map. If you want additional IAM actions, we have it there. If you want additional networking actions, we have it there. Uh, we were also enforcing certain base images or golden images, uh, as you say it. But for example, you need to deploy a vendor tooling. You need an AMI from the marketplace. So we have a placeholder saying allowed AMI owner IDs, where you can specify from which specific account you can deploy an AMI. And this all happens on a per account level. So all the ticks you see, onboard additional service, tick, new region deployment stick, add new trusted source for another control stick. So now you might wonder, how does that end up on the specific AWS account, right? So that's the next part, which is the build time. How did the boundary shape up eventually? So here what you see is there's an input boundary list which says for account number 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever, it's a networking AWS account and here we are allowing RAM asterisk and shield, so two AWS services that were not defined, uh, that were not allowed in general boilerplate. Then we are allowing them to use additional regions because it's the networking team's account. Then we are allowing them to deploy from marketplace with some specific vendor accounts that, is, that are safe listed in the list there. Then below you see there's another account number, which is a project XYZ account, where we are saying, let them use AWS data sync service. So now what happens is, eventually, for a specific networking account, they're getting these additional permission just for their permission boundary in their account. For the other project account, they're getting just those permissions for their account. And based on your deployment logic, you can also target this to a specific OU. So it's actually, if you think about it, every account can have a different permission boundary with the global same defaults that we defined earlier. Win-win, right? And how do we achieve it? So this, this is an example using Terraform. So Terraform has a very nice, beautiful thing called dynamic statements. So what we were doing is, based on that input list, if there's an input for a specific account, you materialize that dynamic statement into the boundary. So the first one is basically taking care of additional allowed, allowed regions. The second one is basically enforcing AMIs. If you don't have the input list, the basic global boilerplate kicks in. So this way, you are really able to tackle account level exceptions, account level deployments, and you can also cater this to specific region deployments. Then coming to the last step, uh, how do you enforce this? So what's nice is AWS has a specific condition key which is I am permission boundary. So you can really enforce your boundary using an SCP where you say, hey, don't allow anyone to create a role or an IAM user unless he has this boundary attached. So what happens is you deploy this boundary as part of the security baseline in every account, you enforce using the SCP, then all the IAM entities in your environment has this permission boundary. 
else they cannot proceed. So this way you also get full 100% coverage into your permission boundary roads. Now, the question was, was it possible to create a one-size-fits-all permission boundary? So it seems like we have answered the question. We tackled AWS account-level exceptions. We are only allowing AWS vetted service deployments based on the global allow list. We have a flavored approach in case you want to create a new flavor of the boundary for very specific AWS environments. And also regulatory requirements can be adhered to. Uh, at the same time, you're also reducing the friction because developers, they can self-contribute to the permission boundary using the self-deployment uh, model. You're reducing the operational overhead for IAM or security teams to actually ensure that the permissions are right following the least privileged model. And with IC baseline deployment, it gets really easy. So in the example that I presented, it's using Terraform, but it could be any other deployment workflow. But with infrastructure as code, it really gets easy to get this into action. Now, the million dollar question, does it scale? So just to give you an idea, it's working so far for almost more than 1,700 AWS accounts in one of our environments, which is a huge number, if you might ask. We have it enforced, all IAM entities have the permission boundary based on the use case. You have regulatory requirements, you have a different flavor boundary that's enforced. So all roles have the permission boundary. So we really have a guardrail enforced end to end. Then, we again thought we have demystified the IAM universe, but then we saw something in our CI job logs which said, we cannot update the permission boundary because it's exceeding the policy size of 6,144 characters. And then we thought, okay, maybe we can attach more than one boundary to an IAM role, just like IAM entity, IAM policies, SAPs, but that doesn't work. So as per AWS documentation, you can only have one boundary attached to an IAM entity, and it cannot exceed the size of 6,144 characters. But uh, as others talk, spoke about as well, there are ways to optimize the size of the boundary. So you might do some compression, remove some certain I'm namespaces, put asterisks to make it a bit more less or less in size. But at the same time, you might ask, we also have SAPs, so why are we putting all the controls in the permission boundary? The answer being you need to find a balance between SAPs and permission boundary. So all the actions that are very sane, where you don't anticipate any exceptions, they should go to your SAP, enforce them via SAPs. Be it like uh, any networking actions or any IAM related actions, maybe protecting your tooling role, baseline roles, they should go into the SAP because there wouldn't be any account level exceptions or OU level exceptions, for instance. But for controls where you need control or more gran granular control, then you put them into the permission boundary itself. So that's where you need to maintain a balance. And I hope AWS is listening to some of our pain points here. So yeah. So that's the answer for does it scale. Now this is the very, towards last, uh, probably the slide of this presentation, it's the developer experience. So now as I mentioned, it's a self-service model, developers are deploying their IAM roles, they have the permission boundary enforced. So how does this go with permission boundaries? So the first thing is we have the AWS native policy simulator support. So in case they are running a simulation, they can clearly see that this action is denied by the permission boundary. So it's not a great area, gray area that people don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, that, that's a really good thing. The second thing is that you also see implicit and explicit denial messages for troubleshooting. So if you have an access denied, you really see the reason why it's not happening. So what we at Booking.com, we really wanted to make the developer experience seamless. And with the permission boundary approach, it's going so, so far so well. At the same time, using a central security team are able to enforce controls at the organization level. And trust me, when it comes to cloud audits, if you say your controls are in SCPs, permission boundary, it gets easier. But if you point to external, external tooling, some internal tooling that you built, that increases the audit scope. So for us, it was really important to also get some more tough audits done. And on that note, I would say thank you, and I'm open to questions. Any questions in the room? All right, I, I think I have some. <laughs> oh, questions in the Slack. You guys can always Slack the questions too if you don't want to use the microphone like a fool, All right, like me. Um, let's see. Uh, how often are the engineers asking for changes 
uh, to the permissions boundaries? Like how frequent is the changing that's going on to the actual boundaries themselves that you find? Uh, that, that's a good question. So our deployment model, we release the baseline and the permission boundary is part of the baseline. And this is happening every week. And as I mentioned during my talk, we have a self-service model. So developers, if they have the necessary approval from the risk teams, they can go create a PR, update the permission boundary, trigger a deployment, and then it's up to the security teams to approve that change. So it's an ongoing effort, and every release we have a major, every week we have a major release to the boundary itself. Any questions? I have more. <laughs> All right. Um, I've heard that there can be impacts to the way the AWS console operates when you have permission boundaries in place. Have you guys ran into any of that, where certain functionality starts breaking that you just normal console usage? Uh, right, we, we had some edge cases with permission boundary not going that well if you create a custom service link role, for example, and in the troubleshooting, it wasn't really clear uh, where the uh, issue is. But yeah, that's something we face from time to time, but it's not a common use case. And in terms of the interactive services, uh, what we have is we have a, another flavor of the permission boundary, which enables developers to interact with services that require interactive access, which could be uh, Athena, for example. Because at Booking.com, we have infrastructure as code enforced everywhere, but there might be a reason to access the console to do certain actions. All right, I'm out of questions. <laughs> Anyone? All right, we can, uh, thank you, Kashaga. Thank you so much. You know where to find them. We'll be back at 2 o'clock. Um, you can also read the docs. It doesn't describe as much of the why, but it does describe the how. There's also, uh, you know, you're, you take your favorite AWS SDK and you start reading the code, and you'll understand it pretty quick. So if you're a non-AWS user, I don't, I don't know how many non-AWS users we have in the room, but if you're like, okay, is this relevant to me at all, or is Josh just, am I gonna waste 40 minutes listening to Josh talk about this? The answer is that many cloud object stores use the same SIG v4 authentication because they're emulating AWS's approach. And so if you're using any of these, uh, you can probably apply some of the same ideas in this talk to, the, to whatever your cloud is. So now we can get back to the problem at hand. We, you recall we were talking about that photo sharing app and it has this complex pattern of data authorization that we need to, you know, we need to cope with somehow. So back with the photo sharing service, I have bolded a couple, a couple areas. Uh, one of them is that there are millions of users. And the idea here is because there's so many users, I'm not gonna be able to build an IAM role for any one of them. I'm not, I, I'm, I have to deal with them in some way that is independent of the IAM system. Well, and we'll get into that a little bit more in the, in the next, next couple slides. Uh, next couple of issues is um, these, these one-to-many relationships. So figuring out whether a given user should have access to a given photo because they're being shared between users is non-trivial. It's not like I can say, oh, well, you know, these photos are owned by Josh, and I'll just show Josh only his own photos, because the idea is that there should be many other photos available to me as a user of this service. So notice that I didn't say a couple things. I didn't say it was complex because there is a lot of data. We could have billions, trillions of photos. That's not a problem. If they're all being, they're all, they all have the same access policy associated with them, I can, I can deal with that just fine. Um, and like, if, I, if I'm, for instance, just trying to show, show photos back to the person who originally uploaded them, that's a one-to-one -one authorization relationship. So I don't really have a problem there either. But we start to think about complex pattern data when there's, too many, too many users to represent an IAM, too many relationships to represent an IAM, and I, I, IAM can't possibly know about them. So uh, the AWS IAM service lives in US East One, and it's uh, designed as a control plane service. It's not designed for any frequent updates. It's not designed to provide anything fast. So the problem is when we, when, when we have policies change fast, like let's say I have an uh, album that is shared uh, that, that, uh, that contains a couple thousand photos and somebody adds or removes a uh, shared user with that album. Uh, that might be a couple thousand writes against a database. IAM is not gonna be capable of accepting a couple thousand writes for any one user-generated user transaction from my app. Like, I, I just wouldn't wanna do it that way. 
now we can see, you know, I, I promised we would discuss data lakes. Now we can see some of the similarities with data lakes. In both cases, we've got uh, jobs th flowing through the system. Um, and in, bo in, in both cases, we have some mo mode of authentication that is not IAM. So in, in a photo sharing app, it's going to be like my user's HTTP cookie because they're logged in. In my data lake, it's going to be maybe an internally assigned JOT or an internally assigned X509 certificate that they present when they're, when they're asking for data uh, from my data lake. Um, we can also see that they're, they're operating arbitrary code in either place. Um, in my data lake, that's probably going to be like some data lake framework that we partially control because people might want to install plugins into their data lake framework or, or do all sorts of things that provide them flexibility in order to manage and massage their data in the most appropriate means. Um, and in, you know, in the photo sharing app, it's going to be us end users with, with their own browsers that we, we have no control over, over what code they're going to run or what API requests they're gonna, going to issue. So similarities, uh, we, uh, the other big similarity I'd like to, to really point out is that we can't reshape the data. I can't go dictate what the storage layer is going to look like, probably in either situation. And I also can't uh, qu quickly enough model, model any of this stuff using AWS IAM. Uh, so that, that I think, uh, the, that combination of too many things operating too fast defines the complex pattern data problem. So this comes to, okay, how do we secure the data lake? And we've got the common solutions that I'd like to go through as a way of motivating why we can't, why, why we can't use each one of them. And to give you off ramps where you can say, okay, actually that one is gonna work for me. Why don't I take that, that approach rather than going for the more complex approach? And this is where the talk by Becky Weiss uh, comes in really handy, why I, I, I really strongly recommend going and watching it, because she covers all but one of the, the approaches that I wanted to take. And actually, the, the last approach that I wanted to take is permissions boundaries. It was discussed in this room just a moment ago. Uh, so you know, between all, all of these, you, you'll, you'll have plenty of other sources to refer to. And in her talk, she, she defines the, the lowest complexity approach being, being IAM techniques using S3 prefixes, and the highest, highest complexity being this session broker pattern. Um, so, so we'll also ascend in complexity. Uh, working towards uh, the, the, the most complex solution and describing why each one might be useful or unuseful for any given application. For plain IAM, uh, the problem is, I, I, as I've alluded to a couple times already, it's just too slow moving. If, if I wanted to get one mutation per second into IAM, that would be 86,400 per day. The IAM service is going to rate limit me before I get anywhere close to that. The IAM service is not built for this. It is built for, okay, I'm gonna change things once a month, not once a day. Not even, one, like, like it's, you're, you're gonna have a bad time if you're, if you're trying to get changes into IAM that quickly. And they're, they're, actually, they're actually intending for you to have a bad time. They want the IAM service to be uh, really available for you only, only when things about your application's inter, uh, interaction with the world change, not your user's interaction with the world. Um, so, the, the next thing I, like, I'd, I'd like to mention is like, there's also this, the, these limits on how much policy you can have. So in Becky's talk, she says you should fit about 30 prefixes in, S, in an S3 bucket policy before you start saying, okay, I have a problem, I need to start looking at something else. Um, you also have uh, the availability of IAM policy on your roles. Um, those actually can go up pre about pretty large, but again, they, they, don't, they don't change very quickly. The next approach is permissions boundaries. I view these as a really good way to provide delegation between teams. So if I've got, say, an Elasticsearch cluster, and I, uh, I've got an Elasticsearch team that wants to spin up and spin down Elasticsearch clusters willy-nilly, like let's say they've got a test pipeline for it, they've, they've got, they just want, they, they want a very high degree of flexibility in spinning these up, I can draw a permissions boundary over the broadest set of permissions that any Elasticsearch cluster may have and say, okay, all of these are delegated down to that other team in my ecosystem. They can make the decision about how to, how to divide things up between each, each Elasticsearch cluster. And what this allows is, especially for EC2 instance profiles, when, where you just have to use the role with no principal tagging, uh, you, you have the ability to uh, build a role that suits each 
uh, type of EC2 role or EC2 um, service. The next approach uh, is another really good way to, to provide delegation. Uh, again, one team can uh, build, an, uh, build an S3 bucket with a rather granular, or sorry, a rather coarse policy. And, you, and then another team takes that coarse policy and applies a more granular policy by putting an S3 access point in front of it. So you have that, that delegation ability, plus you have the ability to uh, sh uh, multiply out the quantity of bucket policy you can apply. And that's just a numbers game because you can have 10,000 access points per account region. And if you, if you were, for instance, to take that to the extreme, you could, you could have you know, six kilobytes, I yeah, I believe it's six kilobytes of access point policy uh, times 10,000 associated with any one, one S3 bucket. And the problem, the problem here is, is complexity. And then, and then the last thing that Becky also mentions in her talk is, again, it's not dynamic. It's not designed to provide a high, high rate of change, which is, again, what we're trying to provide here. Let's build a proxy is by far the most powerful approach. And it's also the one that I think is the most dangerous and, I, and the one I, I definitely recommend not using. Uh, the reason it's powerful is because you can do anything with a proxy. You can make S3 look like any other service in, in the world. And that's great, but the problem is that you, you can't build it as scalably as S3 is gonna build it. S3 is, has a front door that is ready to send you terabits per second of data just in response to you asking it to. Um, and meanwhile, our proxy is probably not gonna be capable of doing that. If our proxy was scaled to be sending the, the, same, the same capacity that S3 can send, just in response to like a couple data lake jobs spinning up, then we would be burning a hole into our wallet trying to keep up with S3. Um, and then God forbid we, we like not use that capacity all the time, then we're, then we're just sitting there with idle capacity waiting for jobs that aren't coming. So the, the ultimate problem here is like, let's say, say I as a security team say I wanna build a proxy, I'm putting myself in the critical path of my data lake working at all. And when I'm in that critical path, I need to, to be just as good as the service I'm emulating, which is S3. There's no way I'm gonna achieve that. Amazon's got, got like, Amazon has more money than I do. I can't, I can't compete with them on this, on this axis, so I shouldn't try. And that's why we shouldn't build a proxy. The last approach, uh, again mentioned in Becky's talk, is STS assume role with a, with a broker. And what this does is you, you have a broker that has the permission to say read the, the broadest uh, part, the bit of my data. So a very, a very broad access to, to my bucket. And it also has some smarts to say which parts of the bucket should be accessible to each one of my workloads. Um, when it receives a request, Somebody comes in and says, I'd like to actually access this prefix in the bucket, or I'd like to access that prefix in the bucket. It goes, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I will, I will use STS assume role to take my own credentials and assume a role uh, with an with a inline policy that restricts those credentials. So the way a assume role works in this, in this context is the, the role might have a very broad set of permissions, and then when you pass the inline policy, you are explicitly intersecting the permissions in the role with the ones passed in this policy. So, so your broker can, make an, can synthesize a policy on the fly that will apply to the credentials that it, it generates. Once it calls STS assume role, it's going to pass those, those credentials that it got from assume role back to the original caller, and the original caller is then gonna be able to access that prefix or prefixes in S3 that they requested. This is good because STS is a data plane service. Unlike IAM, so uh, unlike IAM, which is a control plane service, STS was meant as a data plane service. So it's designed to handle hundreds or thousands of requests per second. But there's still some major drawbacks that lead me to not want to use it in the general case. So you know, in certain cases, yes, I would love to use it. But in the general case, probably not. Those are, number one, STS limits you to 2048 characters. The reason why it does it has that limit, and that, this is a strict limit. I don't think it's one of those ones that you can just go to your account team and say, hey, could we raise this quota? The reason why is because when you pass it a policy, that gets encoded into the AWS session token that gets passed back to, your, to uh, you as your credential, and that credential must be passed every single time you make any request to AWS. So it'll be a lot of bytes over the, over the wire if you're trying to, to you know, 
put a very complex access policy into the inline policy. And that's why, that's why STS you know, went with a rather sensible limit of 2048. Um, it's really just meant to, to allow you to access one, two, three things, not n objects. If you're trying to go for an, an arbitrary or unbounded number of objects that might, might, for instance, happen if I'm joining a lot of tables together in a data lake, uh, this, isn't go this isn't gonna suit, and you're gonna actually have to just call STS many times. Again, exhausting that rate limit. So when, with, the, with the account wide rate limit, STS imp is going to impose some number that's probably not known to you and probably not easily monitored by you of uh, requests that you can send to STS before it'll just cut you off. You will be, you'll be out, out, you know, out cold um, with a data lake that doesn't work if you end up exhausting this, this rate limit. So that sounds pretty scary and it's probably not the, the route that I would want to take. This brings us to to the, the, the last solution, the, the one that, that provides you the most flexibility, but probably at the greatest level of complexity. So what we realize here is that, you know, we took, we took a look earlier, and we realized that we, we get to sign requests on an individualized basis. Like every request that gets, gets sent off by my AWS SDK is signed, and my SDK know has, how, knows how to do this signing. What if I taught a service on my network to do this signing? And here I have an example of that. So I've got, uh, I've got this curl uh, request that hopefully is visible to people probably about halfway through the room and, and then the, the people in back will have to use the QR code. Um, so I've got this curl request and we can see that I am logging in, I'm authenticating against my service with, with a really secure basic auth uh, username Josh, password is password. I'm requesting access to a given URL in S3 and I'm sending this off to localhost socket. Uh, what this does is it gives my signer an opportunity to look at this request and say, yeah, that looks good to me, or no, that doesn't look good to me. And my signer responded, so it's, it, it you know, responded with a non-trivial, responded with a 200 okay, and so it, it must have looked good for my signer. Um, but my signer did modify the request as it, as it went. So in addition to adding the date and authorization headers that are necessary for any request to get, to get authenticated to AWS, um, my signer also decided to uh, change the bucket being accessed, so it changed from permanent to permanent with a bunch of letters and numbers afterward. Um, it, cha it changed the region because it knew where that bucket lived better than my app did. Uh, and it also changed the key. Uh, so, so this signer is added, providing some value added in, in a specific way that we'll get to in a moment. But the, the, the key is no different. And then finally, it, it imposed certain things that are, that are just best practices, like it, it added the XAMZ expected bucket owner uh, header, which I see very rarely done by most applications, but is a good way to ensure that you're talking to the bucket you expect to talk to. Recall that, that buckets are a global namespace, so by default you can just be talking to anyone's bucket unless you, you pass that header. So, like I mentioned in the previous slide, the signer uh, modified the, the key being, being requested in S3. And here we can see uh, an example of how that works with a, a, real, a real user interaction. So what I've done here is I've shimmed the AWS, uh, AWS CLI, and I've given the AWS CLI the, the ability to expose a bucket, uh, one bucket as if, it, as if it belongs uh, in total to each user that calls it. So I'm using the user environment variable here. First I export user equals Josh, and then uh, write, write the, the, just the, my, the uh, word Josh to a file called my name, upload that to S3. And then I do the same thing with a user called Alice. She uploads her own, her own name to S3. And, the, and then when I skip the signer, so I, you know, I, I encoded an environment variable such that there's a way to skip the signer, uh, we can see that the, what the bucket actually contains is a separate key, one for Alice and one for Josh. And uh, as a result, whenever, whenever, you, whenever Alice calls the, the bucket, she sees her own, her own view of it. And whenever Josh calls the bucket, he sees his own view of it. I provisioned one bucket that can be used for any number of users, so long as they don't have slashes in their usernames, because I wouldn't want those keys to overlap. Um, and then the net effect is, is that I, I can uh, pro you know, provide this as a service to let's say data lake jobs where every single one of them might want to call S3 and store temp temporary state, um, and, but not, none of them should be able to see each other. In case you're wondering how the AWS CLI plugin works, 
it's pretty simple. It fits on 36 lines, although the people in the back will have pro uh, an issue seeing the very bottom. Um, but at the very bottom, what's going on is that we, we, are, we are just uh, creating a hook that initializes with AWS CLI. Um, it, it, does, it skips the operation if we were told to skip signing. That we saw that on the previous slide. Um, but otherwise, it, it hooks this, this operation that already exists as, an, as a hookable uh, event hook in, the Bodo, in Bodocore, where when Bodocore goes to choose how to sign a request, it has the option on, on a per-service basis to override that signing operation. Um, so here, I've, uh, so we're overriding that signing operation, and then here's the implementation of that override. Um, all of this does is take the contents of my request, the contents of my proposed request, and ship it off via, the, via an HTTP call to, to localhost. And you can see I'm logging in with this hyper-secure uh, basic auth method um, with, a, with a static password. But in real life, we would probably use like a JOT or an X509 certificate. And those credentials passed to the signer will become an essential part of my authorization decision. So the next question is like, okay, can I change responses? Like we, we, we demonstrated uploading data, we, we, we demonstrated downloading data, but like if I'm going to do a list call, then, then the list call is still gonna reveal the fact that the data in this bucket is being prefixed by a user's username. It's not going to show what we want it to show, which is that, that, that it looks like the bucket belongs solely to a user. And the, sh the short answer is that without a proxy, we can't change a response. Recall we're really worried about proxies because they impose that performance bottleneck that we, that, uh, where we'd have to try to keep up with S3. But for lists, lists are not very performant. Like, like they're, not, they're not designed to send back billions of bytes in response to a 100-byte re request. So maybe we don't have to worry so much about proxy. And so that's what I've done here. Uh, here we can see that I do have a working implementation of AWS S3 LS. Josh sees you know, only his key, Alice sees only her key. They have different metadata because Alice's, Alice's name is one byte longer than Josh's. Um, you know, uh, in this case, Alice sees six bytes because Alice is five letters plus a line feed. And the way this is achieved is, is kind of stylized here on the right. Um, we can see that there's this, this list objects v2 call that gets sent off to the signer. And the signer goes, okay, yeah, that's a great idea. I, I'm in favor. So what I'll do is sign you a request that's actually gonna come back to 127.0.0.1. Um, recall that's where the signer is living. Uh, so the signer says, hey, yeah, just send it to me. Um, and the client, the client is you know, none the wiser. It, it goes, sounds great, and sends the request off to the signer. The signer can respond with whatever it likes. It, it could, you know, it could you know, respond in any language it likes. Uh, it doesn't have to be XML. Um, the client won't understand it if it's not XML, but the signer basically has complete control over the bytes returned. Um, and so the, the net effect is that my signer was able to intercept the request and change it. And so it became a partial signer, par partial proxy. So coming back to this previous slide, we have a big, you know, but we can do these things. Uh, we can proxy to ourselves. We saw that on the previous slide. We can proxy to an S3 object lambda. So S3 object lambda is designed as a way of, of rewriting the object contents itself. Let's say I have a, a need for some data redaction. Um, but they're costly. So like if I'm trying to do you know, you know, thousands or millions of requests against an S3 object lambda, I'm going to pay for all of that. Well, an option with a signer is that, that the signer can selectively decide what, what uh, data needs to be redacted, send that to the object lambda, and send all the rest directly to S3. Um, and finally, we can send it like any other, any other HTTPS service. Uh, so that means that if I, have, if I wanna accelerate certain operations, like the signer might have, might have a local cache of certain very popular configuration that otherwise lives in S3, uh, the, signer could, the signer can be like, oh yeah, let's, let's just send that to the local cache rather than, than sending it off to S3. So it turns out we have a lot of options for, for getting in the way of both the request and the response. Uh, here's the slide where, where I say, yeah, we've got all these means to, inter to interact with your, your data lake, and they all follow this one basic template. So the first thing you need to do is get your signer into your app shimmed in some way. So you know, for many Java-based frameworks, that's gonna mean putting something on your class path in order to, uh, to provide this new, new behavior and to 
uh, get requests that are normally going to go through the normal uh, signing flow within your AWS SDK for Java to instead hit the signing flow that you're defining in this new jar that you're dropping on the class path. So that's going to that's be thing number one. It's gonna, uh, thing number two is in the signer, you always have to have a means for authenticating the caller. If, we're, if the goal is to provide fine-grained authorization, we need a way to, to uh, understand who the caller is. Uh, so in my photo sharing example, it might be the cookie that the user logged in with, or the cookie that the user is known as. In uh, the data lake example, it's going to be like an X5, uh, X509 certificate that says, oh yeah, this is Josh's IPython notebook. Once we have that, we have to uh, take a look at whatever request is being, being, request, uh, being made and say, oh yeah, this, this is a request for, for this column within this table within the data lake. And we know that the attributes of this column are that it is, you know, it is, it is user's PII, but it's not material non-public information. And it looks like Josh's IPython notebook should be able to access that specific column within this specific table. With that knowledge, we can then you know, go, go on to step four and say, all right, yep, that's a good idea. Let's sign it. Or no, let's not. Let's, let's deny that authorization. Finally, uh, we, do, we do, a, do the signing operation. Again, that's the cryptographic hashing that we were discussing earlier. Once you've made all those, all those decisions, that cryptographic, cryptographic hashing is really simple. So the next question is like, OK, why are we talking about this solely in the context of S3? And the answer I have for that one is S3 is the only one where you really, really need to do this. For other ones, you might prefer just to proxy. Recall that I said earlier, like S3 stands ready to send you terabits of data at the, at the drop of a hat. That's usually not true of other AWS services. When I call EC2 and call run instances, it's going to send me a couple hundred bytes back. I don't need to worry about trying to, trying to keep up with, with EC2 because you know, my proxy is just going to be more performant than whatever EC2 is going to do. So, you know, usually in, 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 all, in all of the most exceptional cases, um, a proxy is a better idea for the other AWS services. Some of the exceptional cases that I've seen is like, you know, HashiCorp Vault authenticates using a signed, a signed request to STS get caller identity. So in that way, uh, the, the workload uh, signs that request for STS call, get caller identity, sends it off to Vault. Vault, uh, uh, and Vault goes, oh, okay, I'll issue that request. Um, and th whatever I get back must be uh, equal, or must, be, must identify their credentials that were used to call me in the first place. Um, so that, that way Vault knows that you, you are authenticated with, with, with a set of AWS credentials without you needing to pass those credentials directly to Vault. The next question is, okay, well, we've demonstrated single part requests, but like, if you, if you know anything about S3, you know you might want to do multi-part requests. You might want to parallelize uh, accessing your data um, rather than just uh, calling a single, a single request to access a whole key. And the answer to that is yes, and in fact it gets even better than yes because it turns one round trip to the signer into 20 potential, you know, actually an arbitrary number of potential multi-part requests. Because what you'll do is the, the, the signer will see the, the first request come in requesting part of the object, maybe the first 100 megabytes, and it says, okay, I'm gonna sign the first 20, 40, 50 requests for 100 megabytes a piece and send it back to the client just in case the client wants it in the future. The client, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if your shim understands how to do this, your, your, your shim will say, that's a great idea, I will cache these, and then when the, when the next request comes in for, a, for a, the next part of this object, Let's hope, you know, I'm, I'm asking for data 100 megabytes into this object. It's already in the cache. It's already ready to go. I don't even, even need to do another round trip to the signer in order to access that part of, of my data. Uh, the next question is, okay, well, how, how hard is this going to be to operate? Can I, like, run it as a Lambda? The answer is certainly yes. Like, uh, the, signer, the signer can operate over any protocol you like. It could operate over, you know, Carrier Pigeon, if you so desire. Um, and a Lambda is, is a good choice for, for certain applications. But I think some people confuse that with like, okay, can I treat it like a managed service and, I, and like, you know, not really monitor it, not really scale it appropriately? The answer to that is no. Like you have to treat it uh, similarly to the uptime requirements of, of a proxy in your network because if the signer goes down or the signer gets overloaded or the, if the signer has a bad deploy, then whatever you're accessing behind the signer is also gonna go down. So you can't really treat it just like a managed service. And that, that leads to the next question of like, okay, do I have to worry about latency? 
The answer there is maybe, but not, might, not quite as much as you think. So if we break net latency down into three components, there's network latency. And in the example I gave earlier, I was talking over localhost. So you know, I don't have to worry about network latency. But I also have options like uh, you know, talking, making sure that my signer is in my local AZ. Um, and and that, that's you know, designed to cut down on network latency. And when we think about S3, S3 is a service that's designed to send you back data over the course of maybe a second. So like S3 can be expected to send you back a, about 100 megabytes in a second. So I have some wiggle room. You know, I can add a millisecond here or there and, and, and probably not get, get in trouble. Uh, the, next, the next step in any, in any uh, journey is going to be making that authorization decision. Should I have access to this thing? Your, your big solution there is caching. Uh, when you cache, you have the ability to, to say, OK, well, I, I know that, th that Josh's data lake job came to me before. Let me fetch all of the information about Josh's data lake job so that any future request that comes from the same job, I will already have cached. I'll already be able to make that decision in zero outbound network calls. And finally, uh, the signing operation itself. Some people think, oh, OK, well, I, you know, I'm going I'm to have to do some cryptographic signatures. That's going to take some time. But it turns out, because this is symmetric cryptography using a hash, it's pretty straightforward. Like, like the, this, we can do billions of these per second. It's almost a non-entity. And I just put it on the slide to emphasize that it's, it's, not an it's not something we need to think about. Really think about the network, the network path and that authorization time. And, and if, you're, like, if you've got your network path down, I really just care about authorization time. So wrapping up, let's say I've got an S3 bucket that's in the wrong account. Like I'm, I'm, I'm on the tail end of an, an, S, an account migration. I've split every other resource. I've got my compute now running in this new account. But I've got this, this S3 bucket with, uh, with this use case that's still running in, the, in what, what I, I'm calling the wrong account. How do I get it into the right account? And the answer is that we can use a signer to do exactly that. We can shim uh, reads and writes to this bucket with a signer where the signer, the signer automatically rewrites every access to the old bucket to some new bucket. So uh, for writes, that's, that's just unconditional. Just write to the new bucket. For reads, it's see if the data is migrated yet. If the data has migrated, then send the read to the new bucket. If the data hasn't migrated, send it to the old bucket. And then you know, the, the, the data gets copied in the background. The thing that I really, really like about this is that it doesn't require the interaction of an application team past step one. They don't have to go write a migration batch. They don't have to write a migration verification batch. They don't have to do any of this stuff. We can leave this to experts like a data storage team or a security team, or both in concert. And, and then they can build a migration framework that could be used for 1, 10, 100 services. Um, in, in following the same algorithm for each one. Last slide. This is my you know, data geekery coming in. And we can see that there are a bunch of features that S3 doesn't have. Like if you've ever said, I really wish I could rename something in S3, or I really, really wish I could move an entire prefix from you know, point A to point B in S3 you know, in one go, it's impossible. Like that's not something provided by the S3 API. But with a signer, you can emulate all this stuff. You want to, if you want to get fancy, you can, you can build a, an entire abstraction layer in front of your S3 bucket. And I find that really fun. So with that, thank you so much. Who has questions? Anyone have questions? My front-loaded questions were all answered, I think, so. Oh, no. <laughs> We can talk about more of the scream, more of that data perimeter issue. I, I thought about just coming up here and going, what? <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? Uh, so um, let's see what we got. I don't think there was any on Slack either. So if anyone wants to bail us out. All right. Yes. Um, in terms of trying to break up uh, S three prefixes between users, like mm -hmm. I imagine that would get very heavy if you suddenly needed every tenant or unit user to upload with a different KMS key, or is there an elegant solution for that that I haven't thought of? Um, I, I think so. KMS keys can be influenced by the request headers, which is very nice because uh, you, your signer can say, "Okay, Josh's KMS key is this," and and 
throws that header into every request, every response that it gives to Josh. So I think this is actually one of those cases where signers will shine because you have that ability to, to influence every single request header. And I, I guess I didn't mention this, but when, you, when the, the signer puts in a header, the client of that signer, the client that receives the, the signed request on the other end, must send that header. It's not like the client gets an option of sending that header. You are now forced to send that header if you want your request to succeed. To like scope in a little bit further, yeah. my brain was getting stuck on like, where would the signer go to quickly look up a KMS key mm. with hundreds or thousands or millions of users? Yeah, so, so that's, uh, with that, we, we get back to kind of this slide where we talk about, about caching. The answer is, the signer, if the signer wants to be mm. quick, it's gonna have to have a good cache of, of everything it's planning to, to, to use in order to authorize any given request. And in, in the case of your case, it would be like decorating the request after it's chosen to authorize it. Nice, makes a lot of sense, thank you. Anyone else? Awesome. Josh is around, so. Thank you, yeah, I'm around. Thanks so much. We'll be back at 3.20. Uh, it is a break right now, hallway con time. So thank you, John.
All right, welcome back, everybody. It's 3.20, we're gonna get started. Uh, once again, just announcing, if you do plan on, uh, we would love for you all to do the uh, IR game day tomorrow. Uh, however, we do ask that if you're going to sign up, we'd prefer to go do a thumbs up on Rich Mogul's post in the Ford CloudSec channel of the Slack. Uh, that way you can get an accurate idea of how many uh, machines to provision and, and uh, targets, et cetera. So, um, I would like to thank our sponsor, Trust on Cloud. Trust on Cloud provides the best in-depth threat models available for cloud services. By using a risk-based library of easy to understand and contextual controls, our customers have been able to adopt cloud services 70% faster and with greater confidence. Our subscription services help move you from point-in-time risk assessments of your cloud services to a continuous assessment. All right. And uh, announcing the talk, AWS pre-signed URLs, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly by Jerem Brown. Here's Jerem. Awesome. Thanks, Houston. Also, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming to the talk. I know the, the afternoon tracks can be a bit, um, uh, you're out of steam by then, so I appreciate everybody coming. Um, so I'm, today, I'm excited to be going over pre-signed URLs and how they can be abused by attackers, and then also um, spend a little bit of time talking about maybe how um, we can put some, some potential preventative controls in place. And um, yeah, so excited to, to talk, this, talk about this with you guys. Cool, so um, a little bit about me. Um, my name's Jaron Brown. Um, I'm a lead uh, senior security engineer at Capital One. I work on the bug bounty responsible disclosure team. Um, husband, I'm a father of four, and then um, in my free time, I love to hack on different programs, um, and yeah, keep, could keep me busy forever. Uh, so just a little bit over the agenda today. Um, earlier, just previously, Josh Snyder did a great job um, introing uh, this topic, so pre-signed URLs. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about S3 pre-signed URLs, what they are, how they can be abused and how we can potentially um, uh, mitigate or uh, prevent the abuse. And then um, after that, jumping to the more important part or more exciting part hopefully is pre-signing other uh, AWS services, uh, followed by a demo, some prevention and, and wrap up. Cool. So uh, like Josh uh, spoke about, um, Here's a pre-signed URL. So this is an example of a, a Git object request. Um, you can see that down below it, it has the, the whole signing pattern, how that works. Um, uh, similar to what Josh spoke about. Um, also, uh, some of the interesting things about pre-signed URLs is they can be done offline. It's a cryptic, cryptog excuse me, cryptographic function. There we go. And um, since you don't need to make an API call to sign that, um, they can all be done offline. Uh, no internet access is needed. Um, let's see. So it also, it feels like every time we do talk about pre-signed URLs, we're talking about S3. Um, this talk, one of the aims is to uh, kind of move away from that and just make it more normal to say, or to know that uh, anything can be pre-signed. Um, so, Pre-signed URLs, they, they're supported by all the major cloud providers. Um, and this is core to their functionality and how they work. Um, it couldn't uh, be any other way. So um, also, Josh had a similar slide in here, um, but uh, maybe a few years ago, pre-signed URLs in the AWS console, you could click a little button and get a pre-signed URL. And now AWS has made it a little has made it more obvious about what you're doing. So um, you know that you're getting a pre-signed URL, something that if you were to post it in on Twitter or somewhere, everybody else could grab it and they could download that content. All right. So jumping into one of the um, attack vectors maybe for pre-signed URLs. So let's imagine um, you're, you're charged at your company with protecting your users. Uh, you have a bring your own device policy, um, tons of users, they're all doing their own thing. You have antivirus running, of course, um, but it's hard to, to watch out and 
for everything they're doing. So you have those few troublesome users who always like to install different Chrome extensions. Um, one of them, the Chrome extension, it will go and get a joke of the day and send it to them. But also behind the scenes, it's capturing all of their, their browser data and sending it to analytics.xyz. So you can kind of see the, the problem that would come with that. Uh, just because of the inherent nature of pre-signed URLs, those URLs can then be, they can be um, scraped and they can, the attackers can look through that, download the data, and then they also have your internal sensitive data. Um, so kind of not a, a big one for the attackers, but not so much for the organization. Um, also, part of the research that I did, I did build a Chrome extension that did something similar. Um, it's not ready for prime time, but what it does is it's watching all of my browser history and it's extracting pre-signed URLs um, and it's shipping it off to an API that I built. And so it logs the pre-signed URL, the, the location it was found, and also the account ID. Um, yeah, and so the way I'm getting the account ID is for every pre-signed URL, you're gonna find the access key ID. And so with the access key ID, you can make a call to get access key info and that will return the account ID. Um, so just a small project, kind of a fun project that I'm going through. Um, hopefully here, I don't know, in a year, six months, whatever, I'll have a nice list of account IDs and I can use those to do other things that other people have been presenting on today. Um, so uh, hopefully something exciting next year to show. Uh, so I'm not sure if Wes is in the audience, but a uh, shout out to him for building this awesome tool. Uh, for those of you who haven't used Quiet Riot, uh, it's a tool where you can give it an account ID and it's gonna give you back um, IM users, IM roles, services that are in use. Um, I'm also using the account ID on my own to check for public snapshots, RDS, backups, stuff like that. So uh, a lot of fun that you can do once you have an account ID. Let's see, so just a few recommendations for uh, pre-signed URLs, the S3 pre-signed URLs, uh, when you're trying to protect them. Um, try to stay away from resource-based policies because they can be brittle and scaling those out across hundreds or thousands of buckets can be difficult. Uh, SUPs are the, definitely the way to go. Um, try to avoid using pre-signed URLs if you value keeping your, your account ID um, secret also, if you are gonna use them, um, put the SCP in place so that if the URLs are leaked uh, externally, they won't be accessible. Um, and then one last thing is, uh, I see a lot of companies putting, uh, just using an S3 bucket instead of CloudFront. And so with that same tech, there's a technique where you can, or there's a tool called S3 Account Finder where you can give it a bucket and an object name, and as long as that's publicly accessible, you can also get the account ID. So uh, another fun fact, I don't have it linked here, but I think Googling S3 account finder uh, will get you that tool. It's also, I think Nick mentions it on his site, um, which shout out to your site, it's awesome, so. All right, so jumping into the fun stuff here, um, mentioned any, S any API call in AWS can be pre-signed. So if you think like create user, describe instances, um, let's see, any of the delete um, calls, those as you can imagine could be scary. Um, let's see, had some noted here. So if you, if you were to see in your CloudTrail logs at, logs at 2 a.m. maybe look, uh, describe instance, create key pair, create security group in a run instance, you probably I don't know, probably wouldn't be the best thing to wake up to in the morning, right? Um, but, so you might also be thinking like, as an attacker, so let's assume an attacker is able to get these credentials somehow. They find them on GitHub, someone posts them to Slack, um, an SSRF, uh, Grey Hat Warfare, um, any of those places, you come across some credentials um, as an attacker. You, you're, uh, you don't use Nick for that. Forgets, um, uh, best practices of staying quiet, you're a noisy attacker, and um, you just start trying different API calls. Um, here's two of the same API calls using a pre-signed URL. Um, the first one is, 
is not source IP restricted and the second one is. And so as an attacker, if you see that, like either you're gonna be like, oh, too bad, like uh, they, they've got their stuff under control, I'll just, I'll try something else, right? Um, so in this scenario, it, you're most likely safe, right? Um, but what if an, a determined attacker, someone that really wanted to get in, wanted to get in, um, theoretically, what could they do? Um, some things that I thought of, maybe they could generate a pre-signed URL, send it to a user, um, but most likely, um, everybody has the phishing training going on, they know not to click on these sketchy looking links, right? So that would probably burn your, uh, burn the credentials that you had, someone would figure out what's going on. Um, sometimes SCPs are maybe too loose and they allow uh, access from any AWS IP. Um, let's assume the attacker, he tried that and he figured out like, no, these are like very locked down. Um, and maybe the very last one that I came up with, which I, I built out a small demo, is kind of a water hole uh, type attack. And so it, it assumes a few different things. Um, stars will have to align, but uh, we, know, we all know like for attackers, the stars sometimes do align. Um, so in this scenario, um, the attacker gains credentials, their source IP restricted, but he was able to determine that a user clicking on those or visiting that URL, it would, um, it would, it would work. So as I was building out this demo, one thing I did, I was like, I need to find the perfect URL, uh, domain. So I bought, um, what is the name of it? Definitely not safe to click, or definitely safe to click.com, right? So uh, just kind of ease the user into that. Um, also, I, I used Dolly, uh, the AI, to generate some images that would keep the user on the page for just long enough for me to execute several of these uh, API calls. Um, so I'm gonna, hopefully this demo here is gonna uh, cooperate, but um, there we go. So on the um, left-hand side, Correct. Yeah, the left-hand side is the use, is the victim, and then the right-hand side is the attacker. So this is him. He's he's gotten credentials, and now he's figuring out like, hey, these are source IP restricted. So not shown here is him figuring out what IP or what user they're tied to. But um, let's assume that he was able to do that. And so I built this along with ChatGPT. I built this site here. Um, it helped scaffold out a few of these things. Um, and so what you can see here is as the user visited the, the link, um, I created a session for them, uh, log their IP, and I have a few hard-coded um, actions or commands that can be run. So for those, those of you in the back, some of those were describe instances, create user, launch instance, uh, create key pair, things like that. Um, so the first uh, command I sent, which this attacker is impatient and noisy, um, I sent describe instances, and I had the, the cron looking every 15 seconds from the user perspective. Uh, I'll show you the, the Chrome console here in a second, but what you can see is, so as the user is browsing, um, I found that I wanted to send him commands, so I'm sending commands directly to this user's browser. And so as he's, he's watching these images in the background, He's receiving commands, and then those are being executed via, via JavaScript fetch uh, function. And then when the data comes back, I'm able to push that back to the attacker controlled C2, or whatever you want to call it. And so uh, you see I've already, the user's already made these calls on my behalf. I have the describe instance uh, response here. Um, I have a create key pair that was done below. Um, and they, they're just gonna keep coming here. So all of this data is coming back to a DynamoDB table and I'm showing it here. So something kind of thrown together, uh, definitely not production grade, but um, it got the job done as an attacker. And what else, where are we at here? I think we're almost done. But, um, oh yeah, one other thing too. So it wouldn't really make sense to create a user because he'd probably be source IP restricted, but the thing that is interesting is I was able to create a security group, um, create a key pair, uh, launch the instance with all of that stuff, 
and assuming there's not a source IP restriction there, I, I'd be able to get in. So that determined attacker is maybe one step closer to, to getting in. And let's see here. So here are all the, the calls right here. So you can see um, there's the the git command call that is it's every 15 seconds it's checking to see if there's a new command to execute and if it if there is um, it's being executed via the fetch like I mentioned the response comes back and the send response sends it back to my server um, I think that was pretty much it so um, kind of talked through all of this but just one more time to recap how it worked uh, the victim visits he gets a cookie. I'm able to identify him and send him commands. Uh, the victim is receiving them and executing them on my behalf. And since he is in one of the, the calls are being made from a, an IP address that are um, allow listed, they're all functioning and working correctly. Um, <clears throat> there we go. So kind of the, I don't know, I labeled this one boring stuff. I changed the slide last minute, but um, so how do we pre prevent this? Um, easier said than done, right? Don't link credentials. Um, if you are um, creating um, or allowing credentials to be created, keep them as short-lived as possible. You can think like, do your users really need the credentials to work for 12 hours or maybe is one hour good enough, right? Um, just kind of making it a little more difficult for the attackers. Uh, maybe tighten up the data perimeter. If you have your SCP that's allowing access from a large subnet, maybe try uh, scoping that down a bit. Um, also, I'm not gonna go into it now, but Will Bingston, he wrote a, a great blog post a few years ago called Dynamically Locking Credentials, and that talks about how you can um, also uh, so lock the credentials based on calls and who needs to use them and, and so forth. Um, and so I was hoping this slide would be uh, somewhere where I could kind of say like, this is how you can detect it in CloudTrail, but um, the two events, right, they're pretty much the same thing. So one call made from the CLI versus um, from a pre-signed URL, they're the same minus the user agent, but we all know you can, you can change the user agent from the CLI and, and so forth. So. Um, it would be great if there was a, a little more data in the CloudTrail events to, to help with this. Um, I know we have S3 data events, but um, that doesn't cover all these other ones, so what else? Uh, last slide here, um, we made it to the end. Um, so just the final recommendations. Uh, if you're using pre-signed URLs, consider maybe not using them, putting them behind an API, uh, doing something else. Um, if you have to use them, make sure you're locking them locking them down correctly, and maybe most, most important is build in your preventions, be vigilant, uh, look for the anomalous calls in your CloudTrail logs and any other data you might have. Um, and if you have the, the data events for S3, use them, uh, be smart with them, and um, yeah, and that is it. Thank you. <clears throat> Hey, was there any uh, questions for Jerem? All right. Josh. I am so not a, like a browser expert, so like I feel like the same origin policy should have protected the user here, but it didn't. And so like, how did that work? Yeah, so if you were to look at the, in the browser at the request that came back, um, the cores came back as wildcard star, so um, I'm sure it's by design for some reason somewhere, but yeah, that's the reason it worked. And then one other interesting thing that I forgot to mention is it doesn't work with any of the S3 calls, right? So um, for whatever reason, probably has to do with um, just the S3 service in general, right? That does fail because of cores, but all of these other things that I tried did work, so um, for what it's worth. There's a, another tidbit of information. Have you seen any gotchas when trying to implement a data perimeter SCP? 
Yeah, so luckily I don't have to do that at my job, but um, um, but I know there are, yeah, definitely lots of experts here. And <laughs> see the expert, okay, yeah. But yeah, nothing here. Any other questions? Looking around, there's oh, some there's some in the back, all right. Hi, um, I was curious about your thoughts on using like pre-signed URLs for persistence as an attacker. Yeah, so let me think. So yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. So I guess the pre-signed URLs, you could come at it from like an insider threat perspective or if you're an outside attacker, right? So the outside attacker using pre-signed URLs, if, if there was no uh, source site or like no SCP in place, then you could go and execute whatever you want, but that'd be really similar to um, the CLI. Um, but yeah, using pre-signed URLs as a, thinking through that in my head. Um, yeah, you could definitely do that just because of the way they're pre-signed, like pre-signing works, you can specify um, like how long you want the URL to function for, right? So you could set it as short as a second up to, I'm sure someone knows the answer, hours. Um, maybe days, but, um, so yeah, definitely, that's an awesome thought. Thank I, you. I, I know my employer's probably listening, but uh, I've thought about this, like on exit day, creating a Lambda that generates pre-signed URLs that gives me persistence forever and really makes someone have a bad day. <laughs> so, <a> good question, <laughs> scary question. This was really interesting. So just to this last slide, so if you have an app that serves a lot of files with, like, let's say, sensitive data, just to clarify it, what you recommend is that someone writes an API that services that to the user or to the browser instead of directly um, presenting the pre-signed URL? Or because I mean, think what you were saying earlier in the earlier panel was that, or the session was that S3 is very good in just producing a lot of data. But this kind of would imply that there would be a bottleneck um, yeah, I think it. I think it all just depends on your appetite for the risk. Um, if you're just serving like static images, I don't know if it would matter. But maybe if you're generating like um, customer statements or something crazy like that, maybe it would be an opportunity to rethink that. So I think it all just depends on the the situation. But thank yeah. you. I was going to mention Josh's safer pre-signed URL or safer signed URL. Uh, GitHub project that he mentioned in his talk is uh, a good thing to look at for that. Awesome. Any other questions? I think we're good. All right, thank you, Jerem. Awesome. Appreciate Thanks. it. I, I do have a quick announcement uh, about food and drinks later. Or at least that's part of it. Um, everyone's asking the details. I had no idea what they were, uh, but I told everyone to hang around. So now I got them. Uh, at 5.15, we're going to have some complimentary beverages, alcohol and soft drinks for those of us who don't drink alcohol. Uh, they'll be served in the back of Salon A next door. Uh, you'll need your two drink tickets that hopefully some of us got when we registered. If we didn't, go check the front desk. Um, the bar will be open till 7.30. Um, out back, we'll have two food trucks. Go the opposite direction from registration. And uh, food will be ready to serve at 4.30. So we're getting close, 45 minutes. Uh, I have to say this out loud. Burning Buns has burgers, sandwiches, and wraps. Uh, Kebabaholic has falafels and euros. We also have ice cream. Food trucks take cash and credit card. They'll be around till 8 p.m. We've got a Birds of a Feather sessions that starts at 5 to 6. Uh, but the space will be open, open for mingling and discussions afterwards. Um, Feel free to schedule whatever you want with your friends, or if anybody wants to get together and talk about topics, uh, the space will be open. So, hallway con. All right, that's it. Thanks.
All right, welcome back. I know it's the afternoon. Uh, hopefully everyone's got caffeine. We're going to keep rolling. Um, I did just make announcements, but the, the, I have the, the details on food. If anyone missed it, I'm not going to repeat all that once again uh, until after this talk. But uh, just be ready at 5.15. That's when, when things kick off. Um, or 4.30, food trucks arrive. All right. Um, I would like to thank our sponsor, NTTVC. NTTVC is an independent venture firm formed in collaboration with NTT. Leveraging a unique strategy and deep industry network, NTTVC unlocks doors to relationships that can help founders and startups reach global scale. We also partner with first-time founders to launch startups. All right, uh, the talk. It's just a name, right? By Nathan Eads. Eads? Eads. Yeah. Got it. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Kick it off. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, good. I was really hoping the mic uh, would be working. So uh, quick about me. I won't spend too much here. I already know I need to speed talk a little bit. Um, so Nathan Eads, I work for a great company called Permiso, part of the P0 Labs team. Probably heard of us. If you haven't, we're the one with the game when you first walk into the vendor. That's probably how you'll recognize us. Um, originally from Pennsylvania, uh, now around the Raleigh, North Carolina area. So flew a few hours to get over here. Um, background, general cybersecurity, threat detection, disruption, research, um, and then just big into the cloud. So intro, uh, if you didn't read the abstract, so highlighting how the loose nature of AWS naming convention allows for various inputs um, and how that really just affects logging for the most part. Um, how that adds obfuscation, how that can confuse different teams, researchers, engineers, um, and you know, SOC analysts. So, why are we looking at this? Uh, provide insights when reviewing logs. Spark ideas of your own. I'm sure I didn't catch something that someone else may have seen. Um, and then discuss remediation and discussion around that as well. So the first section we're going to go into is IM sanitization or obfuscation. Um, so for this, uh, the AWS naming requirements, you know, great documentation. Um, but it does set kind of a groundwork. So it must be alphanumeric, you know, includes these various things, must be unique within the account. Uh, the second one is interesting, and the reason I have some of the, uh, the failures there below is actually because just calling out AWS for it, but policies is actually not included in that second bullet. I'm just making sure that it's well known that it, it is actually included. We'll, uh, we'll let them figure that out in a few days when they have their own conference. Uh, second slide here, again, just getting into some of the naming requirements. These ones specifically around policy, um, and policy documents. Uh, second bullet, worth noting again, they only mention inline policies. It does actually apply to managed as well. But that was just kind of set up for the rest of this. And really what we're going to look at, so the anatomy of attack in this case, this is you know pretty straightforward attack. So you have the compromised IAM user, we'll just say that that was compromised through any means it could have been, you know, exposed credentials. Um, but ultimately they create the IAM user, they create the IAM customer managed policy, the policy is assigned to the user. Awesome, pretty straightforward there. But we're going to look a little bit closer into what that actually is. So zooming in on the IAM user and taking a quick look at the actual underlying log, what we have is the create user. Username was hidden due to security reasons. Now, why did this occur? Um, did, did AWS do this based on what I entered? Or did I do this just for the sake of this presentation? Uh, if we take a step back, uh, we look at the customer managed policy, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna take a quick look into this, and what we have for the overall policy name in the end is sensitive data removed. So same question, did I do this or did AWS actually do this based on what I entered? And this is what we're left with. Um, quick and simple answer, neither of those was true. Those, those were actually the username and that was the, actually the name of the policy. But why? Uh, so why could we enter these, one? Two, why does it matter? And then ultimately, what else could we do with this? So AWS sanitization, Name requirements, so why was it possible? Well, pretty straightforward, we already looked at it. I followed every single one of the rules. Um, so is there anything else that controls this? And the unfortunate answer is no, that's, that's everything. So why does it matter? 
Well, looking back over these, I didn't, I didn't choose these, of course, at random when I created these names. Looking back over 90 days worth of um, our own data at Permiso, we have 56 services, 35 million events. That translates to about, I want to say it was 270 actual actions. Looking at specifically hidden due to security reasons and sensitive data removed. And that breakdown there is where we saw it based on those services. So hidden due to security reasons would have been 34 services within the request, 17 services saw it in the request and the response, and so on. So you can kind of see the breakdown of where these occurred, sensitive data removed being um, lesser of the two. Um, with it being the lesser of the two, it's the easiest one to pull up. So EC2 run instances is one of the areas where we see that. Specifically, we can highlight it, and it's under the user data. User data being, you know, your typical startup script. Why would they want the sensitive data to be removed? Well, you know, that could include credentials, depending on what people put into those startup scripts and, and any variation of. Moving on, so SSO create token. This one has it all over the place. Um, again, the last one was around that sensitive input data, data around a script. These ones are more credential based, so secrets, tokens, and the like. Um, in this case, I'm really just glad that they stuck with one syntax and didn't start changing it up. And then finally, we have create DB cluster from, from an RDS service perspective. We can see, again, hidden due to security reasons on the master user password. This was where it starts to get interesting when we take a look at some of these in terms of the obfuscation and why I would choose to use those names. One, because it in, adds that level of confusion because this is normally what AWS does. Now this could be from an attacker perspective, this could be from an insider threat perspective. But in this case also, you have master username. In this case I have it as test. There's nothing stopping me from making that hidden due to security reasons as well. And then you have an extra layer of that confusion. Was it the password, was it the username? Which one was AWS, which one did I do? You know, there's, there's now that mix. Moving on, we'll take a look at AWS managed policy obfuscation. So top left, pretty typical. We have all of your AWS managed policies. Bottom right, I've taken you know, one of those, read-only access, and I've made my own. I match the naming. So same type of idea. And really it's, okay, now we've matched the name, now we have something that somebody might trust. Why are we able to do this? Just the quick tangent on it, of course, it's around the ARN. Anything managed policy from a AWS perspective has the AWS where the place of the account name if it's made by the customer. Um, and that's, that's really the only thing that's delineating these two different policies. Now if we start to take a look at this in a log, we have this being attached to, you know, whatever it happens to be attached to from an account perspective, this is the one that I would have created. And again, we have the read-only access. Now think of the people that might be reviewing this, your SOC analysts and, and the like. They see read-only access, they might have tunnel vision. You know, they might, they might focus right here. They might not even notice this part to say, hey, or even know to question whether that was AWS or if it was something that you created. The other side of that is just the read-only aspect of it. Now you've buried something under both something trusted by, from AWS as well as just that context of read-only. When in reality, what this was doing was giving this permission. So using the not action, you know, the more advanced type syntax. Instead of a star star, let's give all access and something easily detectable. Somebody having a really long policy giving access to a variety of things. Instead, we're going to use the not action. I don't care about translate. So we're going to give everything else but that. Uh, root user. So this one I, I had planned to add already, but then I had a instance where I actually helped another great research company um, just make a quick correction to one of their blogs after they did some triage. And what it really came down to was they were doing the triage and they saw some failed events occur around somebody trying to create a user that was called root. They took that as, hey, you can't do this because root already exists. Well, the fact of the matter is it probably failed because they didn't have the permission or someone had already gone through and created another user called root because that's really what it comes down to. You have the root user, um, or you know, you have root and a user called root, and you can always create this. Um, what that comes down to, a little different from an ARM perspective, you're always going to have the account ID, and that's just a matter of you can't call this AWS, or else that would truly be owned by AWS. You have to have that unique per account. Otherwise, though, you just have a prefix for the user slash. 
uh, from a logging perspective, if you wanted to call them out and just make sure that, you know, like a SOC analyst knew what they were looking for quickly, I just wanted to make sure to highlight it. It's actually pretty straightforward. So you have the types where it's root versus IAM user. Principal ID, uh, they might not recognize this as quickly. Uh, from a user perspective, there's a true ID. From the root, it's actually just the account number. Um, and then, of course, you have the prefix, which I mentioned before, on the user that's called root. And it actually has a username, whereas true root does not. So just to kind of recap some of what we just looked at. Um, so you have like the hidden duty security reasons, sensitive data removed. Uh, the bottom left, I have the six pluses in a row. And what that was is, you know, I mentioned two of the ones that AWS likes to use in their own logging, but that's not it. There's actually a handful of varieties that they use. Probably depends on the engineer that happens to be working on that day, which is a real problem. Um, so the plus 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 is actually really close to six asterisks in a row, but since you don't allow the asterisks, I'll just throw some pluses in there and try to get as close to that visually as I can. Uh, the other ones listed here, um, I was just having some fun with it. Yes, you can create a full equation if you want to. Ultimately, if you really like Linux permissions and want to start switching things around, you could go that you could go that route as well. Um, and then the one in the center, uh, you can get really close to SQL injection. I couldn't quite get it to work, but if anyone else wants to continue to try with that, uh, feel free. Now, the other variations, again, not shown here. Um, if you stop by and look at the demo, I've, I've shown a few people this. You, know, you have these syntax around a full ARN, and instead of colons, because it's not allowed, someone starts throwing dots in there to try to match actual root. And again, trying to bury and show that level of obfuscation to kind of bury what's happening. Uh, other ones you could do, you could match EC2 instance ID, uh, security groups, and every, any variation of. Now, there, there are some legitimate use cases for that from like an EC2 perspective. Maybe somebody names it for, uh, for a role and they want to match the EC2 because it ultimately becomes the instance profile. I would argue you probably don't want to match the instance ID exactly. You probably want to preface that with, you know, this is an instance profile and actually call that out. Uh, S3, sanitization or obfuscation. So on a similar vein to what we just talked about, looking at S3 instead. And those requirements are a little more strict, uh, mostly around you know, URLs and its use as a static site. But ultimately, you can do the same type of thing. And I did while testing, just to add in you know, that obfuscation. So since they removed hidden due to security reasons and any variation of based on, based on those requirements. Um, there's one advantage here. Nobody else is gonna see this happen because I've now taken control of these. So you're welcome. Uh, so now I'm gonna dive quick into an instance in which Permiso actually helped an organization go through some triage when they had an issue. I'm not gonna mention any of the third party tool names of where this came up um, outside of ourselves um, assisting with this. So what occurred was an alert came in from a third party system. The information included with that was pretty straightforward. Uh, we had an unknown account touching the organization account, so the source and the target. And the only other information that the alert actually provided was that of an account ID, a principal ID, and ultimately from a principal ID, you can get the IAM user as well. But focusing just on the account ID level, we started our triage. So what we end up le left with is S3 get bucket location, and that was the primary event that we could see. And from that, we can get to the IP address, the S3 bucket name, and the user agent. Now, there could have been more from maybe a data plane level, but there was that logging didn't exist, so we were left with the management plane, so S3 get bucket location was the only thing we saw. So looking further into that, we'll start off with the IP address. And from the IP address, we end up with the notorious hacking group known only as the CDC, specifically the CDC out of Georgia. Um, no, the CDC is not actually the notorious hacking group, but this is who was touching the bucket and that caused this alert to occur. Um, at this point, we, we can make an assumption that it wasn't malicious. I just couldn't imagine the CDC happened to be attacking this company in any way. Uh, so we look at the user agent and we look at the S3 bucket name and we try to figure out what's actually going on. So AWS PowerShell, 
that alone sketchy. I don't know too many people using PowerShell to touch AWS. It just doesn't work correctly. Um, two things don't go together. Matter of fact, the only person I know that might do that is, is on our team. And then S3 bucket name. Uh, this one is the one that stood out to me, specifically because it looked like a programming language for some reason. The other issue, if you remember back to the S3 bucket naming requirements, this is truly how it looked in logging. That's not possible. It has capitalization. It's not a thing. Uh, so <laughs> combining those two things together, I started a basic search. And this is what I ended up with. And this is the, the main URL that really clarifies things and what was actually happening. So what we're left with is the AWS SDK for .NET, where Amazon.S3.Model was the namespace and S3 bucket was the class. So what actually occurred was interesting. Uh, going back a long time, somebody tried to use the AWS SDK for .NET, not truly understanding how to use it, um, or maybe just making a mistake along the way, finding a snippet of code that didn't quite work the way they expected to, and they actually accidentally created that bucket. So it was just sitting there at the organization for about 11 years, uh, and they didn't even know it existed. It was private, but then they had a different issue. That issue, which was highlighted due to that alert, is over that time, and this was happening periodically, you know, this bucket would just get touched, causing these various alerts to occur over years. And we really thought, hey, we should look into this a little closer. But ultimately, someone ended up doing the exact same thing. Someone found a code snippet. Someone didn't really know how to use it. Somebody ran some sort of command. But what happened was they ended up typing in the exact same thing to touch this bucket, hence causing these alerts to occur. Ultimately, like I said, shouldn't be possible, and it's not today. But that was until about 2014 when that naming requirement was changed to not allow the capitalization. So just kind of calling out why naming requirements and change is a good thing. Now, AWS probably didn't necessarily think, hey, let's fix this thing. I, they probably didn't care or know this was even happening. Um, but ultimately, it did help fix this. Um, in the end, the organization chose to delete the bucket. I actually told them not to. I said, hey, it's a piece of history. Hold on to that. Um, and in the end, I, I have control over the lowercase version. It's a lot less fun, but you know, I have it. <laughs> Uh, so detection remediation around this. Biggest thing first, remediation-wise, call to action to AWS. You know, they have their conference in a few days, why not? Uh, so track internally, filter out any of those common used terms to hide sensitive data. We shouldn't have the ability to use them. You know, make sure that we can't. On a similar note, no reason to allow AWS managed policy names to be repeated. You know, it just causes issues, it causes confusion. Um, make sure to get rid of that. And that's, that's true for a variety of different things. But after that, I thought to myself, you know what, AWS, and people always think AWS has really good logging. I'll call that into question. Uh, so user data, sensitive data removed, master user password, hidden due to security reasons, uh, and all the variations of tokens and everything else where they do the same thing, hidden due to security reasons, all the times where they use their six asterisks in a row, any of them. Uh, essentially, it's never necessary. It's not providing any value to anybody. If you're telling me that user data existed, you're telling me master user password was given, you can't tell me what it is. I don't care. <laughs> so just give me a true false. Yes, this was provided. Yes, somebody changed this. Great. We've, we've now solved part of that. Um, I didn't want to leave the conversation high and dry for actually stopping some of this, so I thought to myself, eh, service control policy. Uh, so from a create user, create role, create policy, create group perspective, you know, we can block all these variations and anything in between. Only problem with this is from you know the perspective of sensitivity, uh, case sensitivity. You know I can just change it slightly and still get around that because the policy is case sensitive. The only ones where it really affects it well are these last seven or so. Basically, this is tracking any variation of the special characters right next to each other, just because it's an oddity. I mean, if somebody really wanted to, like an equals equals, they could do it without it too. You know, I was base sixty fouring names just just because I felt like base sixty fouring names. Um, but this will at least help block some variations if, if you so choose to do that. Uh, one caveat here works really well from a managed policy perspective, not so well on the inline. And finally, detections, so understanding normal behavior, baselining some various things, same with the naming convention. Um, you can implement a lot of regex-based matching around all these, including the case sensitivity. 
And along with kind of that wordless perspective, implement kind of a hamming distance idea. So if someone changes a O to a zero, you're still gonna be able to catch that. Uh, real quick, I'll try to speed through some extra stuff here. I talked a lot about how this can affect resources, or, or um, you know, your engineers, your researchers, your SOC analysts. But let's consider uh, sending this log where username hidden due to security reasons over to everyone's favorite new thing, LLMs. Let's go with ChatGPT and the like. Uh, they're going to replace us all anyway. Let's let's have, have it analyze this and tell us what it thinks. And what we end up with is the exact same thing that I've been talking about. It thinks this is anonymized. And why is that? Well, most obvious reason, uh, it probably recognizes in this case hidden due to security reasons. It knows that that's AWS is one default, um, and it sees it, and it believes that everything's anonymized because of it. Or there's the other side and the bigger issue, and that would be what does it expect anymore? We're all feeding it information all the time, but when it comes to logs or anything potentially valuable, we're obfuscating it on purpose. So now it expects that. It sees things like this, and it's just always going to think that. So whatever you feed it in, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to believe the same thing. And then this talk has been mainly around AWS, but just a, kind of a food for thought, looking at Google Workspace roles instead. Just a real quick loop through what those look like, and there you have them. Uh, take note of like user management admin and then they have a type so like these are all system role if you create your own they're custom and we have here one of the logs getting assigned and for the value here the underscore seed underscore admin is actually the super admin that we see there they happen to log it differently now that's fine but the problem with that is if i were to go create instead user management admin do you expect your SOC team to really know that that's not truly user management admin and that it should start with a underscore and have this weird syntax? Um, and if you don't, that's fine. Well, they can just see that it's a custom role and they'll look into it and they'll, they'll understand the problem around that. Because ultimately someone could embed like this one here, I didn't show it, but user admin, management admin actually has full privileges as well. It's essentially a super admin. I just buried it underneath. Is there any way though that you can see that in this log? I'll call out Google in the same way. The one thing missing here is the type. So they actually didn't tell you that this is a custom role in their log. Um, and there you have it, you know, where names can cause some problems. So hope everybody enjoyed the talk. Uh, QR code should work and bring you right to that URL. Thank you. All right. Does anybody have questions for Nathan? And I didn't check the Slack, but I assume there's none there either. And you cool. Uh, cool. So have you seen any live attack stuff other, other than accidents and some of the IR work that you guys do? Yeah, we have. Uh, that, so that's actually where it first started was some just uh, somebody trying to obfuscate you know, how they were naming things, just trying to match things. Actually, really around the managed policy side, um, trying to embed a lot of it coming from an insider threat perspective. People trying to hide what they're actually doing, embedded in, you know, those custom, those custom roles instead. Hiding from their pesky security team. Exactly. <laughs> uh, any questions? All right. All right, Nathan. Thank Thanks, you so Joel. much. I really appreciate it. Great talk. Uh, quick announcement for anyone who missed it earlier. Uh, I'm going to throw this on the ground. Uh, so the, the details for the food and, and fun tonight, right? So at 5.15, complimentary beverages will be served, alcohol and soft drinks, uh, the back of Salon A next door. Um, you'll need two drink tickets for that. You'll need your two drink tickets for that, not two. How many, however many drinks you want. All right, anyways. Um, uh, the bar will be open until 7.30. Um, out back, we'll have two food trucks uh, just outside, opposite side of the registration. Food will be served. Uh, ready to be served at 4.30, so 15 minutes from now. Um, there's Burning Buns, it has burgers, sandwiches, and wraps. And there's Kebabaholic, which has falafels and euros. And there's also ice cream. Uh, food trucks take cash and credit card. They'll be around until 8 p.m. Uh, and then we've got Birds of a Feather sessions starting from 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, but the space will be open for mingling and discussions afterwards. Uh, feel free to schedule your own discussions in this space. So that's it for announcements. Thanks. I'll see you all in a few minutes. Thanks.
course that is not charged. Um, all Check, check, check. <laughs> have to have my hands full. Um, we'll just hand them off. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so we'll It wasn't holding it. Yeah, right. It's a lot of. It's a forty-minute talk at four. Oof, yikes! All right, we're back. Uh, actually, the final scheduled talk of the day before birds of a feather and food and everything else. Um, I appreciate you all braving it out. Um, I would like to uh, give a shout out to our sponsor, With Secure. Having With Secure as a partner helps you understand and address the cyber risks associated with business transformation, embedding outcome-based cybersecurity measures tailored to identifying unknown unknowns and to designing mitigations. All right, this talk is I Trusted You, A Demonstrated Abuse of Cloud Kerberos Trust by Daniel Heinzman, Heinzen, and Elad Shamir. I hand it over to you guys. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Does that sound good in the back? Yeah, we're all good? Okay, so this talk is essentially demonstrating uh, an attack from um, Azure AD Cloud to on-premises. So my name is Daniel, and this is Alad, and uh, we are uh, security researchers and service architects at SpectreOps, and we do like red teams and pen tests and stuff. So the big deal, the, the reason of this talk is to demonstrate 
that given that we've compromised Azure AD, that we can have a guarantee that we can compromise on-prem uh, all the way up to domain administrator, given a few things. So given that uh, Cloud Kerberos Trust is deployed and that there's a line of sight to the on-premises domain controller. So given those two things and you know the mitigations haven't been employed that we're gonna talk at the end, right? Um, just out of curiosity, is, is anyone here using Windows Hello for Business in their environment? Anyone? Yeah, handful. Do you know if, uh, if any of you are using Cloud Kerberos Trust as your underlying mechanism for Windows Hello for Business? No? Good. Good. <laughs> Actually, no, I don't want to discourage you from using it. Uh, as you'll see, well, there, there's some consequences to it, but it's, it's not that bad. So um, essentially, our goal is to convince you that um, yeah, a compromise in the cloud is equal to a compromise on-prem, and there is no boundary between the two, given these conditions. Uh, so I mentioned Cloud Kerberos Trust. Um, for those of you uh, whose first time is, you know, that this is your first time hearing that term, um, Cloud Kerberos Trust is an Azure Active Directory feature. Um, it's essentially a way to enable um, you to use legacy authentication protocols uh, without using a password. So if you're using Windows Hello for Business, um, you don't have a password, um, there needs to be a way to still authenticate to your on-premises like FileShare, which uses Kerberos, which is a password-based mechanism. So Microsoft comes up with you know, these a handful of different hacks to get, our, uh, to get this to work, um, and Cloud Kerberos Trust is one of those. So in order to understand this attack, uh, we're gonna cover three things, right? So we can't just convince you that this is a cool thing um, and say, you know, our job's done. Uh, we have three things that we're gonna cover, um, and it is, I'd say, slightly heavier on technical content, so I know it's late in the day. Uh, we'll try to make it uh, zippy. Um, the first thing is Kerberos. Um, so if you're not familiar with Kerberos authentication, we're gonna go over just the bare bones of how that works, right? Because that, that is required knowledge. The second thing is read-only domain controllers, which is uh, how Cloud Kerberos Trust is implemented kind of under the hood. And then the last is uh, Azure AD Sync Mechanics. So um, a part of this attack, when, when we say that Cloud Kerberos, is uh, Cloud Kerberos Trust is deployed, it's implied that you have a hybrid model, right? So you have on-premises Active Directory and you have Azure AD in the cloud and users need to be synced between the two. So if I create a new user on-premises, there is a mechanism that syncs that to the cloud. So in our engagements, there's typically a way to go from cloud to on-prem just by relying on user misconfiguration, right? Like they may have taken a, an administrator and synced it up to the cloud or maybe there's a tier zero asset that you know, is in tune managed or something. But we're seeing this more and more. We're seeing hybrid engagements where clients will hire us and say, you know, we want you to do a red team. And then there's always like a cloud component. And so we wanted to find new primitives that we can rely on, like a guarantee that we can go from on-prem to, or uh, from cloud to on-prem and on-prem to cloud. But you know, in this case, cloud to on-prem. Um, and just a bit on Passwordless authentication. So Microsoft has been really pushing this, right? Um, and it's a very good incentive. Like incentive. Like this is a, a really good security feature. You know, basically eliminates phishing. But Microsoft is beholden to its old technologies, right? And that, that's just you know fact of life. Um, and so with the legacy authentication mechanisms, um, they have to come up with creative solutions. So you may be familiar with Windows Hello for Business which is the, like the, the marketing term for passwordless. Um, if you log into like Windows 10 or Windows 11, um, you might log in with like a thumbprint or a pin or like an iris scan or gate recognition or whatever you want, right? Like there, there's all these plugins. What's happening under the hood is it's unlocking, it's using, it's deriving some information from your fingerprint or whatever to unlock some credential material that's bound to the device, like on the TPM. And then that's used to like sign requests or authenticate you, right? And so when you log into your laptop, that's really easy to, to talk to Azure AD through like OAuth and stuff, but there needs to be some sort of you know, bridge to implement these legacy um, authentication mechanisms over Kerberos. So there are actually two authentication mechanisms, right? And, and 
great engineering efforts had to have been made to kind of bridge this gap. And so I think at this point, I'm going to hand it over to a lot, and we're going to talk about Kerberos. So good luck. <laughs> All right. So yeah, it's fine. I'll use the computer. So Microsoft had to uh, cater for passwordless authentication. On the machine itself, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it recognizes your face, you smile to the computer as you turn it on, it logs you in, maybe you have to enter a PIN. Uh, in order to log into remote resources, there are two scenarios. One is uh, authenticating to Azure. And again, Microsoft designed Azure to support that with APRT, uh, with OAuth. But on-prem, Microsoft is still stuck with legacy authentication protocols, namely uh, Kerberos, and NTLM. Now, Kerberos and NTLM were designed back when passwords were considered cutting edge technology. They never thought of passwordless authentication at the time. So Microsoft had to solve this problem and actually came up with three different solutions. Certificate trust, key trust, and cloud Kerberos trust, which is of course what we're going to discuss today. Certificate trust and key trust leverage an extension to the Kerberos protocol, which uh, was introduced to support smart card authentication back in the day. That's pretty similar to passwordless authentication. Cloud Kerberos trust, though, is a completely different beast. Anyhow, ultimately, all these three deployment models allow users to obtain Kerberos tickets to authenticate to on-prem resources without ever entering their password. Kerberos, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is the primary authentication protocol for um, on-prem authentication in Active Directory environments. It is a ticket-based authentication protocol. I'll walk you through it quickly to refresh your memory. So the Kerberos authentication process begins with the user performing an initial authentication step. The user takes a timestamp of the current time and encrypts it with a key generated from the user's credential material, usually the password. That encrypted timestamp is sent to the domain controller in an ASREC, an authentication service request. The domain controller receives that message and validates it by making sure that it is decrypted successfully with the key you would expect the user to use, and that the timestamp is current. And if it all checks out, the domain controller is, uh, is happy, and it pulls the user's information from the directory. Then the domain controller generates a, a ticket granting ticket, or TGT for short. That ticket granting ticket contains the user's username, the user's security identifier, and the security identifiers of all the groups of which the user is a member. Then the domain controller encrypts this TGT with a secret key generated from the password of the built-in Kerabit TGT account. It's a special account that every domain has. And only domain controllers have a copy of those keys generated from the password of this account. The domain controller returns this TGT to the user in an ASREP, in a response. And now let's say that the user wants to authenticate to some resource, say a file server. The user can't just present this TGT to the file server because the file server can't decrypt it. The file server wouldn't know what to do with it. So instead, the user must exchange the TGT for a service ticket encrypted with a key that the file server has. So the user sends the TGT to the domain controller in a TGS request, ticket granting service request. The domain controller decrypts the TGT and validates it. If it decrypts it successfully, if it's not expired, the domain controller is happy. And then the domain controller is going to copy the information from the TGT to the new service ticket. And I'll emphasize here that the information is copied from the TGT to the new service ticket rather than pulled from the directory. It will come into play when we discuss ticket forgery attacks in a moment. 
this new service ticket is encrypted using another secret key generated from the password of the service account. So in our example, that would be the password of the file server. And it is sent back to the user in a TGS strip, a response. And now the user can finally authenticate to the file server by sending an AppRake application request containing the service ticket to the file server. The file server can decrypt and validate this service ticket. If it decrypted successfully and it's not expired, then the file server is happy. Uh, the user is who they claim to be. Authentication is done. It's not the end of the story, though. Uh, the file server can now make an authorization decision whether the user is permitted to access the file server or not based on the information in the ticket. And there is no communication between the file server and the domain controller. All these decisions, authentication and authorization, are made based on the information in the ticket alone. So I think it's a clever authentication protocol. I like it. This is an overview of the uh, Kerberos authentication process. I want to make a note and a couple of observations. The first note is that the service ticket is good only for uh, the service it is intended for. So the file server in our example. If the user wanted, wants to uh, authenticate to another file server, for example, the user will have to go through the TGS exchange again to obtain a new service ticket encrypted with another secret key uh, because every file server, every service account has a different password. Now let's make a very obvious observation. The domain controller is very central to this process. It has access to uh, all the user accounts credentials or the ser all the service accounts credentials. It's at the center of things. Another observation is that the TGT is very central. If, um, a u if a u once the user obtains a TGT, the user can use the TGT to authenticate uh, to any service they like. The TGT is encrypted using the Kerbit TGT account, as a reminder, and only domain control layers have access to that, to those keys, again, putting the domain controllers at the center. Now, what happens if the Kerbit TGT keys are compromised? If an attacker can put their hands on the Kerbit TGT keys, the attacker can make their own TGTs and put inside the TGTs whatever information they like, whatever security identifiers, whatever group memberships they like, and ultimately authenticate as any user to any on-prem uh, service. Uh, the reason for that is that the information from the TGT propagates to service tickets in the TGS exchange. And this is the infamous golden ticket attack, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before. And the, that is the reason the Caribbean TGT keys are so sensitive. They are the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. And so they must be protected accordingly. And that can generate uh, some interesting challenges. Let's say an organization needs to deploy directory services in some remote physical location with inadequate physical security. Or in other words, they need to authenticate users in a place where, in a place that is not trustworthy enough for a domain controller. Some examples are branch offices, retail stores, mine sites, clouds, hint, hint. So Microsoft came up with a creative solution, and that is the read-only domain controller, or RODC for short. As the name suggests, the RODC does not have write access to the directory, um, so it can't change objects, it can't change passwords. It has only a filtered copy of the directory, leaving out any um, sensitive attributes. Now, one of the key roles of that RODC is to authenticate users. And of course, the RODC cannot authenticate users without accessing their credentials. But we don't want to let the RODC access the credentials of all users. The, the RODC is not trustworthy enough for that. So instead, 
every RODC has its own password replication policy that determines which accounts may have their passwords replicated to the RODC and which accounts may not. It is governed by two lists, an allow list and a denial list. It's pretty self-explanatory if a user can have their password replicated to the RODC if they are on the allow list and they are not on the denial list. If for whatever reason the user is on both lists, the denial list takes precedence and password replication is denied, which is the secure thing to do. This password replication policy ideally should be implemented in a way that allows all user and service accounts that operate in the same location as the RODC to have their passwords replicated to that RODC. Now, when the RODC authenticates a user, the RODC needs to, of course, generate a TGT for the user. That's the first step. The TGT is encrypted using the Caribbean TGT keys, and they are the keys to the kingdom. We don't want the RODC to have the Caribbean TGT keys. So instead, every RODC has its own version of the Caribbean TGT keys, and that is what the RODC uses to encrypt TGTs. When an RODC generates um, a TGT, we call it a partial TGT, and users can use those partial TGTs to obtain service tickets uh, from the RODC, as long as the RODC has the password for the service account that they want to authenticate to. Otherwise, the RODC, even though, even though the RODC really wants to help, it doesn't have the credential material, the keys to encrypt the, ticket, the service ticket. When that happens, the RODC refers the user to a full domain controller or a writable domain controller. Um, and the writable domain controller will accept a partial TGT under one condition. The user must be in the RODC's allow list. Or in other words, the RODC has no business uh, generating partial TGTs for users it can't authenticate. And it can't authenticate a user if it doesn't have their password. One last note I'll make here about partial and full TGTs is that there is a, a mechanism that allows users to take their partial TGT and upgrade them for a, to a full TGT, to exchange a partial TGT for a full TGT. And this is done simply by sending a TGS request to a full domain controller asking uh, for a service ticket to the Caribbean TGT account, and that will perform that exchange. I'll pass it all over to Daniel to discuss uh, Cloud Caribou's Trust. All right, so you all got that, right? Yeah, all of it. Um, so this is kind of, the, the RODC portion is important because that's how Cloud Kerberos Trust is implemented under the hood. So when you set up a Cloud Kerberos Trust, what's gonna happen is a, a virtual RODC is gonna be created, and there's gonna be a, a new KRB TGT password, and that's gonna be synced up to Azure AD. So that's gonna be synced up to Azure AD. So when you authenticate, you know, use uh, Windows Hello for Business, you authenticate, you can actually get your Kerberos tickets and authenticate on-prem without ever using a password. But I want you to think about the implications of this because this is kind of like the nugget of the talk. This is the core of it. You just took some key material, some credential material, or sorry, key material, and you put it up in the cloud and that key material is, can, can forge any partial TGT for any user on-prem. So you effectively deleted the security boundary between on-prem and cloud. Now, as Alad mentioned, there's a password replication policy for most RODCs, um, and they're usually pretty limited. It's usually limited to the users at that branch site, right? But for Azure AD, um, we went on pure, like, full-on blacklist, right? So we allow all users by default, and then there's a specific set of like all the fun users that are blocked, right? Like schema admins, domain admins, et cetera, all the ones that you like want as an attacker. And so in theory, let's say we, we compromise the cloud and we have full control. 
We could, in theory, forge partial TGTs for any user, no doubt. But when we go to exchange them, you know, the domain controls can be like, no, you can't do any one of these, right? So then the question is, does there exist non-synced users that are not on that blacklist? Because if there are, the theory is, if we compromise the cloud, we can forge partial TGTs for those non-synced users, and we can authenticate them as them. So even though these users are not synced up to Azure AD, we can authenticate as those users. So the first, the, the, the first approach, we wanted to test this theory, right? And the very first approach was, OK, well, let's try to obtain this key. You know, there's this special KRB TGT that gets synced up to the cloud. If we're global admin in Azure AD, which is like, you know, org admin in AWS, I know it's the AWS heavy crowd. Um, if we're like global admin, can we get this key somehow? And so what we did was we looked at AAD Connect. And um, so AD Connect is the, the, the software that's responsible for syncing users between on-prem and cloud. So we looked at that, we reverse engineered it. It's all in .NET, so it's kind of easy. I don't want to say easy, that's not true. It's easier. Um, and what's happening is that that password is being encrypted with a private key to which we don't have the public key, right? The public key is somewhere up in Azure AD. There's no graph API. There's no APIs that we're aware of to obtain this password. So we thought, OK, even if we could get this password, um, that's, micro, that's likely on the Microsoft side of that split responsibility model. Um, that would most likely be a bug that we'd file. They'd fix it. We wouldn't have a cool talk, right? So the, the next thought was, OK, so we can't get this special key that we want to forge partial TGTs. So what if we change the password? What if we go uh, you know, find some API where we can change that, that password for that KRB TGT account that gets synced up to the cloud? right? And there are APIs to do this, and you can do it as a global admin. The problem is that if you do that, the partial TGTs that have already been uh, issued will be invalidated. And these are somewhat long living, right? Um, I, I'm gonna make it up if I, I, I'd be lying if I told you how long it were, like how long they lived, but I think it's like in the matter of weeks, right? So you'd break a lot of on-premise, on-premises functionality if you were to set this. And as attackers, like, we don't want that, right? We don't wanna draw that kind of attention. So maybe this is a good denial of service, but it's certainly not a good, like, boundary hop. So if you remember, if you're paying attention, there were three things that we had to cover, and we covered two. So here's the third one. And it's, it's pretty simple, um, but it, we do need to cover it. So um, there's this concept of syncing users between on-premises and Azure AD. And the idea is that um, you know, if I create a new user and it gets synced up to the cloud, there's, two, there's basically two representations of that user. Now, if I let's say let's say for example I want to change the the, the username or the UPN, and I change maybe my like maybe I legally change my name. How does on-premises know which object to change up in the cloud? True Microsoft fashion, they just said let's throw a UUID at it. Um, so they have this thing called a source anchor, and the source anchor is essentially a Base64 encoding of the the user object ID, right? And then that maps to a cloud anchor. And this is important because we can change properties um, on either side, and they will get synced to the other user. But for the cloud side, we can modify properties um, that might not translate back, um, as we'll see. So at this point, um, it was a lot had the idea, OK, so we can't, we can't get this password to forge TGTs. We don't really want to set the password. What if we find a synced user that like no one cares about? Let's call this user synced. And we have the on like the uh, SID, so um, the on-premise security identifier of a non-synced user, one that we want to target. Let's call this user non-synced. So let's set the property on the synced user in the cloud to the SID of the non-synced user. And what's going to happen if you remember how like all that Kerberos song and dance works, things are copied over. So the thought is we're going to get Azure AD to sign a partial TGT with that non-synced SID in the ticket, and then that ticket information is going to get copied over. We're going to get our Kerberos ticket for a non-synced user, effectively bridging 
this gap between Azure AD and on-prem, right? So ultimately, we're going to authenticate as a non-sync user. So to do this, um, takes a little bit of trickery. Um, most of the work has been done for us, fortunately. So um, to, to modify this on-premises security identifier and the SAM account name, those are the two things we have to change. Um, you can't do this through like the normal Microsoft Graph API, um, but there is like a sync API, and it's a very undocumented one, right? And so, I don't know. I don't know if I ever would have gotten this far. I probably wouldn't have looked into the API that much, but um, there's another project out there called AAD Internals. Um, I'm by this guy named uh, Dr. Azure AD. Amazing project. This API was already like quasi documented in that project, and there was already like a PowerShell commandlet to set some properties. So we really had like the heavy lifting done for us. And another thing to note is that in order to use the Sync API, you have to pretty much be a global administrator. Um, there's another role called hybrid identity administrator, which is like almost just as privileged. So we, we are saying, yes, you have to, you really have to like be privileged in this cloud environment. This isn't like a, a privilege escalation. This is a boundary violation, right? So run it down one more time before I show a demo. Um, as global admin, we modify these on-premises SID for a cloud synced user. And the on-premises SID is go going to be modified to be that of a non-synced user. We then authenticate. Uh, we basically do a device enrollment, because um, Windows, Windows Hello for Business is all about device enrollment. Um, and I'm going to, like in the demo too, I'm going to gloss over these steps because um, uh, I don't want to talk about them. <laughs> uh, more, uh, there will be a there will be a blog post uh, where we'll go into like the technical nitty gritty, but it's mostly just like how the encryption primitives happen. So it's not really relevant to the talk. Um, but we're going to enroll like a virtual device. We're going to get some certificates. We're eventually going to get a partial TGT that is for a, a non-synced user, right? So essentially a forged one. So here's a demo. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through this from an attacker's perspective, right? So let's hope I keep hitting the play button properly. Because it's small. Come on, guy. And we're not going. There we go. Okay. So the green terminal represents, by the way, this is going to go fast. Um, the green terminal represents our global admin. And you'll see here, I don't know if you can actually see this very well or not. But um, we basically just got the SID of our non-sync user, right? So we, we did like an LDAP query, right? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to stage this to set the property on the synced user. So this is Azure Portal. And the one thing I want you to note here, I don't know. Yeah, you, you, there's no way you can see this. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a SAM account name, and it's called synced. It's down here. Yeah, I can even like try to. Sh so take my word for it. There's this user called synced down here. And the SID ends in 1122. So we're going to change that, right? So we're going to use this AAD internals commandlet to change this property. Um, and we're going to change it to that of a non sync user, one that should not be in the cloud, right? And I just went right past it. Oh boy. This is what I'm talking about with the, with the play bar. Let's go, guy. Come on. Oh, they're not going to let me do it, are they? Nope. It's just either all or nothing with this thing. All right. So I'll talk through it. Um, there was going to be a lot more pausing, but we'll just kind of run straight through it. So recap, we are modifying some SIDs, yada, yada, yada. Um, there's going to be a red terminal. That's going to be the context of the uh, user that's line of sight to the domain controller. Right, so remember there was two assumptions here. One was that we're global administrator. The other was that we have line of sight. And what you're going to see um, when we refresh this page here is that the, the name is going to be different. It's going to be called not synced, and the SID's going to be different, even though the user in the top left says synced. Right, and then from here on out is a bunch of cryptographic primitives. Um, and we'll, we'll post this online too so you can like pause it and read it. But essentially here, we're going to obtain a Kerberos ticket at the end and it's gonna be for a user not synced. So this essentially is a full demonstration of us hopping that boundary. So we went from uh, a cloud admin and we're able to 
to cross that trust boundary to do something we shouldn't do, right? And this, this payoff's gonna be super underwhelming because you're not gonna read it. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay, you can take my word for it. Um, and there, there's like some massaging that we have to do with like key material and exchanging Kerberos tickets and whatnot. Um, and this will be more for the blog post to like actually walk through how you do this. So what we're highlighting here is we have a ticket for not synced. So that's demo one. So what we did was we violated this trust boundary, right? We went from a synced account, modified it, authenticated as a non-synced account. But that's not very fun because uh, we just showed you that we can authenticate as a user, right? Um, cool, big deal. Like that's that's a gotcha. That's a you know tehe like your 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 design decision was not good enough. Um, so what we want to do is show that we can do this to to take over to become domain admin, right? That's the cool part. Um, and remember, there's there's a subset of non-synced users that belong to this blacklist, right? Those are the ones that we can't exchange this partial TGT for. So we're curious, do there exist non-synced accounts that aren't on the blacklist that are fun, like that are cool, right? Um, and so it turns out there is one account that we're aware of, I'm sure there's more, but the one that we picked was this MSOL underscore number number letter random account, right? And this is created when you install ED Connect. And ED Connect is responsible for syncing users on-prem to the cloud. And, uh, and so just by the nature of the job of this account, uh, it has the permissions to see, like obtain all the password hashes for all the users in the domain and sync them, and it'll actually like make post requests to the sync API so that Azure AD knows what the password hashes are, right? So this is a very privileged user, um, and it's there anytime you use AD Connect. And most, like, most importantly, it's not on that blacklist, right? So, new attack, and uh, knowing that I don't have pause, I'm gonna have to talk real fast. Uh, what we're doing here is, are you all familiar with Mimikatz? So yeah. We're uh, doing a Mimikatz DC sync first, right? And this is in the context of our synced user, right? And so you'll see we get an, well, you won't see, I'll tell you. We'll get an error code of five, which is an access denied in, in Windows land, right? So this is kind of like a trust us, uh, or yeah, we do it first, it fails. We're gonna do our same attack, and you'll see. Uh, we're gonna dump. We're gonna dump cr credentials, and then uh, of course it hits us today, like we better delete this account before we show it live. <laughs> so like two hours ago, I'm up uh, deleting all these accounts from Azure AD. So at this point, we are um, pulling off the same attack. So the only difference here is we're replacing the SID of that, that, that dummy user not synced with this actual MSOL account, um, which is installed anytime you use AD Connect, right? And here we have, um, TGS uh, request successful, and we did this thing called pass the ticket. So now our authenticated session is acting as this MSOL user. We're gonna hop back into Mimikatz, and we're gonna see some password hashes just dumped to screen. It's gonna be sweet. Cool. And those are a whole bunch of password. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. Um, yeah, so you'll see like um, there's some ad, like we have admin password hashes dumped and whatnot. So this would complete the attack, right? At this point, we could authenticate as a domain administrator and, and fully prove out that we went from, from, went from cloud to on-prem. Uh, I guess I keep wanting to use the word own, uh, and I know it's like we're using dominance instead. So we went from cloud dominance to on-prem dominance, right? Uh, we did disclose this to Microsoft, uh, to MSRC, right? Their response, to accomplish this requires a certain amount of privileges. So that, that is very true. Uh, it does require a lot of privileges. Um, and there's public knowledge already. They are linked to um, an AAD internals post, um, but the attack was, was different. It was opposite. It was, going, it was modifying on-premise um, identifiers to go from on-prem to cloud. So it was almost the exact opposite direction, and the nature of it was a little different. Um, so I guess you can kind of guess where we're going with this. Uh, they said they're not gonna fix this, right? Um, and, and frankly, like, I, I, 
I don't know, I, I, I kind of agree. I don't know how much they could, because this is such a fundamental design decision, right? This, it's, and it's, it's a good feature and it's, um, it provides a lot of convenience. You don't have to manage your own PKI, right? So there's a lot of benefits, but I think as a, as a cloud administrator, or a, if, you're, if you're in charge of your cloud environment, there are some mitigations and, and you know, just in general, some trade-offs that you need to be aware of, right? Which is why we're highlighting it. So to, uh, to, a lot's gonna cover some mitigations, because um, there are ways to fix this, right? We're not just gonna come up here and say, well, tee -hee, like we got you. Um, there are ways to fix this, right? All right, so we're gonna suggest a couple of uh, things that you can do. One, let's start by addressing the root cause of this issue, which is that the domain users group is in the, uh, it's in AAD's RODC's uh, allow list. Basically saying that uh, it's an allow by default policy or a blacklisting approach, meaning that um, if it's not explicitly denied, then it's allowed. This blacklisting approach has been frowned upon in security best practices for many years now, and the opposite approach, the whitelisting approach, is preferred. In order to implement a whitelisting approach here, you will have to uh, replace the domain users group in the allow list with a new security group in your on-prem AD that contains all the synced accounts. This is a relatively easy thing to do because the account synchronization policy comes down to an LDAP filter. So you can even write a script and run it at a certain interval and it will solve your problem. Another approach, the opposite approach, involves improving the blacklist, uh, making sure that all privileged on-prem principles are in the denial list. This is much harder to do because it's not just an LDAP filter. Uh, you need to do some attack path analysis to discover all those principles that have a path to domain dominance. There are tools that can help you with that. Bloodhound is the most notable one. It's going to be more challenging, though, because you need to maintain uh, and monitor that continuously. And again, it's not just an LDAP filter. There is a, a much more complicated um, logic that you need to implement there. There are some commercial products that can help there, like Bloodhound Enterprise. Ultimately, a combination of both of these mitigations is the ideal solution. The first mitigation uh, makes, makes sure that um, AAD is allowed to issue on-prem TGTs only to synced accounts, while the second mitigation uh, blocks AAD from issuing on-prem TGTs to privileged on-prem accounts, and this combination makes sure that even if you made the, gra the grave mistake of synchronizing to AAD a privileged on-prem account, this account, th this attack will not be viable. Other attacks might still be viable, so make sure you don't uh, make that mistake, uh, but this combination of both mitigations is uh, ideal. So, last slide. Uh, so just a few takeaways. Um, the boundary between Azure AD cloud and on-prem is just becoming weaker, right? Um, my prediction is that um, this will eventually erode. So as cloud administrators, that's something to be aware of. And especially if you choose to use Cloud Kerberos Trust, which I personally would, just be aware that there are trade-offs, right? There, uh, you do have like key material that's getting synced up to the cloud that's very sensitive and you're exchanging a cryptographic boundary primitive like a, like a trust anchor for a blacklist, right? So make sure your lists are good. Uh, bonus prediction, my guess is that someday Microsoft will just be like, use Azure AD. <laughs> um, I do wanna show one uh, thanks just to the resources um, that we use to kind of build up this talk. Um, Microsoft actually has really good community engagement. There was a talk called Level 400 on 425 and they did like an hour on Cloud Kerberos and Windows Hello for Business. That was key. Like the fact that they're open is really awesome. And the AAD internals and thanks to MSRC. Um, we will blog about this. We, we have a SpectreOps blog. Um, you can follow me. I go by HotNops on Twitter. Um, it's a large mirror. And uh, yeah, I, don't, I, I know we're running a little over. Were you good on questions? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Alrighty.
So, so thanks for providing mitigations. Always appreciate that. And also thanks to Spectrops for all the work you've done on detection engineering. Now, with regards to detection engineering, have you looked into whether there whether there are ways to see if the specific attribute is updated in Azure Active Directory through those audit logs? Or if it can be detected in any way on Azure AD and not on on-prem AD logs? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I am not aware of any. So the question was, oh, you have a mic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not aware of any events that are created from that sync API because remember that came from that came from pretty much an undocumented API. Um, because we we said okay, well this is an easy fix. This is something easy to mitigate. We didn't really spend a lot of time on how do you detect this because we usually like reserve those efforts for like chronic misconfigurations or things. You know? So thanks. Yeah, I, don't, I, know I don't know. There, there are some on <laughs> user attributes updated, for instance. So it yeah, it'd be nice to look into. But thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. You're fine. Appreciate it. Qu quick question, and this is, is there a reason why Microsoft allows you to change the SID? Um, well, there's really no way to prevent it, because remember, um, we're abusing that sync API. So there is a, there's a program that runs, like usually on the domain controller, that says, like, if you were to create a new user on-prem or on-premises, there there is, has to be an API that's like th where they can call out to Azure AD, yeah, Azure AD, and say, hey, there's a new user created, and here's their SID, and here's their username, and so on and so forth. So really, what you're doing is just abusing that API. I don't. I suppose there's they could say. Like, like, yeah. Like yeah, they, they could say, like, well, you can't change it, but I imagine there's got to be some scenario, I don't know a lot. If let's say that they did prevent that. Then our workaround would simply be, let's say we created a new user with that seed and game over. Like, it wouldn't stop the attack. We would just create a new user. So I guess that's where, like, if it's a read-only do domain controller, right, am I able to create, like, I so guess we're a global administrator. Okay, I guess yeah, yeah. Global we're basically going to pretend that yeah. the new user was created uh, on prem with those attributes. Right on. Appreciate it. Any other questions? I don't mind walking, by the way. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Daniel and Alad. Really All appreciate right. it. Thanks, y'all. Uh, Quick announcement. Yeah, I guess we're, we're, we're getting near time. So uh, 10 minutes from now, uh, there will be complimentary beverages uh, at Salon A. I keep pointing that way, and Salon A is actually right there. But uh, you'll need to drink tickets for that. Uh, the bar will be open until 7.30. And then the food trucks are should already be out back uh, that way. Um, so enjoy it. Thanks so much.